All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Joanne Serena. I'm Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement and Customer Experience at the California ISO. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of you today to the EDAM Forum. So when we were deciding on an event, somebody said, let's do it in Las Vegas. And I said, really, Las Vegas? August, late August, it's gonna be 115 degrees. Well, I guess a cool 108. Thank you, Doug Cannon. Um, but then I realized Vegas is like Paris, France. It is always a great idea. And I think 240 of you today also thought it was a great idea. So really glad that all of you made the trip out here to join us in Las Vegas. We also have a large number of individuals online. So thank you to those of you joining us virtually. And please spread the word to your colleagues who couldn't make it today. Let them know they can join us virtually. It's not too late, okay? Um, in addition to the ISO, we have four co-hosts that have been sponsoring today's event that I do want to acknowledge and thank. We have Southern California Edison, we have Balancing Authority of Northern California, NV Energy, and Pacific Corp. So thank you to these organizations that helped make today's event possible. A few logistics that I just want to mention, um, you can connect Wi-Fi. Um, many of you are probably already online, but just so you know, the network is Resorts World Las Vegas, and you can sign in as a guest. You can follow the event on social media, hashtag EDAM Forum 2023. In terms of a few other uh, room logistics, we will have um, breaks a couple times today. In this room, there will be refreshments at each break. Um, and then for lunch is gonna be in the room where we had breakfast, so right behind us. And we'll break for lunch at about 12.15. Um, restrooms are on either end of the hallway and to the back side here, if you come out of the doors to the right and then right again before the restrooms, there is a private room that is reserved for anybody who wants to take a phone call or you need to, you know, uh, as work beckons, uh, you can always uh, touch down there. In terms of the agenda and speaker bios, those are all available on the ISO's event webpage, so you'll be able to refer to them there. Also to mention, the forum today is going to be recorded, and the video file will be located on our website for a short period of time after today's event. We have allocated some time for Q&A after a couple of the panel discussions. So we will have some individuals in the audience with roving microphones. So please make sure in the room you raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so that people on the phone can hear you. And then for virtual attendees, please click the raise hand icon as we're all familiar with on WebEx and we will call you. And just state your name and affiliation before you ask your question. All right, so now that uh, we have the logistics out of the way, we all know the saying, Vegas is a city that was built on hopes, dreams, a little bit crazy, and I'm gonna add to that a little bit of EDAM, or maybe a lot of EDAM today, because that's what we're going to be talking about. So in terms of our agenda, we've assembled a pretty robust agenda, so in a few minutes, I'm going to um, turn it over to Doug Cannon, President and CEO of NV Energy, and Elliot Mainzer, the California ISO CEO and President, for some welcome and opening remarks. Then we are going to convene a CEO roundtable made up of uh, utility CEOs across the West who are gonna talk about their organization, the vision for their organization as we contemplate an extended day ahead market across the West. After um, a break, we will hear from Haley Williamson, Chair of the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada, and Dwayne McClinton, Director for the Nevada Governor's Office of Energy, for some featured remarks, followed by a panel discussion of key regulators across the West who will talk about the regulatory landscape. 
After lunch, we will hear from the Brattle Group, who will present their study on the benefits of EDAM participation, followed by a talk about the interoperability of the extended day ahead market with other RA programs, including the Western Resource Adequacy Program. And then the last panel of the day consists of stakeholders from various sectors who will share their views on the benefits of EDAM. So lots of great discussion ahead. And again, we welcome all of you and glad that you could be with us. And now I would like to welcome Doug Cannon to the stage. Doug, thank you for your support of today's forum and for welcoming us to the home state of NV Energy. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Well, I just, uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome to Nevada and warm. Yes, the warm takes care of itself when you come to Nevada in August generally. So uh, we're excited um, to be here. And I personally love 108. I love 112 even better because, uh, well, candidly, it's good for business, right? Um, but uh, again, uh, this is such a, a great forum to be together at. I, I do want to thank all of the staff at the California ISO for pulling this together. They did a remarkable job, and, uh, and I really do look forward to a, a robust conversation today. These are really important issues as we look at what's going on across the West. And there's really uh, an important opportunity for all of us as stakeholders in the energy industry I think to really set an important course for what the future will hold. We face issues like decarbonization. We face issues like resource adequacy. We are seeing ever more variable resources coming onto the system and the challenges that that creates. And I maybe shouldn't use the word challenge, but the difference in operation that that creates. And, and we, we think about the opportunities that are ahead and over all of those issues lies the concern about the cost to the customer and the impact that we ultimately have on the customer that we all strive to serve. And so we've, we've seen the incremental benefits of the energy imbalance market. NV Energy was the second company uh, to join the energy imbalance market. NV Energy and our customers have seen tremendous benefits by operating in the EIM. It has saved our customers millions of dollars. Every dollar that we save by participating in the EIM, at least in Nevada, goes directly back to our customers to offset fuel and purchase power costs. Tremendous benefit. As we look ahead, those benefits only increase. How can we further find efficiencies in the existing generation and transmission networks <clears throat> that exist across the West in order to further benefit our customers. And a day ahead market certainly has the potential to be able to do that. And so the discussion that's going on today around a day ahead market is so critically important. And, and of course, I, I want to applaud the California ISO for its work on furthering a day ahead market in the West and the opportunities that it potentially presents. Now we're gonna hear a lot of issues today, the pluses and some of the, the minuses around different market models. And I think those are critically important debates to have as we as a West start to settle on what's the right approach for our customers. But the California ISO has certainly been a leader and they're out in front facilitating these discussions. And for that, I wanna thank them and thank their leadership team because it, it is critically important. And I think it's an important conversation that as we have the day ahead market conversation, we look even further ahead and say, would there be benefit to take even a further step in the West to a potential RTO? And what could that model potentially look like? And what additional benefits does that bring? And how do we overlay all of that or, or, or bring within all of that programs like, like the RAP that also brings other important benefits to the West and helps us further find efficiencies amongst each other? Ultimately, these decisions are best made by a group of stakeholders coming together, understanding one another, and then putting plans together that can be executed on and move forward. And that's what I look forward to today, is this group of stakeholders coming together, having that robust conversation, coming to common understandings so that we can, in fact, put plans together that allow us to then execute and move forward for the benefit of our customers. 
Because at the end of the day, what all of this is about is making sure when our customer comes home at the end of the day and they flip that switch, the light comes on. That's, that's our job at its core. And so I thank all of you for your role in ensuring that happens. I thank all of you in the discussion that we're going to have today. And I hope that we all engage and, and look forward to seeing the solutions that come out of these important conversations. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Elliot. Well, I'm gonna start out by thanking Doug. I really appreciate you co-hosting the event and your comments here this morning. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure you know, getting to know you better. And I know we've, we've uh, been working together through these last couple of summers and really appreciate the communication, the coordination with you and your entire team. And it's fabulous to be here in, in uh, your service territory. So thanks again for the co-hosting. And, and just to all of you, wonderful to see all of you here in person. And for those of you online, a welcome as well. Uh, it's just been wonderful to spend some time together uh, with the Western energy community. I always just love the energy and the positivity and all the relationships. It's just been fabulous. And so really appreciate everybody being here. And, and of course, we've all been working together through another, you know, another challenging summer and just always reflecting on our connectivity and our shared interdependence. You know, when we, when we thought about this event, um, we felt that with, with, the, with the filing of the, the EDAM tariff, uh, last week and the, the Dame Tariff, we felt that it was just an important moment to sort of pull together our friends and partners across the West and kind of celebrate this milestone, right? It's, it's, it's uh, certainly not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination, but it was an important moment. And I just, I just feel just looking around the room, so many faces, so many of you uh, who have contributed so much uh, to getting us to this particular point. It really has been an unbelievable team effort. Uh, so many hours together, so many meetings, uh, hundreds of pages of comments and filing through, and then finally hitting send on that tariff filing on the 22nd was just a, a big moment. So we wanted to take some time to celebrate that, but also just to create some space. Uh, and, and as Doug mentioned, just to have some space for some honest and frank dialogue <clears throat> as folks you know, continue their due diligence, uh, to think about the critical success factors for EDAM and, and broader Western market integration. And, and just, just to think about how we can continue to work together, stay connected, and continue making real progress on that path to continued reliability and affordability uh, for the people we serve. So could not be more pleased uh, to see so many of you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and joining us. And I'm really looking forward, and it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce our, our, the members of our CEO panel. I'm gonna invite Doug to come right back on to the, to the uh, I guess, you know, Doug from the President and CEO of NV Energy. I'd also like to invite Stefan Bird, the President and CEO of Pacific Power, to come on up. Uh, Lisa Groh is here from the President and CEO of Idaho Power. Uh, John Hairston, the Administrator and CEO of the Bonneville Power Administration. Uh, Jim Shetler, who is the General Manager of the Balancing Authority of Northern California. Uh, Jacob Tetlow, the Executive Vice President of Operations at Arizona Public Service. And our moderator this morning is going to be Steve Powell, uh, the president and CEO of Southern California Edison. So really looking forward, I'm gonna have a chance to join the panel as well. And uh, really looking forward to the discussion and your questions, uh, definitely a robust group. So Steve, I'll hand it over to you and looking forward to the conversation. It's working. All right, is this working okay? Good, all right. Well, thanks for the introductions, Doug and Elliot. Um, we're uh, not bad, only a few minutes behind, and we, but we've got a nice small panel that uh, will certainly make up time. Um, we'll, go, we'll go through intros. Uh, let me start with just a few words. So I'm Steve Powell, President and CEO of Southern California Edison. Um, SoCal Edison obviously has been working with the CAISO from the start. And um, over the last couple of decades, it's been really impressive just to see the, the enhancements, the expansion, and everything the CAISO has done to really expand its ability to run markets. And, you know, I think that's, Elliot, that's kind of what the, the foundation a lot of this is, is just the ability to run really efficient markets that bring benefits to customers. Um, the steps you're taking, the EDAM filing, like you mentioned, big milestone, I think, for, for the CAISO, but really a big milestone for us in the West that really are looking for ways to expand participation, bring more groups in, um, so that we can get those benefits for customers. As we think about the, the decarbonization that's gonna happen across you know, the nation, but the West, 
more renewables. The challenges are tremendous, and we need you know we need to continue to advance these markets. Um, cooperation really important. Dialogues like we like we'll have today are important. Like Doug mentioned, to bring a better common understanding of a lot of things we have in common, but a lot of differences and a lot of different decision factors that each of us has to take into account as we're thinking about you know which markets we're going to be participating in. So I know we will uh, get into those. Don't want to waste time, but maybe we'll uh, spend a couple minutes going through intros, and then we'll uh, we'll get kicked off on the panel. Um, Elliot, you already you started, but you want to just start on your end and work, work our way this way. Well, I'm, I'm Elliot Mainzer, the uh, president, proud president and CEO of the California ISO, and of course we are the uh, operator of the energy market for about 80 percent of California and the transmission system. We also, of course. Uh, operate the Western Energy Imbalance Market, which now covers about 80% of the West, and are also the reliability coordinator uh, for a significant fraction of the West as well. Uh, we're very excited with today and the conversation about EDAM, uh, very committed to the continued evolution of our energy markets and the evolution of our governance and our relationships. So really pleased again to be part of the conversation. Doug Cannon, President and CEO of NB Energy. We serve uh, the entire state of Nevada, we have about 1.4 million customers across the state of Nevada with our two largest service territories being here in Las Vegas, as well as the uh, Reno, Sparks, Carson City area. Uh, we serve all the way out to Elko and uh, many of the rural areas in between. Uh, we do have a number of small uh, co-ops in the state of Nevada. We, we sell and provide wholesale power to them as well, um, but view them as, as very important partners in the, in the conver conversation. But look forward to the conversation today. Uh, you know, in, in Nevada, one of the, one of the big aspects of, of our considerations as we look at a day ahead market is really a day like today. It's our summer peak. During most of the year, our system will be somewhere around 4,000 megawatts peak, 4,500 megawatts peak throughout the entire state of Nevada. On a day like today, that can go upwards of 8,500 megawatts peak. So we can see a tremendous change in our peak for a very short number of hours. And that does create uh, some unique operational challenges. And uh, historically, Nevada has been a fairly large importer of energy during those peak hour periods. But as we find energy availability across the West ever more challenging with the retirement of units, with more variable units coming on, it, it's become a, an ever more challenging picture to continue to meet those peak needs of customers. And, uh, and we've seen that over the last few years. Now, I, I do want to echo Elliot's comments on the coordination between our two teams, and that coordination has ensured that the lights have stayed on. And uh, I, I really do value that coordination and that partnership that we have. It's been tremendously valuable. Um, but. As we look forward, I think we all look and say, we need to better utilize and make more efficient the resources that we have, but we also really seriously need to look at adding more resources across the West. Good morning, uh, Stefan Bird, President and CEO of Pacific Power, part of Pacific Corp. And I think our notoriety is uh, our transmission grid that covers 10 states and kind of connects a lot of the folks in the room that without that collaboration partnership, you know, we wouldn't have delivered those amazing benefits that we've all realized by participating in the EIM. You know, for us alone, I think about 700 million uh, since the start you know, of that 4 billion that's been saved across uh, the West, really amazing. And to Doug's and Elliot's comments, that's definitely top of mind for our customers when you know, they're facing high escalation in power costs because of fuel and commodity costs are rising. We wanna use as much renewable power that's free has no fuel cost as much as possible and avoid those emissions. And how exciting it is to be, and sorry, I had a, a scotch and a cigar last night with an old EIM <laughs> colleague. Uh, some a little raspy, I haven't had one of those in years. Anyway, uh, stays in Vegas, yeah. Uh, but how exciting it is that, that we're here, not just talk, I mean, I was part of that, that group running around the West, I don't know, 10 plus years ago and dreaming about, boy, how, cool it would be if we could just coordinate better and be more efficient in how we leverage the abundance that we have across the West. And uh, so proud of, of how far we've come and, and excited about the next steps. Congrats to Elliot and the Cal ISO team for getting that 
EDAM tariff uh, filed and, and launched and a lot of work still in front of us, but uh, it's those additional savings, the reliability that, that Doug talked about is top of mind for all of us, and of course, moving the bar on decarbonization. So looking forward to this conversation. Great, good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here. Thanks for the invite. It's so great to see my friends. I've missed seeing it. Do you remember when we couldn't get together? Like, I just, I, I swore I was never gonna not appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm Lisa Grow. I'm the president and CEO of Idaho Power. We're the largest utility, investor-owned utility in um, Idaho. We serve most of Southern Idaho and a little bit of Eastern Oregon. And I, I want to just start by, um, again, offering my profound thanks to Kaiso and PAC for really sort of taking that next step. And, you know, we have, I have been in this industry for 36 years, and I have participated in every single opportunity we had or, or effort we've had to create an RTO or some sort of organized market. And um, we just never quite got there. And I, and I think that the demonstration that we can take incremental steps um, is the only thing that it, we've seen work. And, and so I appreciate the courage and the creativity and the, and just, you know, doing it. And, and we have all reaped benefits and continue as more people join, um, the, the benefits for all of us go up. I do think that it is our imperative um, as utilities to make sure that we are fully optimizing the system that we have as we, you know, move towards a, uh, the clean transition. We in Idaho are growing, um, faster than I've ever seen um, Idaho load grow. Uh, it doesn't seem even with, you know, some parts of, of uh, our economy sputtering, it, it, it doesn't seem to be happening in Idaho. So we're growing at a record pace. We are, we are shifting our portfolio towards um, our clean goal of um, clean by 2045. Um, we're deploying technology. We all have, you know, wildfire risk. We have things that just keep coming at us. And I think it, it shows how important it is we continue and what's unique about our industry is how much we do coordinate and share. And so um, I'm excited about the, the, the possibility of, of a moving to day ahead market. Certainly transmission is a big part of our plan. Um, we're step on another great partnership that we're getting ready to, to turn dirt on uh, B2H after 17 years of permitting. Um, and so, you know, those are gonna be key elements of this clean transition so that we can move this energy, this, especially the intermittent energy, so we can move it where it's produced to where it's needed quickly and efficiently. And again, all of this governed by safe, reliable, affordable, clean in that order. And I think these market, you know, enhancements are critical to this. And so I will just say it out front, I'm not sure if we need a full RTO. I think the incremental approach, as I said, has been kind of the only thing that's worked so far. So we're really interested in this next move um, and we'll see what, what the future brings. We don't have legislative or, or uh, PUC mandated um, things that we have to do towards an RTO. So we have that, that we can kind of watch how this goes. And so sure appreciate that, but looking forward to the conversation as well. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning. I'm John Harrison, um, CEO, Administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I too think that these um, conversations are very important. Uh, Bonneville has been participating in the EIM since uh, about a, May, a little bit over a year, and uh, we've seen benefits. Uh, it was a real first step for us moving into an organized market, so we've taken this opportunity to learn. Uh, you know, if you look at Bonneville's profile, we market electricity, we're a federal marketing agency. We market this electricity from 31 federal dams on the Columbia Snake Rivers. Um, and we also have an 1100 megawatt uh, nuclear plant that we market electricity from. Uh, we own and operate about 15,000 um, high voltage pole miles in the Pacific Northwest, uh, represents anywhere between, I think about 75% now. Um, the high voltage transmission in the Pacific Northwest. So for us, um, these conversations are important because I look at our portfolio as really being kind of the foundational piece to the clean energy transformation, particularly out West. Um, you know, it's not just because our output is anywhere between 95 to 98% carbon free. Um, our only 
um, kind of carbon footprint are our market purchases. So as we talk about markets, um, that has a very profound impact on how we look at serving our customers who, as you've already heard, have a number of challenges in meeting uh, renewable portfolio requirements moving forward. So, you know, that's an important piece to our puzzle as we look at, you know, how do we participate in markets? So greenhouse gas accounting is very important. Uh, the other piece is it's not just because of the carbon content. I, I look at it also as being a foundational piece because of the attributes of the system. Um, hydro is highly responsive. So as you add renewables to, you know, the uh, resource mix, you're going to have to have that instantaneous response. And so how we manage the system and preserve it is going to be critically important and how we also allocate it to markets, participate in markets, will also allow us to figure out how to optimize this incredible resource for attacking climate change, for dealing with meeting these renewable portfolio requirements in the, um, I think, a most efficient manner. So uh, I think these conversations are so important, uh, just should not be among or within, say, certain market operators. I think market operators need to begin to talk more too. Because as we discuss this, we discuss transmission, we discuss seams, we're going to have seams. We've got to solve those problems to get the most efficiency out of it. So I'm excited about this discussion and look forward to um, entertaining any questions that folks might have later on. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Jim Shetler. And I serve as the general manager for the Balancing Authority of Northern California, better known as Bank. Bank is a joint powers agency under California law. Our members include the Modesto Irrigation District, the cities of Redding, Roseville, and Shasta Lake, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and the Trinity Public Utilities District. In addition to that, we have a contractual relationship with WAPA Sierra Nevada region and the transmission agency in Northern California for their respective 230 and 500 kV systems. I think I'll refrain from saying how long I've been in the industry. Let's just say it's been a long time. Um, Come on. <laughs> okay, 52 years. All right. Wow. All right. <laughs> I was five years old when I started. Um, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Sorry. Some bad comments up here. Okay, I, I diverted. I apologize for that. We are about a 5,000 megawatt peak balancing authority. So we're about mid size for the interconnection. We're part of the 20% of California that's not regulated under the ISO. Uh, we're also not under the PUC. Uh, in addition to balancing authority services, we also provide planning coordination and EIM entity service to our members. And then we have seen definite benefits from being involved in EIM, uh, financially, operationally, environmentally. Uh, and one of the things that our, our members have asked bank to do is, is look at, okay, what are the next steps? in going forward with markets? How do we engage in markets going forward? Is there a day ahead option that we should be looking at, especially if we're looking at decarbonization in California? And I'm pleased to announce today that at our strategic planning session a week ago today, uh, staff recommended to the commission that we move forward with participation in EDAM as our option for day ahead market participation. And I'm pleased to say our commission unanimously endorsed that recommendation. Now, having said that, each one of my participants has to make their own decisions as to whether they want to go forward or not. I can report that one of my largest members, SMUD, has already uh, obtained approval from their board to participate with bank in going forward with EDAM. My other three member participants, Modesto, Roseville, and Redding, are in various stages of their approval process. And then the fifth participant, which is WAPA Sierra Nevada region, uh, is going to be kicking off their uh, federal process here in September and probably looking at a decision from them sometime first half of next year. However, having said that, uh, the commission did authorize us to proceed with budgeting and contracting to move forward with EDAM. Uh, we're looking at right now planning on a spring of 2026 go live. 
So, Stefan, I'm uh, looking forward to working with you and your staff, Elliot, your staff as well, and make EDAM a, a reality. With that, I think I overdid my two minutes, so I'll turn it back. Good morning. I'm Jacob Tetlow, the Executive Vice President of Operations at Arizona Public Service. Uh, Arizona Public Service is the largest utility in the state of Arizona. We are a vertically integrated, uh, investor-owned utility serving about 1.3 million customers in Arizona. Uh, been been around since uh, the late 1800s, so we got a lot of legacy in Arizona, and we're really proud of that responsibility to serve Arizona customers. Uh, today, you know, we're 50% carbon free. Not quite as uh, not quite as good as the BPA story, but uh, we're very proud of the fact that we operate the largest nuclear power plant uh, in the United States, providing you know 4,000 megawatts of clean energy. Much like the um, story that that Doug was sharing. Uh, the weather in Phoenix is kind of like the weather here, but just a little hotter. Uh, and you can pretty much count on that. I'm not sure if I ever see Nevada much warmer than Arizona. Um, what makes this conversation so important to me is the fact that while we're all on a, an, a journey to decarbonize, I think that's important and, and I think we all see that. Um, but we're also in Arizona, the fastest growing county three years in a row in Maricopa County. We see tremendous growth. We see data centers moving in. We see people talking about generating clean hydrogen and, and that takes a lot of power. So when you think about the growth story and you think about the, the need to serve and the fact that it is really hot means that our services are the difference between life and safety of our customers. And, and we, we consider that incredibly important. So everything we do has to start, like Lisa said, with, with safety and reliability. Um, and, and, and frankly, it has to be affordable for customers and we need to decarbonize. So it's not, it's not a small order uh, when you think about all of that. EIM for us has been a, a great opportunity. Uh, we've been engaged since 2016 and, and we've gotten $375 million worth of benefit that went straight back to our customers as well. Uh, so we're a big fan of, of what it's provided to the system. And you know, if you think about the, the state I described, there's no doubt we have to evolve uh, as a Western region and get more coordinated uh, more collaborative, more efficient, and not compromise safety and reliability. Um, so those are my opening thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And so good start. Just in intros, we've got an announcement and insights into kind of the different consideration factors that folks have. I think, you know, John's around their level of clean energy is one that didn't register with me until being in meetings with John over the last year. It's a very different set of decisions you've got when you've already got that amount of clean energy there. So for the, for the panel plans, um, we've got about five topics to cover. We'll see if we can get through them, but we're gonna talk about summer operations, uh, talk about the WEAM and, and how that's gone so far. Talk about what a, a day ahead market could look like and the impacts it'll have on the West, the decision factors for everybody, and last but not least, I'm sure it'll come up along the way, is governance. Um, so we'll get through those and wanna save some time at the end for your questions. So keep, the, keep, keep, uh, keep thinking about those and, and we'll get them out. I want to start on summer operations. So this summer, like just about every summer for utilities, can have its challenges. And I think this one's been a really unique one in the desert southwest. Um, you know, you've had, we've had really long extended periods of 100 or 110 plus temperatures. And so I thought it'd be helpful to start with just, you know, maybe with Doug and with Jake um, around, like, what, it, what has been the experience through the summer in operations? Um, and how has, you know, participation in WEAM really helped helped you through that summer or created challenges. But Doug, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, great, thanks, Steve. You know, I'm gonna, I'll give two sides of the coin on kind of how operations within the EIM and operations with the California ISO have in, influenced N Nevada's summer. I, I already shared with you what those load numbers can be like and participating in the EIM has certainly helped those summer operations. And and I actually want to, to give a shout out to the California ISO um, we had a concern that under the sufficiency test, if you failed to pass a sufficiency test, you actually couldn't really participate or bring the imports in during a following hour under kind of the old model. We raised the concern, a stakeholder process was set up, a discussion was held, and a solution was delivered that actually now there is a product that people can voluntarily choose to participate in that even if you were to fail the sufficiency test, assuming there's enough room in the market, you can continue to receive those imports. That's a tremendous benefit. What we were concerned about is you've got somebody who's already kind of down, 
why are we pushing them further down by not letting them get access to this broader market? Instead, as a West, let's come together and give that person an option to kind of pick it up. Now they have to carry their weight, they've got to pay the price, but let's, let's help them through that challenging time. And the California ISO came to the table and, and helped deliver a product that really, that really helped there. On the other side, you know, a challenge that we continue to run in through is, is the evolution of the wheel through rules that we've seen in California. And the way that we have seen some of the historic imports that we've relied on be, be curtailed under some changes in, in those rules. And you know, those have gone to FERC and gone through a whole process there, and we respect that process, we're engaged in that process. But you, you kind of see the back and forth that exists as we continue to try as a West to work through what the, what the best solution is and what the right path forward is. Um, but certainly our customers, like I mentioned before, from a financial perspective, have seen tremendous benefits by participating in the, in the EIM. Jake, I mean, just related to that, what's, what, what have you guys seen in terms of integration with the real-time markets, EIM, again, opportunities and challenges with the way to go. Way to go. This is complicated, two, three guys and two mics. Um, it, it's a resource adequacy issue. I mean, there's three of us and there's only two mics. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were resource efficient, we would have had three, uh, clearly. Uh, you know, the summer, this summer has been incredibly challenging for us. I, I'm, I'm not going to kid in, in my 22 years with APS. It's probably about as challenging as I've ever seen. Um, I think everybody kind of watched the regional heat wave, but if, if you don't live it, it's hard to appreciate it. When, when they say 30 consecutive days above 110, uh, that's pretty challenging. And when you get up at 6 a.m. to take your dog for a walk and the sun isn't up yet and it's 95 degrees, I mean, it just doesn't cool off um, and air conditioners don't quit turning. Uh, that was July for us. Uh, you know, we, we previous peak in our system was 7,600 megawatts back in 2020. Uh, this last summer on, on June, July 20th, uh, we set a new peak at, at just under 8,200 megawatts, so about a 600 megawatt increase. To me, the, the energy imbalance market is, is a very helpful tool. It creates liquidity in the market, right? It puts resources in that might not have otherwise been available. That's an efficiency gain. Uh, it's, it helps with reliability, um, but the flip side of that is it's not a resource efficiency adequacy tool um, because our head schedules did get cut last July. Uh, we had some low priority transmission that got cut. So it, it absolutely helps, but it, it can't be the tool uh, to make sure you're resource efficient for your customers. Uh, so we certainly see it as a benefit. It definitely moves uh, things in the right direction. Uh, but it does have that challenge associated with it, too. Yeah, there's, any others with some interesting stories about summer operations? I just got to chime in because I'm taking all the credit for all the heat down here in the southwest. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, know. A couple of weeks ago, I think the northwest ruled that, that dilemma. And I think uh, a couple of years ago, it was hotter in Portland than it was ever in Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we're all seeing this challenge, I think, is you know, the, the clear point for me and, and every summer, uh, you know, given that we sort of do see what's going on and, and are in the middle of that, you know, we've had EA3s going on around us. We haven't been in an EA a event uh, ourselves for now, knock on wood, four years running, but every summer that's been happening. And that wasn't the case, you know, prior to, you know, this escalation in heat and the tightness of the market. And that really does feed for Pacific Corp, our urgency uh, to move the day ahead market forward because we need faster markets that can you know leverage that capability that is out there somewhere in the region you know it's not 115 degrees or super tight and our ability to commit units more efficiently and move that power around i mean you think about our world prior to eim you know there's no way you know we'd be in a i think of last year september 6 you know we're exporting energy in one five minute interval then we lose a coal plant and we're suddenly importing the next five minutes. That's not possible, right. you know, in the non-automated world. And that's the difference that these tools are making and are going to support that that goals that we all have. Yeah, and those are. I know when uh, Elliot calls me over, uh, you know, on a, on a Wednesday afternoon in the summer, talking about, well, we I can't believe what we're seeing. The flows are going this way, and then they totally reverse course on us. It's a whole new world uh, in managing, but uh, that's that's what the markets are there for. 
So let's talk, continue to talk a little bit more about the benefits on the energy imbalance market. And Jim, I'll start with you. Um, maybe talk, you know, you said you had plenty of benefits, but benefits and challenges that, uh, that you guys have experienced in participating uh, with Wayne. So, I mean, the obvious one we've kind of talked about, the financial benefits, the uh, diversity benefits. In looking at our operation, one of the things, or a couple of the things we, we noted, one is we're seeing a definite assistance in managing the ramps for us through using the EIM. The other is helping us to meet our decarbonization goals. We're seeing much more effective sharing of resources across the peak, that diversity benefit. Uh, an interesting thing that we kind of identified here over the last couple of years is our footprint peaks about an hour and a half to two hours ahead of the ISO. And so that difference allows us to get some assistance during our peak, but inversely allows us to help the ISO as their peak comes in. And then as I look at it from a customer perspective, uh, clearly we're seeing cost savings for our customers by being more efficient in using our resources. Potentially deferral of future resource development because we have the diversity in the footprint to use. And I think um, an improved reliability uh, gain. Having said that, there are challenges. Uh, I know we, we talk about low priority cuts and, and uh, my members have resources that they either own or have contracted with within the ISO footprint. Uh, we work very hard to ensure that they are treated as high priority exports, but that means they are treated equally as the ISO load. And so we have to manage that. It, it is also a bit of a complicated process. There are times when uh, in real time, we find out those high priority exports have been cut and we have to do some quick response to the ISO to get them reestablished. But for most of the time, high priority. I should say high priority. <laughs> Um, but we haven't worked through with the ISO on that and 99% and of the time they're able to respond to that. And then I think the other thing for at least my members is it's a complicated market. So understanding how that market works, uh, the increased cost allocations that go with that. Uh, we had to do a lot of training and learning for our, our members and just understanding how to play and operate in this market. It's a good reminder. You, you, uh, you know, it's not just you flip a switch and all of a sudden you're participating in the market. There's, there's a lot that goes into getting ready and, and understanding. And yeah, so a lot of work for you, for you, especially with all your members. John, um, maybe you can talk. You know, BPA being a more recent participant in in the EIM, um, talk about how you guys see where EIM could go in terms of evolution and how that could provide more benefits to your customers. What are those opportunities still that you see? Yeah. So. You know, for us, I think the experience, you know, it's been pretty good so far. I, I'd say I really think that the way the um, EIM is working has been real beneficial to the West. Uh, we've seen positive results. And, you know, for an entity just starting off in organized markets, getting that experience is really crucial. Um, that gives us some confidence. And particularly, you know, serving over 140 customers, um, public customers, there's a lot of, um, I think, desire to see kind of how these initial results are, are coming about, um, how the governance structure is working, uh, which is, you know, a, a very important issue for our customers. So I think the, the first year of results have um, demonstrated that, you know, the, uh, the current approach um, has been working. But I do think as we look at um, additional markets, um, day ahead market, uh, there has to be an evolution around how the policies are developed. And you know, I, I think the perception is that most of the policies are focused on that California footprint. And uh, you have to see that equity get, I think, pushed out much more broader um, and, 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 and really include all of the participants. Um, and, you know, I think you're seeing evidence of that through um, focus on stakeholder processes that are addressing specific issues. Uh, but as it matures, as it evolves, uh, that is something that's going to have to happen. You're going to have to see a little bit more independence and stakeholder driven uh, policy development. Great. So Elliot, you've heard already some of the 
current challenges, a little bit of what people would like to see. What's what's the CAISA's vision for future enhancements to EIM? Yeah, you know, um, there's a couple. Of, I think a couple of really important points that that, that I want to emphasize in, to an, in answering the question. I think we've heard Doug and a few others make the point that you know that the energy imbalance market, actually, no real mark, no market is actually a substitute for a solid foundation of resource adequacy, right? The, the, the RA is that's the bottom foundation layer, and that's why it's so important for all of us to be taking those steps to get to solid resource adequacy and meet those planning standards, right? The market really is an optimization tool. And, and I think that um, we also know that the commons in the West is getting smaller, right? There are years and years when people could think of the energy market as sort of this infinite pool of resources. It is not an infinite pool of resource anymore. And I think we're seeing that <clears throat> in real time. And, you know, actually July 20th was, uh, we were, you know, right in the middle of that. We could feel the tension in the interconnection that night. I don't know if everybody knows that night we were 160,000 megawatts in the West. That was only 7,000 megawatts below what we hit on September 6th last year. So that's significant demand. Uh, and we've also had a, a, an event, a couple of events in August where it wasn't a real West-wide heat dome, like a real superheater, but it was kind of hot everywhere. We were, you know, out there in terms of load. Uh, and the, the day ahead market did not have perfect liquidity in it, okay, because there just isn't enough physical supply to satisfy all the short positions going into the market. But what we were able to do, uh, and yes, there are low priority export curtailments when there's not enough physical capacity to support them. That's part of the deal. Uh, but we were then able to work together to foster maximum liquidity into the hourly markets. And then we were able to sit there and watch the energy imbalance market cycling power across the West, particularly most of it heading, certainly not in California's direction at that point, certainly the places that were really on the edge. And then the RC is able to provide that additional level of wide area visibility to what's actually happening across the interconnection to help out with redispatch and transmission congestion problems. So for, from my perspective, I feel as though that the energy imbalance market, in many ways, we feel as though it's, it's a mature, well-established mechanisms that's proved its reliability and its economic value. And it's kind of, I think we've made some recent enhancements to the sufficiency test. I think the assistance energy is, is, is important. But really, we can also, when we're operating under those conditions, you can literally physically feel the value that we're leaving on the table by not having the actual structured automated day ahead market in place. You know, just the ability to truly take advantage of that regional diversity. We heard a couple of places, even inside California, temporal diversity with Arizona, the time zone and the difference in sun setting, there is real diversity. And, and Doug and I, we've, we've, we've been able to work our systems together through some really tough conditions. And so leveraging, I think the day ahead market really is that natural evolutionary step and building it on that EIM platform of significant transmission connectivity and that huge resource diversity, including, you know, the Bonneville system with the incredible hydro all the way down the desert southwest, the Intermountain West, and then, of course, California now has turned into a net exporter, you know, across the middle of the day with all of our solar resources. So it's a changing resource base, and that's the next, I think, evolutionary step from the way we see it. Perfect. So let's let's dig in a little bit more. Let's move the real time markets behind and talk a little bit more on the day ahead market side. So you know, EDAM taking you beyond just real time markets. You're now talking about coordinating and planning really 90% of the energy. That's where a big chunk of everything is getting landed. Um, with EDAM, you're looking at day ahead resource efficiency evaluations, um, capacity requirements via imbalance reserve, as well as optimization of transmission. So, Lisa, maybe I'll go to you on this one. Um, how do you see broader day ahead markets really impacting your decision making and your operations? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm going to echo a lot of things that have already been said, but really building on what we've seen happen in the EIM, we think it is, you know, a natural extension, the, nat the next incremental step to really look at how do we optimize in that day ahead. And, you know, it's not, it's not a um, trivial um, problem to, or challenge that to, to really move in that direction. But I, I feel like that is, um, that will continue to, to bring benefits to our customers, to the region, um, again, safe, reliable, affordable as we move to clean. And as we all add more intermittent resources, um, those are not small uh, challenges to, to solve. So I think, um, 
we really appreciate in the EIM experience, the stakeholder process that, that um, you know, I know Kathy Anderson, I think talks to Mark daily almost um, as we're kind of working through issues and, and they've been open. They've been uh, very responsive because it is a, a really dynamic, you know, we're sort of creating this as as we're we're operating it so we're learning a lot and and then applying those lessons uh into you know changes in the in how the market operates and yes there are things that i'm sure are mutually exclusive for for some as we as we go through it but it's it's not um I have great confidence that we as a region can continue to optimize the system and have this become uh, and take the same level of um efficiency and optimization that we've seen into the day ahead. It just, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. Um, and and I know our regulators are, are we're gonna have to be very clear on the benefits. We, you know, they have every right to um, make sure that we're making the right decision for our customers. So it isn't a slam dunk necessarily. We're doing the analysis to figure out um, where where best um, do we, do we um, you know, connect our system into day ahead. I want to also add that, um, you know, I think RAP is another critical part of our journey here so that we are putting all of these really, really critical um, infrastructure, you know, or, or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? These, these mechanisms um, and programs in place because we're just not going to be able to get there each on our own, and and so um, I, I I just see more of what we've started, and uh, and I'm really appreciative of the partnerships that have formed. I also I didn't say this um, at the beginning, but um, I also wanted to say thank you again to uh, to PAC and Kaiso as they have brought each of the EIM members on it, it, the incredible support that has been given. In, in the the hardware, the you know the technology deployment, and as well as the training, it was it, each one of them gets easier and easier. It's almost like you know I know I'm I'm not saying it was just flipping a switch for you, but when I compare <laughs> to what what you guys did to where the the next one, it it was it, it just keeps getting better. And I hope that we see something similar uh, as we move forward into uh, where I think the benefits of of EDAM will will, will come. Thanks, Lisa. So this is this is where I go off script and everyone cringes and so we'll see how it goes. Um, so questions that aren't here, but Lisa, you talk about um, the importance of thinking about an incremental steps, right? You've been I've heard you say that over and over, and um, you know I, I'm I think that's a good approach as well. But there's probably a bunch of others that we like the incremental steps, but we don't always know we don't want to get stuck with just that step because we want to look at different paths. We don't want to get carved off. I'd love to hear from others that are maybe more hesitant about taking that next incremental step. And like, what are you, what are the considerations as you think about that, you know, that step versus having a vision and a path to a broader market you may want to go into? Thank you, Doug. Let me see Somebody I'm... picked it up. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. It was silence there, so we'll try to keep it moving. You know, I mean, Nevada is in a bit of a unique situation where we are one of those states that as we sit here today has a legislative mandate that we need to bring a proposal forward by 2030 for Nevada to be part of an RTO. And, and so as we do consider, I mean, that, that's absolutely a consideration. As we assess a day ahead market, we're absolutely asking ourselves, is the structure of this day ahead market one that we believe could turn into an RTO? Mm -hmm. And, and, that's where this, where the governance issue, right? That that comes right to a head there. And we say, look, could we get there on on day ahead? Yeah, yeah, we probably, you know, we could probably get there as an incremental step. But as we look way down the road, and actually not even way down the road, 2030 is not that far away, right? Does that model really give us a solution that we can take to our commission and ultimately recommend that that's the RTO we're gonna we're gonna join? And we're not there today. And so that, that is absolutely a consideration as we try to balance the different options available to us, knowing we've got this legislative requirement that's out there, it, it absolutely influences that decision. Can I ask you a question, Steve, if we're going way off? All right, so I have a curiosity, you know, I get it that, that there's all kinds of um, uh, PC mandates and, and legislative mandates. Is there ever a, a spot where maybe that is rethought? 
if there is if there is value in the incremental steps, would would there ever be a time where where you could demonstrate that maybe you want to pause and and let that play out before you just say because I keep sure. asking when everyone says that RTO is the answer, I keep saying what was the question, and I don't get a lot of responses where it's real clear what the what the problem statement was. Yeah, no, I have to behave because my, my chairman's in the room. Okay, so I have to, <laughs> sorry for right, setting up. I'm going to behave, but I. Um, I think the answer is yes. I, well, I, I know the answer is yes, right? We have a reasonable commission. We have a reasonable office of energy. The director of the office of energy is here as well. And I am confident that if we went to those stakeholders and said, we do not believe the right solution for Nevada exists today, we need to take this incremental step, that we could find a path forward on that. Now, it may take a legislative change. Nevada's legislature meets every other year, so we've got a you know a 25 session, a 27 session. We could obviously have those conversations. Um, I, there is some room in the legislation, theoretically, that the commission could grant potentially a waiver of some requirements or push those timelines out. I think what's important, Lisa, is given where we're at right now, we need to move forward as if, because of the legislative yeah. mandate, we have to move forward today as if we are going to comply with that mandate. And we need to look at all of the information, all of the requirements to put forth a really good faith effort to comply with the laws that exist today. You're right. If we ultimately can't get to the right place, then I think you, th the solution you just articulated is one we look at really hard. So, Steve, I was going to add from a Bonneville perspective, uh, you know, I think the incremental approach has really helped us out from a public power um, you know, focus. We wouldn't have, I think, made the progress that we've made, um, even joined in the EIM, if we hadn't said to our customers, we're going to do this incrementally, we're going to understand how it impacts our statutory obligations to providing them preference power. Um, and, and, and we continue to, you know, kind of lean on that process, that focus. So, as we consider a day ahead market, uh, we're going to be pretty transparent mm -hmm. um, as part of that incremental step. And, and that said, I think a lot of folks do talk about, well, RTO is the future. We've got to, you know, kind of get there quickly. Um, you know, I think we, we just need to learn a little bit more. We, we do need to take this next step in day ahead market, um, kind of marshal our resources and understand, you know, what do we need to do in respect to deliverability and transmission and how do we get there? Um, in the quickest way possible, because that's the thing that bothers or worries me or concerns me the most is that, you know, we're doing a great job with, um, you know, bringing on renewable uh, resources and looking at markets, but um, the transmission aspect is lagging behind. And that's probably, you know, based on Lisa's comments, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, uh, one of the most important components of this entire uh, puzzle that we're putting together here. Uh, we have to speed up on the transmission front. And, you know, does an RTO get us there um, quickly? Now, there's some efficiencies, there's potentially cost savings, those types of things. But, you know, we have to really think through um, what are those next steps in terms of deliverability. And I think that's part of this whole incremental approach that we're taking. Can I jump into this off script business? <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're hit, first, we're all the key points. It's okay. We're good. <laughs> I think a lot of the comments just uh, you know, really appreciate John's comments in particular, just yeah, how do we move quickly? I mean, the urgency here, when I think about some of the studies we've done, and there's a million studies to look at, but we look at just uh, the most recent one, one we've done with Brattle, and I think they're going to speak to that uh, later today. You know, for Pacific Corp, it's, I think, $180 million a year in savings with a small footprint uh, of the EDAM uh, that's assumed in that model, I think 400 and some million uh, for the group, uh, you know, put in context about 2 billion a year in net power costs for us. So not quite 10% savings. I mean, that's huge, you know, for our customers at a time when we're seeing again, a lot of inflation. So, you know, to John's point, what can we do now to leverage the transmission grid that we have? Uh, Pacific Corp's obviously a big fan of adding more transmission. We need it to serve the, the load growth, the retirement of thermal resources, the need to add new renewables, but all that's going to be very expensive or more expensive than it should be if we don't have an optimization tool uh, up and running. 
and and in my view, if we have an optimization view, uh, tool that's running, it gives us market price signals that say, here's where the congestion is. You know, we kind of know where that is today, but a market is going to show us that in spades. And then we can go to our regulators and stakeholders and say, here's where we need to build transmission, and it's very defensible. And yeah, God, let's all hope it's not 15 years. And you know, to be quick to teamwork. I mean, Idaho Power did all the heavy lifting and making that happen. So thank you for your teams all uh, work in, in pulling that off. Uh, we're proud to be a partner, and also with uh, John and, and Bonneville, is a lot of complex commercial negotiations were involved, and, and that's what I love about you know this industry, the West. And when we do sit down and focus, we get it done. Uh, congrats to Jim and Bank and Smud, you know, for. Uh, jumping in there, uh, you know, while I, I imagine there's probably a lot of folks that would love to see that repeat of EIM where, you know, we jump in and solve some early bugs and then and then follow, it still saved our customers money those first few months it paid for the whole investment, uh, you know, let alone the magnitude of what we saw that, you know, far exceeded what the models uh, produced. And it was really driven by the growth in the footprint, you know, plus the growth in renewables and everything else that's happening, and as we're adding transmission, all those benefits will continue to grow. So I'm gonna stop with a nudge you know, to my other colleagues here in terms of speed. We'd love to have, you know, not only Jim and Bank, but you know, a, a larger handful of us, you know, moving forward in Q1 2026 uh, to really advance those benefits for customers. And, and yes, I agree with Lisa, maybe it leads to an RTO, maybe it doesn't. Again, what's the point? You know, we wanna build transmission where it's needed, the minimum necessary, but the right amount in the right place and manage that uh, that planning better. And I think, you know, we're doing more of that. You know, the RAP is gonna be a great tool to give us insight on resource adequacy, but it's not the tool to optimize. You know, we need to take this step. So uh, I'll welcome uh, more partners uh, in that, that first round. Still jumping in or? Yeah, let me, uh... Kind of jump in on this discussion too. For as a utility that doesn't have a mandate to be in an RTO and is not currently within the footprint of uh, Kaiso, I think it's important uh, to think. Yeah, I, Stefan, I totally agree. At, at the end of the day, ultimately the West needs to get more interconnected. We need to figure out how to share, you know, hydro of the Northwest, wind of the Midwest, and solar of the Southwest, and diversify resources, share resources. We need coordinated transmission planning. We need transmission cost allocation in order to make these things work. Um, there's a real opportunity. It's an interesting dilemma because I hear this a lot. Well, if governance model of EIM works, then won't it work for the day ahead market? And, and my answer tends to be, well, it seems like it probably would work. Um, and then there's this question, yeah, but if you go to the day ahead market, does that then mean you're going to an RTO? And, and that answer gets pretty varied, even amongst us. I mean, there are some that are, we can't get there quick enough. There are some that say, well, I have a mandate to get there and, and we don't have a mandate. And, and we like the incremental approach as well. We think that's the right way to do it. We've found great value out of EIM. Uh, we have a lot of confidence and, and great partnership with Kaiso as a system operator. We feel good about that. But when you get to the, if you assume that you're going to an RTO, then the governance conversation gets more complicated, right? It's, you know, greenhouse gas accounting, wheel through, um, you know, fast start pricing, uh, you know, the market rules, congestion. There's a lot of variables to solve and address. And, and so the question then becomes, well, if you go to that day ahead, do you need to address those things now? Or do you say, no, the governance is fine. We'll just trust that it gets fixed in the next phase. I, that's a complicated and tricky question to answer. And, and frankly, I think that's probably one of the most important conversations we're having right now. And that's why I fully support being here. And I think it's great that we're having it. So I think on the, on the governance side, um, I think at Edison, we recognize that that has been a big holdup for a lot of folks. The idea of how do you get independent governance so that California isn't dominating the governance. I think there's a good balance in what is set up in EIM and, and is intended to do an EDAM, but clearly it's not fully independent enough and maybe um, it's too easy for it to end up in gridlock where you've got you know two, two bodies, you need both of them to approve and the, the, you need better alignment um, than, you, than you're gonna get there over time for the RTO to be, for an RTO to be, I'll say fully capable of running everything it needs to do. So, you know, at Edison, we worked with 
all of you and a bunch of, of others out here to put together a proposal for what RTO governments, governance might look like. Um, that's, a, that's a model that could be considered. Uh, I know our regulators will talk later today about governance and, and things they're looking at and, and the approach that they're looking at in setting up an in, independent entity around governance. So I think that there is um, momentum, but probably not a lot of trust in what we've seen in the past. And so that really is, you know, so I think it's on a bunch of us to come together and how do we create that, that momentum and really get somewhere around governance. So I wasn't gonna ask a question on that one. It was more my, my point, my view, but John, I don't know if you wanna more to share on governance or Jim, I don't know if you're gonna jump in. Yeah, sure. So um, from our perspective, you know, you look at it as, you know, when we join EIM, uh, the governance structure, I mean, we were really clear. Uh, we came out of our public process and we said the uh, governance structure was sufficient, but what wasn't preferable. You know, the joint authority model has, has worked, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not independent. And that's what we're looking for in this next step. I mean, when you talk about moving from EIM, you know, to a day ahead, um, the volume um, of trades, you know, are just exponentially larger. There's just more at stake. We have to be assured, we have to be able to assure our customers that, um, you know, the, like I said, the statutory, um, you know, obligations we have to them will be met. And, you know, you do have to, I think, dive into the greenhouse gas discussions and uh, how you account for that. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're entering into 20 year contracts with our customers. And those contracts are built on the premise that not only do they have preference to this carbon free power, but the ability to maintain those attributes to meet their uh, po renewable portfolio requirements, those state requirements that are coming down on them. So, you know, we have to make sure that a governance structure is in place that we can feel uh, that's equitable. We have some influence. You know, we can't have it all. We can't have our way. We can't be set up a situation where, you know, Bonneville or the Northwest is a bully and, and just has everything that it wants put in place. No, we're not asking for that. We're just asking for kind of a fair playing field as we move forward and, and be able to participate in knowing that we can meet those obligations. Uh, you know, can we get there? You know, I, you know, the question remains, quite honestly, there was some excitement around, um, you know, the earlier legislation that was kind of trying to make its way through the California legislature that didn't make it. Yep. Um, and as you mentioned, Steve, there's, uh, I think, a, a pretty novel approach to creating an entity that could provide um, governance, but you know, are we in the position now to begin to entertain that, or should we still be looking at this next incremental step, which is that day ahead market? Um, you know, those are questions that we have to answer, and these dialogues will help us do that. But you know, from our perspective, and from at least from my perspective, I think there's a ways to to, to go on the governance front. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't want to set, suggest that what's happening with the EIM isn't working because I think. Uh, there's some, you know, value that's coming out of that approach. Right. I add one thing. I, I, I would just say, you know, one, we really appreciate, because California was very smart about how um, it, it engaged even on the EIM, where, you know, it was a relatively low cost to enter, it, there's no cost to exit. So, you know, if, we, if something goes sideways, we, we, there are other options. We can, we can go do something else. So, I, I think this, these are the battle scars of my, you know, 30 years of trying to figure out how these westwide markets or, you know, things would work. And, and I would just say to my colleagues to be thinking about, I get it that we have unanswered questions. We all do. You know, we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but we have a really good experience to base our projections on and a really robust process in which we we work on the things that you know we, we need to to make sure that we're um, you know serving our customers in the most uh, economic way and reliable way so i i think you got to i think we have to be careful not trying to solve for the future everything because it will collapse under its own weight mm -hmm. and so i think sometimes you know do we take small leaps of faith sure but there are options, there are plan Bs. So it, it, you know, are they expensive and not fully formed? 
yes. Um, but I, I think that um, the way we're looking at it is, you know, this would probably be the last step we would take without independence, but we're not even sure that an RTO is where we want to go in the first place. We're really trying to learn and demonstrate value for our regulators and our customers before we take that next step. So, so my, my cautionary tale is just, um, you know, be careful that we don't bite off so much that, that the, you know, we let the, the good be the enemy of the perfect uh, in the future. Big, bold visions are important and good, but practical steps help certainly get us there. You gonna jump in or? Yeah, maybe real quick. Uh, clearly we're on the on the page of evolutionary change for markets. We really think that's the best approach. And I think EIM has proven that. We hope EDAM will do as well. Um, the governance issue is a tricky one. Uh, as I like to say, we've, we've lived in the belly of the beast for the last 25 years and we've learned to figure out how to, how to manage that. Uh, I'd also like to say, I think the ISO today is a very different animal than the ISO of 20 years ago. Uh, clearly a much more collaborative organization. Uh, we're comfortable with the, the joint authority model for, for EDAM from our perspective, but we recognize that's not necessarily true for everybody, and we appreciate that. The thing I'm encouraged about, and, and I'm not gonna try to put the regulators on the spot here, but I, I think the letter we saw recently and I think the conversation I've had, and I know others have had with uh, regulators within California, I think there is a real understanding and a realization that we are better off from a California perspective if we are part of a broader market and we are collaborating more broadly. And I think that realization uh, will manifest itself in some real dialogue and wanting to figure out how do we solve this governance process and problem. So I, I, I'm encouraged by that. I will just say to those regulators, I don't think we have five years to figure this out. I think we got six to 12 months to figure this out. That's good points. And I was, Jim, I was, I'd reiterate, and I was gonna say that, uh, you know, I can't speak for all of California, but I think we feel, feel pretty strongly that to the extent there are broader markets, California needs to be integrated and not on its own island. And so that's what we're, I think that's what we're all working towards. Before we go to Q&A, one more question. Elliot, I wanna come back to you. Um, and this really gets to that point of the benefits of a single integrated market versus a fragmentation across the West. What do you, what do you see, it, like help explain the way you see it from the operator's perspective of, of that difference? You know, Steve, I was reflecting on, really actually glad you asked that because I was listening just, just you know, some of, the, some of the seams issues that we're dealing with today, you know, you know, we talk about the wheel through issues. We talk about some of the export curtailments. Those are part and parcel of the lack of integration. And actually the integration and co-optimization of our systems makes those problems, if not disappear, certainly much better to handle. And it's the balkanization that we have of so many balancing authorities. We have this big spread. We still, one of the things, you know, Mark Rothleder and I talk a lot about is just looking at some of the deltas between the different pricing hubs. You have a California, you know, security constrained economic dispatch market surrounded by bilateral markets and there's edges between those two things. The integration, the, first of all, the interoperability with the resource adequacy programs. And again, with Sarah, I've done a lot of work on, on RAP and we'll talk about that a little bit later, making sure that the markets can integrate effectively with the resource adequacy programs and really leverage their benefits. Uh, much greater visibility, transparency, and, and co-optimized dispatch of resources in the transmission system is gonna maximize the incredible diversity of resources that we have in the West. I mean, that Northwest Hydro, you know, the incredible renewable resources that are being developed, the batteries, and we've got 6,000 megawatts of lithium ion batteries on our system now. These are incredible resources that can be much better leveraged. And, to get us to a world where it's not, hey, what's my neighbor gonna do to me, but how do I work with my neighbor to co-optimize the system? And I think this next step is gonna be hugely beneficial uh, and we can, we can just see it during events like this summer. So we're really optimistic and I wanna officially uh, thank Jim and congratulate him for, for that announcement. That's pretty fabulous having a, Another member bank has just been an incredible partner. Uh, Jim and Tony Braun and the whole group and SMUD, John Olson, really, really appreciate those partnerships. Looking forward to speaking with your additional members. And I'm just, look, I just wanna, I just, 
express the, the gratefulness, uh, just the fact that we can all, we have a lot of history, a lot of friendships, a lot of partnerships, and we can talk openly and frankly with each other. That's what it's about. And I just appreciate the diversity of thinking, the diversity of resources, and just hopeful that we can take that next step together. All right. Thanks, Elliot. Let's go to questions. All right. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so for this power panel, we are opening up for questions. So if you're in the room and you want to have a question, please raise your hand. We've got four roving mics. We'll bring the mic to you. And for virtual folks, um, please raise your hand on the WebEx and we'll call on you. So in the room, who's going to start off with a question for this power panel? No pun intended. I'm sure there's somebody with a good question. I see that there's a volunteer. I know this isn't a shy group, so. Isabella, do we have anybody online? No? Okay, we got one over here. Go ahead, Mark. If you could state your name and affiliation, please. Uh, Houston Reynolds, ASUS. Um, with all the savings that you guys have seen with the EIM, have you actually had any rate reductions? Most of our, uh, I'll speak to Idaho Power, uh, 95 cents of every dollar that we save uh, flows back to our customers through uh, power cost adjustment uh, and annual adjustment. So yes, it, it is certainly, um, it, it's, it's where we have actually have net, you know, positive uh, revenue, it goes back and then it's also the cost reduction in the economic dispatch, so yeah. 100%. So, I mean, we forecast benefits in, in one rate me making mechanism, and then there's actual power costs that are then uh, captured in mechanisms that, you know, balance that out. So, you know, all those benefits are going to our customers. Yeah, I would say similarly, um, we flow, you know, the benefits back into our revenue stream, and, um, you know, we reduced rates in 2022 by 2.5% 2 .2 on average. And we've been able to maintain that rate reduction through 2025. Um, I like to say that because that's something that none of my predecessors were able to do. So uh, we are seeing some benefits. <laughs> no, I don't want in particular. <laughs> I would just add for the Arizona side, uh, it's a pass through back to our customers as well. So it all gets returned to customers and it's helped us keep rates flat over the last four or five years, our base rates. So, it, you know, it's all returned back to the customer side. Yeah, and uh, I'll say efficiencies that, that we're getting all the same way get passed back directly to customers. But I'll acknowledge for SoCal Edison and most of the California entities, it hasn't led to rate reductions. The benefits aren't that big to offset all the other costs that we're dealing with. Um, and I think this, you have to look at the same thing going forward. Getting into more efficient markets like this are about, frankly, avoiding even further cost increases. When you talk about the decarbonization that needs to happen, not just across California, but the West and, and, and the US, there will be significant investment that needs to go into that. And especially as you start talking about electrification, um, we're going to be serving more load over time. That means bills go up and ultimately with a lot of the investments to have a grid that is more reliable, more resilient, you know, ready to take on all that additional load. There is significant investment that will happen across the entire U.S. I don't think you can think that rates are going to go down. And but this is this is one of those steps we have to take to drive efficiency so we can do it as affordably as possible. It's not cheap but it is lower cost than continue to pay for fossil fuels like, like gasoline and, and vehicles. And so when you look at customers' total energy cost, this is one of the things that helping draw that down. Further electrification is gonna help draw that down over time. You know, at Edison, the, the work we've done, we believe by 2045, customer total energy costs should go down by about a third. But we're looking along the way, while we know we have a ton of investment to do, the electric bills will go up. Um, we have to take steps like this so that we can to help manage it so it will be affordable for customers over time. All right, I think we have a question over here, Scott Miller. Yes, hi, uh, Scott Miller, Western Power Trading Forum. Um, uh, enormously gratified to hear the, um, the momentum behind the market integration that's coming. Um, but, and uh, while I would have loved to have had this as an RTO, sorry, Lisa, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, uh, it, 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 I'm, I'm also uh, understand that we're, we're making progress with the day ahead filing. We've got 
a day ahead filing that is at the commission at FERC have any, but this is going to be different for FERC to contemplate. They've never seen anything like this before. I'm hoping that all of you, because you all have representation in DC of, of one kind or another, have been having conversations pre-filing since we're now in, uh, you know, in, in, in ex parte territory, have conversations with the commission to help them through this so that they can digest it and, and help make an expeditious ruling rather than having uh, having delays when they ask for some more questions or deficiency letters. I'd like to hear if if any of you or you had your staff uh, talking talking to the commission. Well, we're probably logically to start for that one, Scott. So um, absolutely, um, we've actually been keeping uh, FERC commissioners and staffers uh, posted all throughout the development. I think also, as you know, we've we've benefited from having, you know, when Rich Glick was uh, chair of the commission, very familiar with the West, Allison Clements, uh, even uh, Commissioner Phillips will be coming out here to Western Electric Industry Leaders Group soon. So we feel that that uh, the FERC has paid very careful attention to the evolution of RAP and resource adequacy and certainly watching EDAM. So we did have a chance to do pre-filing briefings. We are asking for uh, a ruling in, in, in December so we can really get the implementation train moving. Uh, we'll see if they're able to accomplish that. But yeah, we feel w w that they've been well briefed. I think their staff really understand what we're trying to accomplish and uh, hopeful for a, a good outcome. And certainly uh, the more support, the better, right? I think let's go get it. Maybe start since we had announced you know, our commitment to join. Uh, we've not yet met with FERC in any detail because you know we have a ways to go. You know the. Start of that is really with the, the big lift that uh, Cal ISO just delivered in filing their tariff. You know, they need to provide business requirements, technical specifications, and all that it's going to feed into our implementation and the forming of our tariff. So a lot of work to do, frankly, over the next several months, but we'll absolutely do that to your comments, Scott. Uh, and I think just broadly speaking, you know, all of us are, I imagine, a lot more inclusive and engaging a lot of stakeholders as we're you know moving along that you know, are impacted by everything we do. And I appreciate that FERC has recognized the West is different uh, and that every commissioner meeting we've had has seemed to reinforce, yeah, we need resilience, we need reliability, we need to lower costs and this incremental process. And I would just reinforce the comments that Lisa made, the fact that it's voluntary, you know, low exit fee, easy exit is, enormous uh, in, in supporting kind of, you know, why our decision to move quickly, because uh, you can exit quickly if you need to, but uh, by just leaning in and solving these problems, whether it's Washington, CETA compliance and GHGs, or it's FERC 881 with uh, dynamic line ratings, there's a lot that we're all tackling that has to be done. Uh, as again, Lisa noted, let's not try to boil the ocean all at once here and solve it. You know, we know where that goes. Uh, but if we lean in on these, you know, tricky issues, and they are tricky, uh, and any market is going to have to tackle that. What I love about the Cal ISO is they've just leaned in and made it happen, and it's a ton of work. Uh, but here we are, you know, and I'm very confident that we'll get this done. All right, BJ, and then we have a question on the chat. I'll have Isabella read in just a minute. Hello, uh, just the Western Resource Advocates. Thank you. The one thing I did hear from all of you was no, um, no disagreement that we need new transmission. And I also heard from Lisa as a reminder, let's not try to rush to reach the horizon so quickly. So if we combine the two, can you suggest any ideas to improve interregional transmission planning if we're not sure what role an RTO will have on transmission planning in the West? We have three new projects that have come to life. Uh, Boardman Hemingway, I was the hearing officer in 2008 for the first meeting. I was telling Stefan about it this morning. It's taken 14 years. So what could you want to promote in improving inter-regional transmission planning between the regional planning groups if you all want new transmission? Thank you. Boy, if I could, um, I do not think we have a planning problem. I think we have planned the heck out of things for many years. What we have is a construction problem, and what we really have is a permitting problem. That is the single biggest holdup on development of transmission. There's all kinds of transmission plans. I mean, there's volumes of, of project plans out there, but if we can't get the permitting to build them, they take 
decades. So I, I think an RTO doesn't fix that. I, I think um, it, it's a very um, convoluted sort of um, broken permitting process, both from uh, a, a state and federal level. And I'm not suggesting that there should be only one. I think we should be thinking about how do we streamline them so that we're not doing the same work over and over. Um, you know, there's there's lots of efficiencies that I think we can, we can gain. Um, I understand that each agency and each um, group that has an opinion or something that they, they're they concerned about, I, I totally agree that, that they should be heard. That's a, the wonderful thing about um, about being in, in the United States, uh, that you have a voice, but we have got to find, if we really want to get to this clean future, we have got to, to get the permitting process fixed. It's a good point. You need to get the voices in at one time. And so you can take one big bite, consider it all and decide and move. There's too many steps through too many agencies and too many bites at the apple along the way that just extend the process to untenable lengths. All right, I think we have a question online from Anita. I'm a governing body member for the Western Energy and Balance Market. Good, good conversation on around the governance and of course, as a governing body member, I'm always watching that. My question for you all is in regard to the regulators letter. So by and large, with the exception of, I think maybe two of you, you're all regulated utilities. And to the degree that your commission um, is in favor and in supportive of the regulators proposal, how will you guys kind of approach that? So I know I'll, I'll start. So California, California based and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Alice Reynolds, our regulators in the room, and she helped uh, work with some of the other uh, state regulators to draft the letter and get it out and start the process. And so um, I think uh, as, as that proceeds, we've been real open from the get go, which is how can we help? Um, I think we want to participate in whatever conversations are appropriate so that they can they can continue to move forward. You know, like I mentioned before, um, at SCE, we worked with a bunch of others to put together a proposal around governance um, that can be a starting point potentially for that. So we're not starting from from the beginning or a clean sheet every time we start a new a, a new uh, process. So um, we will, you know, to the extent that uh, there are conversations that we are allowed to have in our rules, we'll continue to uh, both encourage but um, provide input uh, to that to that process because we want it, we want to see it move and move at an appropriate pace, right, Jim? Not not a few years, but six to 12 months so that people can get clarity outside, um, you know, really across the West on what that approach will really look like and mean. Maybe I'll chime in and yes, and we're not jurisdictional, but we do have a excellent working relationship with the Public Utilities Commission. And we do get a little bit of oversight from the California Energy Commission in our processes. Um, we view the governance as a key factor to helping us move forward with where markets are gonna be in the West and ensuring that California is a player in that. So we are very actively engaged in this. We have reached out to both the PUC and the CEC, offering our assistance and our help and uh, looking to try to find out how can we can uh, help them expedite the process. I would add, um, first of all, hi Anita, it's so great to hear your voice. I wish you were here. Um, Me too. <laughs> I, I, we have been, we believe, um, certainly from an Idaho power perspective, that we have to bring our regulators along on the journey and we want to understand what their concerns are so we can work through those as we um, work to demonstrate using um, the studies that we're, we're undertaking right now to demonstrate the value. Uh, because at the end of the day, we, if it doesn't bring value to our customers, we can't participate. It's one thing to say it's great for the region, but if that doesn't then become value for our customers, that's a really hard sell. So we're certainly doing the 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 you know deep work of of the analysis um, and and again uh, making sure that we don't uh, bring any surprises along the way. Thank you. I, I'd echo Lisa's comment. I mean, I, we're in a very similar situation to Lisa. We are engaged with our commission. We're engaged with our regulatory operations staff in uh, in the discussions are, that are ongoing, and we're. I think somebody described it as a due diligence period. That, that's exactly what we're in right now. And analyzing the different options that are available. And I, 
I believe, based on feedback that we've got, our commission is looking to us at some point to bring a recommendation forward on what we think is the right ultimate decision for the state of Nevada and for our customers. We would likely do that through our integrated resource planning process, although it, it could come in a different type of filing, but, but ultimately this affects our integrated resource planning. And uh, you know that, that is why we are so engaged in these conversations around the West so that we can do that due diligence, we can get to a recommendation and bring that to, to our commission in short order. Now, I am, I am glad that our regulatory operations staff and our commission are involved because they're staying educated along the way. So it's not like we're gonna be bringing something to them for the first time they've ever heard it. And so from that perspective, I'm very glad that they're engaged. I, I should also add in our, our governor's office of energy is also involved in those conversations and is also a stakeholder as we work through these processes. So, uh, you know, I, I think we see engagement across across all those fronts, because this is this is a big decision for a state and has has significant implications on what that co what co future costs could look like. And I'll just be quick. I think, you know, regulators in all six states are involved in that conversation. And yeah, I think it's worth noting. I mean, we wouldn't be here talking about this, but for the regulators across the West, frankly, initiating the process in what was it, 2012 uh, and asked Cal ISO and SPP to make offers. Uh, and we evaluated that, and that's what got this whole thing going. You know, because the rest of us were in the big tent, having the you know two decade long conversation, and that's why we're here today and, and talking about the success and the opportunity uh, to take the next step. So I'm I'm thrilled that they continue to lean in, and again, our governor's offices as well as our regulators uh, across all those states are are active in that conversation, and and that's what gives me confidence that we can you know optimize the system as much as every one of our states has its unique policy interests you know we've found ways to you know make that work you know as we still optimize and bring you know those benefits that everybody wants together all right thanks anita. thank you for, thank you for that thanks anita for the question matt lacar yeah matt lacar pacific gas and electric company so i i appreciate anita's question because i was going to ask the flip side of that which is for jim and john um when you look at, you know, what state regulators are putting out there in terms of governance, what what does public power or federal power want to see, need to see from the governance to make it, you know, appealing to to you all uh, to come into the tent? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think I touched on it a little earlier. I, you know, I, it's, I applaud the um, state regulators for um, I think, you know, taking an approach that um, could have some legs, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really a, a challenging, you know, kind of path to take on governance, because if it was easy, um, we wouldn't be having these conversations, it would all be settled. So the, by the fact that, you know, we're still kind of, you know, um, wrestling with it, it is a challenging issue to, to, to really try to address. And, and so I, I think, you know, as we look at what the regulators are doing, um, you know, we're gonna really just keep abreast of the conversation, uh, see where it develops, um, you know, provide input that I think is important from public power. Uh, it really, from our perspective, will be nested in, like I said, our ability to continually provide, you know, or meet our statutory obligations. Um, and I think a lot of the regulators understand that or are getting more educated. We're meeting with them and making sure that they understand those interests that we have. Um, at, you know, and, and I'm thinking that, um, you know, the only challenge of what I'm seeing is that, um, you know, this creation of a new entity um, is taking or the, um, the planning could take a little longer than what we would like to see. Uh, we need answers now uh, around governance. Uh, we've gone through a couple of cycles where, uh, quite honestly, you know, we were told, well, you know, we'll have some things to consider, some real substantive changes from, you know, uh, more of a uh, to more independent type um, governance structure that, you know, we've clearly communicated is preferable uh, among our customers and in a lot of entities in the West. Uh, but we haven't seen those results. So, you know, this is another attempt at getting us there. But, you know, the question will be, at the end of the day, how quickly and quite honestly, you know, where's the substance to it? 
um, that has to be developed fairly quickly too. So, you know, we'll continue to watch and evaluate uh, what we see, but uh, we're not going to sit around and, and wait, you know, a long period of time to see what the results can be, particularly if it has to be politically driven, because we just haven't seen a lot of success there. So from, from my perspective, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I'm not going to pretend to speak for all of public power. Um, but just from my perspective, I think when you, when you really look at governance structures for a, a market operator, um, they kind of come down to a few options. And we had a lot of discussion on that when we developed the uh, approach that Edison took the lead on. I think from our perspective, we're going to want to see a seat at the table for public power. Um, it's nice that the regulators are having this dialogue. I've, I've had an opportunity to talk to some of the regulators to say, we, we appreciate where you're going. We think you're heading in the right direction. Please don't forget about us. Uh, we want to have a seat at the table and we want to see how this evolves. What is the, the implementation effort to get us there? And I agree, we need to get it there sooner and we need to get some meat on the bones sooner. All right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Mark Smith in the back of the room. Good morning, folks. This is Mark Smith. I'm with Calpine. I, I, I want, for those of you who are investor owned, uh, I want to shift the conversation just a little bit away from the regulators and the politicians to the investment community. Um, in your meetings, for instance, with advisors, um, uh, regarding quarterly earnings or whatever the, the case might be. Is this an issue that boils up to their interest? I mean, is there an, an investment or an investor's interest in your choice uh, to move forward with uh, a broader market, um, the EDAM particularly? Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll start. Um, it is not one that comes up regularly as a big question or a big area of of conversation with most of our investors. Um, I think over time, we talk about it in the context of being a real key tool in how we manage affordability, which is really important to our investors. So we get lots of questions on our increasing rates. They're interested in what happens with decarbonization, the investments we have to make, but they're also interested in what customers are gonna pay for it. And so we introduce it in, the, in that context is how this is an important thing to look to keeping rates low. At the same time, it's, on the horizon, it's it's far out there, and a lot of the time their investment horizon or where they're viewing things are, are shorter, and so it's not a big part of the conversation. I think to the extent that we can talk about benefits and show how that is helping manage our customer rates in both the near and midterm, there there is an interest. Yeah, I, I, our answer would be similar for Arizona. I think uh, it's not the top of the list, but it, it's certainly on the list. Uh, to me, it boils down to a little bit around, you know. If you're, if you're a growing utility and you're growing very rapidly, you know, the amount of infrastructure investment, you know, you know your investors are, are looking at what kind of capital do you need to raise, what, where are your ROEs, where, you, where is your opportunity to earn coming from. And while growth's generally a good thing, um, sometimes too much of anything's not as good. And so I view the, the market evolution as an opportunity to optimize existing resources. It helps drive also the, the clean commitment, which is pretty important to the investor community. So that demonstration that we're making good progress in the direction of decarbonization while we're effectively managing growth, and, and frankly, the market helps in both those spaces. So I think it's tangentially important to investors, but not directly. Obviously, Doug and I are a little unique. We have an investor of one, and so we don't do those <laughs> quarterly earnings calls, and I can't comment on that, but certainly our, our shareholders are you know, thrilled with our progress to deliver on those, you know, core principles of, you know, reducing customer costs and, and delivering a liability, kind of why we're here. I think, uh, you know, there's also a respect for our independent, you know, individual entities. And so, you know, Doug and, and MV Energy, you know, are gonna work with their regulators, their policymakers to make decisions and Pacific Corp will work with our six states to make those decisions. I would say that as we, you know, you consider other, players, you know, like underwriters, you know, that are underwriting the business, uh, you know, to echo, you know, Steve's comment in respect to emissions reduction in, in a world where ESG uh, factors are, are feeding into a lot of uh, those players around the world, uh, very important to demonstrate, you know, that we are reducing emissions. And this has been an enormous tool. I mean, our 
you know, metric tons down, something like 30, 40 million metric tons. I've kind of lost track of the number. It's been extraordinary uh, because we're, you know, backing off our thermal fleet and importing or producing more renewable energy. So we not only save money, you know, reducing emissions, and we've added, you know, 5,000 megawatts of renewables in the last several years that the EIMs help us to integrate, and we're adding another 10,000, you know, in the next several years. So, uh, you know, that's where it does, I think, certainly come into play not only with the banks, but also with uh, other stakeholders. Joanne, we good to uh, wrap this or? Yep, I don't think we have any time for any more questions. So, All right. So um, I, I think if, if at lunchtime, hopefully if some of you are around, I'm sure the audience does have some more questions. Absolutely. So feel free to um, ask at that time. So Steve? Can we, I'm gonna do a quick rapid fire. We've yep. got a bunch of us. So these are like sh real short answer. What's the take? What's one takeaway? Either it's something you took away from this, or what you want to leave folks with. And I was going to start at Elliot, but I can go first if you want, Elliot. Diversity is a blessing. Diversity in thought, diversity in resources, and uh, teamwork makes us all stronger. So, really appreciate the conversation. The diversity of the West can be a real strength, but we've got to figure out how to harness it through transmission, through ensuring we have adequate resources and ensuring that we've got a governance structure that that works for for all of the players across the west let's go <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm very hopeful i think um the more conversations we have the more that we're exchanging ideas and um not you know weaponizing diversity of thought i think is is really important on just society in general I'll just throw that out yeah, I think, um, you know, we're at a, an important juncture in, in the industry, and this next step is going to be a critical step for us in meeting a number of needs. So it has to be really thought through uh, well, and um, a number of, I think, important considerations have to be factored in as we, um, you know, take this next step. But it's going to happen, and I think everyone understands that, and public power is ready to take that step also. Collaboration is critical. Yeah, I was going to add that I, I think we, we the West, share a common vision. I mean, that's what I, I take away from the discussion today. We, we all see a future that, like, we're working together to serve customers across the West safely, reliably, affordably, and, and clean. The challenge is, like in many things, the devil's in the details. Um, and, and I think when you have difficult problems like this that are not easily solved, you know, that's really where collaboration and compromise become incredibly important. So I think we need to make sure we're focused on the end game and that we are collaborating and compromising collectively in order to achieve that longer term objective. All very well said. And maybe I'll just add with the thought of don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. If we got to keep taking steps in the right direction. So join me in thanking all of our panelists that really appreciated the conversation. All right, we'll take a 15 minute break. There are snacks at the back of the room. So let's continue this collaboration. Thank you. Yan, if you wanna take a seat, grab your last cup of coffee, drink. Speaking of collaboration, it's great to see everybody collaborating over the break. Seems like we need to have longer time given the interaction everybody's enjoying again. All right, if we can bring some folks in from the lobby, that would be great. I know, yeah. So while we're waiting for a few people to take their seats, uh, I'll share with you a little bit of Las Vegas trivia. So there are 58 golf courses in Las Vegas. So for those of you who are golfers, you've come to the right place. I'm not a golfer, but glad to see that Las Vegas supports lots of golfers. All right. Okay. I think we're gonna get ready to get started. Um, so our Next featured remarks are going to be introduced by Stacy Crowley, our Vice President of External Affairs at the California ISO. And then we are going to get into a panel discussion 
a regulator's point of view. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to introduce our featured remarks speakers. Good morning, everyone. I hope you got a good chance to get some more coffee and a muffin or some fruit and catch up with some some friends and colleagues. It's great to see everybody here today and appreciate um, the great attendance and the smiling faces and really uh, good engagement on this issue. So I am delighted to be here. Um, first of all, great CEO panel. I uh, really appreciate the comments from uh, the leaders of the utilities uh, around the West. Very engaged and good group to, to kick us off. So next, I am um, proud to introduce two Nevadans who are really key in the energy conversation here in Nevada and throughout the West to just provide some very open um, preliminary remarks. I have Dwayne McClinton, the director of the Nevada's Governor's Office of Energy, and Haley Williamson, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. Just real quickly, Dwayne was appointed by Governor Lombardo as the director in February of 23, uh, following years of experience in the government affairs sector and the energy industry, most recently with Southwest Gas. He's a Marine veteran, and I want to thank him for his service. And he made it through his first legislative cycle successfully uh, and has jumped in um, with both feet on these uh, regional energy topics and is now serving on the CREPC board, the Western Interstate Energy Board, uh, and the YRAB board, among others. So appreciate his engagement, and I'm so glad he's here with us today. And I've known Haley Williamson for probably over a decade now and just have enjoyed watching her move into this leadership role as the chair of the commission um, and take on really significant cases and policy decisions for the state of Nevada. She was appointed by um, chair, she was appointed chair by Governor Sisolak in 2020 and then reappointed by Governor Joe Lombardo here earlier this summer. She's also highly engaged, serving on the NARUC board, uh, as well as the body of state regulators and TRPA, which is close to my heart. It's a bi-state agency supporting Lake Tahoe uh, development. Uh, she will be joining us on the upcoming panel as well. So I'd like to bring Haley and Duane up to the stage. Oh. Good morning, everyone. I am Dwayne McClinton, and it is my honor and privilege to serve under Governor Lombardo as his director of the Nevada's Governor's Office of Energy. Uh, I would like to welcome you all here for this next discussion on a roundtable on regular, regulatory, or regulators' point of view on extended day market. Um, it is an exciting time for us in the Western states to come together to meet evolving needs, energy needs of our residents and visitors. I'm excited to continue this conversation and this journey together. To set the stage, I would like to share a few highlights of Governor Lombardo's energy policy objectives and how the Governor's Office of Energy, as one of the vital players in the state, is working to deliver on these objectives. Through executive order, Governor Lombardo laid out his, his energy policy objectives with a focus on providing Nevadans a reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy choices through diverse energy supply portfolio strong energy infrastructure, and a robust energy workforce and economy. In my office, we have, a, we have built our vision, our mission and goals around Governor Lombardo's objectives, and we keep them at the forefront of our mind each and every day. In alignment with the governor, our four goals are to, one, increase the number of federal funding opportunities we go after, two, aid in the development and expansion of Nevada's energy workforce. Three, explore and expand energy resources within and outside Nevada's portfolio. Four, support projects to strengthen reliable energy supply and delivery. Given these last two goals in particular, we are excited by the design potential of the extended day after, I mean, extended aftermarket to increase regional coordination, support our state's energy policy goals and to meet the demand cost efficiently in the West and for all Nevadans. At the end of the day, energy is about people. When we coordinate originally in ways that support states' energy policy goals, we are better positioned to provide 
what matters most to our people and what is to the heartbeat of Nevada's policy, and that is affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy choices. As a key partner in this endeavor is the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. And before I introduce my friend and colleague, I wanna congratulate her on her recent reappointment as the chair of the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. If you would please all welcome me and join in our chair, Haley Williamson, to the podium. Thank you so much, Director McClinton, for the overview of Nevada energy law and policy. As Director of Governor's Office of Energy, you hit the important pieces of energy policy that we're implementing in Nevada. I always like to refer to the Commission's role as making sure that a three-legged stool stands. The three legs being reliability, economic considerations, and policy considerations such as the ones you outlined. All three of these important things the Commission balances and weighs in the public interest of shareholders and ratepayers. The proverbial stool doesn't stand without the three legs, and we in Nevada don't achieve reasonable and cost-effective energy policy without taking these things into consideration. It is a privilege to be able to share the stage with you today. I think it highlights how well the Governor's Office of Energy and the PUC work together to implement Nevada's energy policies. Nevada has a long and proud history of collaboration in the energy sphere amongst our agencies, and collaboration is also what I want to talk to all of you about today. Collaboration is what brings this room together. Collaboration is what we see from the many different sectors and backgrounds with all these stakeholders as we all continue to collaborate we've invested in over the years to create and implement an extended day ahead market we all got here today through many meetings including what i believe are over 80 stakeholder meetings hosted by the kaiso meetings of the western eim governing body the governance review committee the regional issues forum meetings of regulators across the west meetings of utilities across the west the Western Interstate Energy Board, the Committee on Regional Electric Power Cooperation, and I'm sure I'm leaving some out. This collaboration has led to the extended day ahead market proposal being created and refined with a tariff filing at FERC this August to bring the benefits of operating in a larger day ahead environment in which EDAM can optimize resource commitment across a broader regional footprint with greater resource diversity, giving it the potential to generate additional benefits and lower costs for our energy consumers. Sitting here in Las Vegas, I hate to say anything contrary to Las Vegas' mantra, but at this forum, I really hope what happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas. We have a lot to learn from each other. As we continue in the spirit of collaboration and we continue to build on the successes we have achieved over the last few years, I have to mention here the success of the important step of joint authority of governance and how collaboration of those in this room made that a reality. I'll turn again to the importance of collaborating in day-ahead market discussions here in Nevada. In Nevada, we have Senate Bill 448, which you've all heard about now, which requires that every transmission provider in the state join a regional transmission organization on or before January 1, 2030, unless the commission waives or delays this requirement. To me, discussion of an EDAM is an important step that we all take as we consider in the West whether and how to create a full RTO. It's exciting to think that since the inception of the EIM in 2014, when the West embarked on the new horizon of a real-time energy market, what is now on the horizon is the day-ahead market, which studies reflect will bring operational savings, carbon emission reduction, and capacity savings across the West. The EDAM is an important step as Nevada and others discuss the potential of a full West-wide RTO. Let's continue the successes of collaboration and discussions with each other, as only the West can, recognizing our individual uniqueness while also working together to see what we can achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dwayne and Haley. Appreciate those remarks and appreciate you welcoming us in your state. I'm a Nevadan as well, and so um, glad to be here with you both. So now I'd like to welcome up uh, the panelists for the regulators' um, point of view, and I'll just I'll refer to their names alphabetically, or you can sit in any order you'd like as you come up. We have Gabriel Aguilera, the commissioner from the New Mexico Public um, Regulation Commission. We have Milt Dumit, the commissioner from Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. We have Alice Reynolds, president 
of the California Public Utilities Commission, Letha Tani, Commissioner with the Oregon Public Utility Commission, Kevin Thompson, uh, Commissioner with the Arizona Corporation Commission, and Haley Williamson, Chair of the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. So thank you all for sitting down and, and I'm gonna sit down here with you and, and we'll get started. Can you hear me? Well, we are just going to break right into the discussion. I think we all decided as a, a group of panelists to dispense with sort of open, opening remarks, and you can see their bios uh, uh, on the link to the EDAM forum webpage, and you can learn more about them, but we just decided to jump right in, and so glad to have you all here today. Thank you so much. So the first question I wanted to ask all of you is really it's sort of a table setting question. And it's just to really let the folks in the audience understand the differences uh, in how your states work. And I think there's no right or wrong way, uh, but I just would hope you take a couple minutes to um, describe how you see your relationship with your state leadership, governor's office, legislature, the regulated utilities that you oversee, and the stakeholders, and specifically in regards to market activities. So if you don't mind just each of you spending a couple minutes with that background, I think that'll help the audience understand your perspectives going forward. Milt, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you, Stacy. Milt Dumit, I'm the newest uh, Washington commissioner. Um, almost a year, September 1st, it will have been a year since I've been on the uh, commission. I came through telecom, so this energy uh, um, subject matter is, is is still relatively new to me, and I I tell people um, it's like I'm in college again, you know, at my age because I hear things every day and have these moments. And the panel this morning, I thought was just you know another example uh, of that. So in Washington, we have three commissioners: um, Chair Dave Danner, and Rendall, and and me. Uh, Dave is a member of the governor's uh, cabinet, so we have a really direct line into the governor's office of energy and to the governor uh, through Dave as well, and so. Um, you know, if, if there is resistance or, or dissent or encouragement, you know, we, we feel to that. On the other hand, we're very, you know, we're an independent uh, body completely. So I, I uh, am, you know, take in terms of stakeholders, uh, uh, you know, we're, I'm formerly from the legislature. That's sort of was my beat for many years. I was with Verizon and Telecom, as I said. Um, and I have a great deal of respect for uh, the laws that are passed. And so we're implementing these CETA laws. Uh, now that so the legislate legislators are a big um, you know uh, uh, stakeholder of ours as is the governor's office as are the investor owned utilities as are all the, the stakeholders when i first started with verizon i'll finish on this stacy but um i was uh before the commissions in the northwestern mountain states a lot and then you know basically competition happened and we you know we telecom is nearly an afterthought you know um now but but it's it's the, the the landscape has changed so much. You know, at that time we had public counsel or consumer advocate and the companies and maybe the big uh, you know customers and Department of Defense or whoever. Now there's a plethora of of engaged customer groups, and I think I just appreciate it so much. And so I listen to them, you know, every day, and they they all, they have opinions on the markets as well. So that's that's sort of that's Washington in a nutshell. Thank you. Appreciate it, President Reynolds. Sure. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you, Stacey. I'm Alice Reynolds, president of the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, so we uh, are a five-member commission established in the Constitution over 100 years ago as a railroad commission. Um, and uh, we ha regulate, uh, um, we have three large investor-owned utilities, um, six total, but three large ones. And um, we, uh, uh, we, we have um, about 75% of the load in the state. So as Jim mentioned, we have a number of publicly owned utilities in California as well. Um, and we are, the, the IOUs that we regulate are not vertically integrated, so they're a little bit different than some of the other utilities throughout the West. Um, we're also decoupled, um, so we have, a, you know, a few, uh, a, we have something that also sets us apart to some extent. I think our utilities would probably say that we're an active regulator, as I know some of them are here, and uh, they may agree with that. Um, and we also have a, a, a very close relationship with our 
sister agencies, the Energy Commission, Commissioner uh, Gunda is here today. Um, we also work t uh, closely together with the California Air Resources Board, Department of Water Resources, and we, have, and we work in collaboration with the governor's office on issues like reliability. So after 2020 events, um, which kind of made us uh, step back and, and try to figure out what we really need to do in reliability and really re realizing that it implicates a lot of our different state agencies, not just the PUC, we established um, a very active coordination groups so that we can easily get together and, um, and talk and develop uh, necessary tools to get through reliability events and also plan for the future. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, while the PUC has a very structured uh, role with respect to regulation of the utilities, there's also a lot of uh, informal collaboration taking place and sometimes formal as well because we have many statutory mandates that have us jointly preparing reports and jointly working together um, on task forces. And so we work um, very actively together. You may, you, if you've ever looked at a um, org chart, essentially, of the California state government, it's very large with many boxes on it. And so I think sometimes people feel that it's, uh, you know, overwhelming and impenetrable as to, in terms of who does what. Um, but over the years, we've managed to coordinate very, very closely together and, and, and maximize the impact of everyone in their own sw swim lanes, but also working collaboratively together. And then just, I, Stacey, you also ask about stakeholders. Um, we have a very uh, strong stakeholder process through the PUC, but also all of the cooperation and the work that we, we do together is done uh, together with stakeholder input. It's very important in California. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I guess I'll add also our, well, one example of that is the CAISO stakeholder forum. So we participate along with other stakeholders. With respect to FERC, the PUC is the statutory designated um, entity to participate in FERC proceedings on behalf of the state of California. Um, so we also make FERC filings. Um, that's part of our role. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Tani. Uh, well, hello everyone. It's wonderful to see, uh, see you to the degree I can see you. Uh, so we're uh, in Oregon, three member commission organized very much like Washington, a, ch a child of the legislature. Our authority flows from, um, from them uh, as opposed to the constitution. Uh, I think what I would add, uh, you know, we, we approach things very similarly uh, to our colleagues in Washington uh, in terms of our process and engagement with the legislature and so on. On the markets issue, we've uh, really sought, I think, to, and, and have historically, as a commission, far before my time, uh, really engaged regionally. I think in the Oregon Commission, there's been sort of an ethos of, there, there's no real way for Oregon to go it alone. Uh, you heard uh, Administrator Hairston uh, speak to how much of the trans high voltage transmission system BPA manages and owns in the region. We have always uh, needed to collaborate closely with BPA and with public power in Oregon. We only regulate the investor owned utilities. And so to that end, uh, as, a, as an agency, we've invested heavily in um, the Western Interstate Energy Board, the interstate compact um, that the West has at its disposal for state uh, uh, government cooperation on energy um, with our sister agency, the Oregon Department of Energy, uh, and really invested in uh, growing the capabilities of state regulator cooperation on these markets questions. So invested heavily in building up the body of state regulators in um, creating the committee of state regulators in the RAP program and uh, continuing to engage in the Markets Plus conversation. Uh, and I think that really goes back to this sense that uh, our part of our responsibility in Oregon is ensuring that we are collaborating closely with our colleagues from across the West because that's where the resources that serve Oregon are located is entirely across the West. And we are blessed with hydro in the Northwest. It would still be um, very expensive for our customers to sort of go it alone. And so uh, I would say that what that focus on how do we build collaboration uh, so that 
Oregon customers are benefiting from that whole uh, Western viewpoint is, is one of the areas we invest an enormous amount of time in addition to the day job pieces that are a lot like what Milt described. So I'll stop there. Commissioner Thompson. Awesome. Um, first of all, Haley, thank you for hosting us. Um, actually came from uh, Arizona to Nevada to cool off a little bit. And so I got to wear a jacket. It's kind of chilly here. Um, uh, from uh, we're very much um, like um, uh, Alice in the fact that we are constitutionally established at statehood in Arizona. And so we are elected officials elected uh, across the entire state, not by districts or precincts or what have you, but statewide. Um, so I've been on for about eight months now. So I'm, I guess I'm no longer a newbie. I, I heard that there was somebody here that was three months uh, in. So uh, Gabriel and I are, are veterans now. Um, uh, but it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a great journey so far. Uh, absolutely enjoy it. Um, from my perspective, you know, we, we have, so I, I came out of the natural gas industry. I spent 17 years at the LDC in Arizona, uh, Southwest Gas. They're, they also have uh, headquartered here in Las Vegas as well. Uh, but you know, I've worked on both sides of the fence, not only operations, but I worked in government relations for a while. Uh, so I got to know uh, a lot of our elected officials across uh, the, the Maricopa County area. And, um, and then I was elected to city council in Mesa and, and really got to uh, meet and, and uh, got to know a lot of our, our state elected officials as well. Um, and, you know, I've always had a collaborative relationship with our state officials, elected officials. And so when I, you know, when I came into the commission, I wanted to carry that forward because there's the, the corporation commission in Arizona has always operated on its own little island um, because we are constitutionally founded and we're elected. We don't report to the governor. We don't report to the legislature. We report to the citizens of Arizona. And so um, I wanted to make sure that we have that collaborative effort or that collaborative uh, relationship with our state legislators because they do fund us. And um, the easiest way to hurt the commission is to uh, have the, the, the legislature defund uh, the corporation commission. And so um, the collaborative relationship we have has allowed us uh, this past budget cycle. Uh, we, we did a, an additional $6 million ask because we wanted to give our employees a, a, an increase. Uh, they haven't had a raise in over 10 years. And so we had a lobbyist, uh, we hired a lobbying firm to go down and lobby on our behalf. Um, I spent a lot of time at the legislature as did a lot of my colleagues on the commission. And uh, we had the state legislature um, give us a $6 million increase to our budget. And the governor did sign off on that. We were one of the only state agencies in Arizona that actually got an additional $6 million. All the, all the organizations went in and asked, asked for more money, but we were the only one that the governor actually signed off on. So it's that, that type of collaboration uh, versus trying to be on an island and doing things on your own, but actually working with others. But we also are taking that a step further because um, I remember when I was at the LDC, um, there was this love-hate relationship between the Corporation Commission and the utility. And uh, we always felt like we were being picked on um, and we would always push back. And there was, a, there was very much a lot of headbutting going on back and forth. And I lived through those days and those days were miserable um, being on the utility side. And so I came in wanting to have the collaborative relationship with our utilities as well. A lot of people um, will tell you that, you know, the utilities have you in their pocket, right? When you start trying to work with the utility. But from my perspective, the better, the best way that I can serve the constituents of Arizona is to ensure that our utilities are uh, maintaining a reliable energy grid across all of Arizona at the most affordable cost. And you do that through collaboration. And so I, I will always try to work with our utilities to, to meet the end goal of grid reliability at the most affordable cost. And so um, from Arizona's perspective, that's where I'm at and my colleagues, I think also share in, in, uh, in that same uh, capacity. Thank you, Commissioner Aguilar. Thank you. Um, and I don't mind sharing a microphone because to, to the <laughs> comment earlier about two microphones for three people, I think it's a prudent decision to only invest in two microphones. 
we're better off uh, sharing resources. Um, like many of my colleagues uh, within New Mexico, I would describe our relationship as collaborative, and that's really something that I'm trying to get more of and, um, you know, a sentiment that I, I really want to continue to build on. Our state leaders have been um, good in setting the direction for New Mexico. We have rules on grid modern, modernization, transportation, electrification, um, community solar, uh, energy transition. And so I, I really appreciate that they've set that direction for us. They have not set up any kind of mandate for utilities in New Mexico to join an RTO. I think they're really leaving those um, laws and goals up to us, the regulators and stakeholders and utilities to figure out whether uh, regional markets are good, you know, right for New Mexico and, and which ones, and they are aware of, of regional markets. And so um, with respect to utilities and stakeholders, um, also collaboration, we have a workshop that we're, that, uh, we're gonna have on September 21st to talk about extended day ahead markets, um, you know, the, the markets plus and potential RTO participation to, you know, much, much like the conversations that we've been having regionally, but focused on New Mexico so that we can talk through um, these issues as they are, you know, are uh, applied to us especially. And so uh, we're hoping to, you know, in engage stakeholders and utilities and, and get all of us in a room, you know, the other commissioners um, and figure out what expectations we have from regional markets um, and set up some guiding principles. And some of you might be interested in that conversation and certainly welcome you to come as well. Um, and so I think um, that's how I would describe our, our relationship in New Mexico, collaborative, and, and hopefully I could, you know, help facilitate that, that conversation. Thank you. So Chair Williamson. Thank you. And you all, I got the chance to write my remarks down beforehand, so you all have heard them already. Um, but I will, I will uh, add a little bit to that. We are a three-member commission, um, proud to serve um, with my now fellow commissioner, Cordova. Um, and we are a creature of statute, very similar to Washington and Oregon. Um, I think particularly in the market space, um, this is, I think, collaboration, which you heard me say many times, is so important. It's a place where we have been learning with our utility, um, with our sister agencies, but also um, with some of our, our large customers, our res residential customers. Um, we, because we have a legislative mandate to join an RTO, also had the chance to set up a Nevada Transmission Task Force, which has members of the business community, members of the legislature, all able to come together to talk about what markets mean in and for Nevada. Um, and the way I see it as well is most of the time at our commission, um, it's, a, it's a contested case process as it is for most of you, um, where we have ex parte rules and, and very formal rules of evidence gathering. But I think at the commission, what's going to be so important in the markets discussion is a more robust stakeholder process um, in a rulemaking or an investigation, something that brings people together in the room with our staff, with our interested stakeholders where we can talk about markets very similar to what you're describing, Gabriel, in New Mexico, um, where we can have these discussions um, pre a filing that we expect to come from NV Energy. And I think this is also interesting. Um, in Nevada, we are expecting a filing um, to join a market. I'm not sure if that holds true for every state across the West, but we expect our utility to file something that will be contested. Um, so pre that, having these discussions, learning together, um, so that we can vet this for Nevada and with Nevada. But I do have to say as well, sitting up here with all of these regulators, um, what a privilege it's been learning from all of you through the body of state regulators and just discussions and building these relationships um, as we talk about, you know, as I'm looking at it from the lens of Nevada, but also across the West, what does this mean for other states? What does this mean as we, as we all vet this together and, and what a resource that has been as well? Thank you all. I think that hopefully that just helps sort of set the stage for 
um, how each of these states uh, works through these issues. And I think there's some similarities, but also some unique uh, situations, which I think helps um, bring everybody together. And, and that sort of diversity of thought, as we heard on the last panel, I think is important. So before we get into the letter that was referenced uh, in the earlier panel, I want to ask one more question for those who are interested in answering it. But we, you touched on a little bit. Everybody receives information differently. They absorb it differently, right? And, and over the years on these Western market conversations, there's been um, different ways that information has come in through filings, through investigatory dockets, through studies, through Western regional conversations at, at these, um, these regional forums. What, uh, uh, they're complex issues, right? So have you seen some examples of successful uh, information gathering that's worked for you, right? And, and, and if you have, um, we'd love to hear some examples. And if you haven't, what information do you still need or would you like to see to help sort of formulate your perspective or opinions on where Western regional markets are going? And I'll open it up to see who would like to, to take that question. Well, Lisa. I'd love to jump in. Um, so I think a good example, uh, pre-pandemic, <laughs> we had um, several of our uh, Rocky Mountain State colleagues uh, obtain DOE funding to hire a modeling company to do a market model that was driven by us as state agencies. Uh, and so we all sat together and picked the assumptions and picked what the transmission uh, plan would look like and, and so on, so that we could answer the questions for ourselves about what are the benefits of different footprints, of different market options, of different incremental steps. I don't take those results to be sort of dollar perfect, but I take them as directional. And I think that step of, of sort of the agencies all together saying we need more information that is answering our questions and doing that collectively and collaboratively um, was really interesting. We learned a lot about how we different, how different states are positioned and have different questions. Um, and uh, to have a study then that sort of we played the role in the assumptions. Um, typically when we see studies, we're always asking um, what's, what's the bias uh, under this study? No offense to the panel later today. That's our job as regulators to ask that question. Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting exercise. Um, and other than that, I think our biggest, in addition to that, I think our, our um, biggest resource is the Western Interstate Energy Board. And the way we've been building capabilities and collaboration and cooperation there, having our own interstate compact to collaborate on energy um, is, is actually the envy of the East <laughs> when I talk to other states. Uh, and that, that instrumentality that can be so responsive to whatever the situation is that's emerging and the questions we have in our role as accountability um, monitors as, as decision makers is just really valuable. Um, I think it's a, it's a tremendous asset and I really appreciate um, how the CAISO has um, collaborated with WEEB because that, that wasn't necessarily, um, that was a choice that the ISO made and I, and I have very much appreciated that. I've also appreciated um, how the um, Utilities have supported the body of state regulators having that independent expertise available to them. That information has been really critical and, and helps us then come to the table in a much more effective manner uh, than we would otherwise, because we all are on that learning journey. Um, so just, just two successes, I think, that we're continuing to build on as this deepens. But yeah. You, you on that market-led start, the, the multi-state uh, market study, there was even a set of questions that um, that you facilitated that said, how will reg regulators have to make, how will they have to change their role or their decision-making? And I think that was, I think to your point, very pointed to how regulators might be impacted by this, right? How will their authority change? What kind of questions they, are they gonna need to answer when folks come to them with those kind of proposals? So yeah, I thought that was a, that's a good example. Are there other examples of, of how to best get this information and anything else that you would need um, to help you in the market analysis? 
Well, I, I guess for me, I'm, I'm more on the fact finding mission. Um, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So I spend a lot of time on the phone with Lita um, and Mark Thompson and others, you know, uh, a lot of our BOSAR members um, really trying to digest, you know, I went to UNLV, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. And so I'm a data geek. Um, and I was, Lita and I were talking earlier, I have the habit of going down these rabbit holes, which is easy to do when you get into, uh, into markets and the discussion. Uh, and so I, I love reading whether it's the utility dive or, or you know, Googling something and, and then going down that pathway, but trying to digest this information. And then all of a sudden you get to a point to where you don't understand something. And so then you're reaching out to the utility saying, can you explain this to me? Or you're reaching out to Letha and saying, can you explain this to me? <laughs> and, and really kind of relying on each other, um, not only inside Arizona or inside the state with our stakeholders, but also from a regional perspective of, you know, of people that have been through this, that have asked the same questions that I've asked, you know, and, and I know that I don't have to reinvent the wheel because the wheel's already there. Um, but I'm asking a lot of the same questions that others have asked on the, along the path and, and being able to get those answers uh, without going down that rabbit hole. So it's helped me. Yeah, and I'd like to um, tag along on that because, you know, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful about these workshops that we've been putting together at in New Mexico. We had another one on reliability metrics, and there is really something to be said about having like a smaller space with, you know, the, the interested stakeholders and the utilities and the commissioners all asking questions and um, thinking about the issue collectively and um you know i i think that that is one way to really figure out some of these answers to to the questions that we have and you know we we all have different state laws different uh geography resources and so we really need to think about how this is going to how it, this is going to affect us as a state on behalf of our consumers and so i think those conversations can can really help. And the last thing I'll say is that um, Letha also really helps. Um, we had a good conversation about greenhouse gas accounting last night. And so I was thinking about that from between like 1 a.m. to, you know, 3 a.m. So also a little bit sleepy. Thanks, Letha. <laughs> can only answer questions because I have asked many of you many, many questions and you've been very patient in explaining things to me. So that's the only reason. I'll just jump in and say that uh, one thing that I really appreciate with about the KISO model, and we've been working with KISO for a long time, is that it, it allows for collaboration between our staff and KISO staff so that technical folks can have meetings and, and really sit down and unpack some of the issues about market, how the market works and then plans for changes. So any kind of um, uh, proposal that comes out, there's an ability for the staffs to get together and discuss it. And then with that, I'm able to ask questions and have the information that I need. So um, that's just an example of part of how the model has been working that I think is very effective. So thanks for me. As I said earlier, I mean, I take information wherever I find it now. And you can ask the folks at the breakfast table this morning whose brains I picked on markets um, issues. I, the studies are important, as we've heard. The Brattle study, uh, which you'll see later today, was impactful you know, for me. So John and Brattle, I'm, I'm raising expectations, and, uh, and you'll do a good job this afternoon, I'm sure. Um, the, the stakeholders that we talked about, you know, the, the IOUs, and also will probably bleed into your next question a little bit, you know, um, Stacy, in terms of the letter, um, have been very clear, you know, from the outset of my tenure about uh, day ahead markets and governance. And in our state, we have, we regulate PACOR and Avista and Puget Sound Energy. And PACOR, we know, is into the EDAM. But the other two are waiting uh, and seeing. And the, the constant refrain from them, among others, has been governance. Right, so that's something that I think conferences like this uh, have, have really helped me, right? Because you're sharing ideas and you're hearing. And I'll just tell you, I sat where you're, you're sitting in government affairs for several, you know, almost two decades, basically. And so when you hear these panels, you're picking out things. I know this. Who was I listening to today most closely? John Harrison, 
I'll just tell you, you know, in terms of what he's been saying uh, on governance. And I know that uh, our two IOUs um, are big customers, you know, of, of Bonneville. So I, that's, that's an important, you know, perspective um, for me. So I just wanted to share that, you know, like I said, take information when I find it. And that's an invitation to you. If you think there's something you need to impart me, to me, do it. You know, well, I'll be happy to listen. Thanks. Great. Well, let's get to it then, because I think uh, there's a lot of folks um, uh, curious about your perspectives on the letter uh, that was referenced earlier. I would note uh, for everyone, we did post uh, a new document that commissioners asked us to post on the agenda item itself. So you'll see that um, on the EDAM uh, Forum webpage, and this document was uh, just, I think, created this week to further enhance the information that was in the letter on July 14th from several commissioners. So if we turn to that now, I think that letter that was referenced and that, you know, you all are uh, aware of and some, in some cases very engaged in was really a, a step forward to sort of make a statement about the value of a West-wide uh, collaboration and market as being uh, good for your ratepayers, right? Sort of generally, if that is the case through the studies that have been done, um, that you see that as an important step to consider, as well as the need for this independent governance that we've been talking about throughout the morning uh, as a way to, to continue to evolve this market into something that can really benefit all customers. So really uh, tell us about your, you know, your perspectives. Not all of you signed on to the original letter, but you may or may not be involved in sort of the ongoing discussions and how, um, you know, thoughts, concerns, opportunities you see with that letter. And then I'll, I'll ask another question later about um, what you see as the ne important next step. So first, just perspectives on, on the letter and, um, your views on how to make that um, sort of come to come to life. I'll start. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know you as you've heard today in the beginning of the panel, we do have a lot of differences among the different uh, state regulators. But I think you know in in conversations that we've had as regulators, I think we've realized that we actually have quite a bit in common and. I, that was really, in my view, some, the part of the foundation of the letter, that we are all concerned about ratepayers. We're all concerned about reliability. Gabriel made a point about prudency in the two microphones, or one microphone, and, so, and I think all of us went, yes, of course. You know, we, we really understand that because it's fundamental to what we do. And so in, you know, in realizing that commonality, I, I think that then we, we talk, we've rec we're recognizing the benefit of a large west-wide market, a market with a big footprint, a market where we can share resources, where we can optimize transmission, um, and, uh, and, and the opportunity to uh, build on investments that are ratepayers have already made. And then also, you know, on the flip side, I think, you know, maybe irresponsibility is just too strong a word, but the but the the fear of losing the investments that we've already made and the um, the problem that we might see if there were an abandonment of investments already made in EIM and a an, a path that wasn't as attractive or didn't provide benefits of EIM and potential ben new benefits of EDAM. Um, and, and, you know, obviously governance of the CAISO currently, there's been a lot of discussion about that, including already here um, at this forum. But the idea behind the letter was really, you know, let's talk about a concept that takes the CAISO governance um, uh, problem off the table and just goes straight to this we're going to have independent governance, and let's think about what that needs to look like, what an entity needs to look like, um, how we can build this so that it, there, there's an entity to provide the full range of options for regional cooperation, recognizing that um, we may not ultimately use all of them. Some of us might, some of us might not, but at least we'd have a path to the full range of benefits. And in the meantime, really making sure that we don't lose the opportunities that um, EIM is providing now and that EDAM potentially could provide. There's a lot of technical work to be done behind EDAM. And so I think, you know, you've heard from Pacific Core and Bank um, recognizing that 
just joining, and I think we heard the reference to flip the switch, that it's it's not just that easy. So there is, there is a lot of work, technical work to be done for EDAM. So I don't think that we're losing any time or momentum in talking about this new entity because there is work to be done in parallel. And so I think that, the, you know, the way I look at it is let's, let's try to have it all, right? Let's try to maximize the benefits to our rate payers in that fu future possibility and working on that and harnessing it. And then let's also work really hard on what's in front of us and how to work out the technical aspects of growing cooperation. That's helpful. So I'll, I'll jump in because I spent a year on the governance review committee designing joint governance for EDM uh, with many colleagues in the room, a lot of hours, um, and, and learned an enormous amount um, about sort of interests across the region, constraints, options. Um, and I think we heard the utilities this morning in very different places, depending on uh, their decision-making processes, about how they felt about joint authority and EDAM versus that sight line to independent governance. So we heard a real diversity of perspectives there. And when I see the two boards, we have uh, members from both boards operating together on a single dais, making decisions as a 10 member team, um, I think we have a very balanced, reasonable approach for the day ahead market. That's Letha, that's not the Oregon Commission. Um, I think we found within the constraints and the opportunities a very um, uh, equitable approach forward for the EDAM step. And so I don't think, as a governance review committee member, um, if if you're thinking about EDAM as uh, as the, an incremental step, the governance there is totally appropriate. You've got um, solid voice in what happens. And um, as a regulator, I have a lot of voice in the through the body of state regulators in what happens in EDAM. Uh, I think the challenge is, as we heard this morning, we hear folks articulating a need to see that through line, that pathway to independence, so that they can then evaluate the market on its merits. Um, and when Alice uh, and, and Sivagunda and their colleagues came to us and said, we think we have a way to create that pathway, um, it seemed incumbent on me for my customers to explore that. Right, the benefits of potential benefits of EDAM argue that you need a big footprint. And if they want to have a conversation, it's incumbent on me to engage that conversation um, in good faith and see if we can find that pathway and, and create it so that we can just have, we can get down to the hard work of what's the, the merits of the market, how do we actually make this happen and work. Uh, and so I'm really excited to engage that conversation. I think there's a lot of work in front of us to make sure that stakeholders are widely engaged, that public power has a seat at the table, that the IOUs, that the, that the public interest organizations, the consumer advocates, all are invited into that conversation and that it moves with all urgency, as we also heard. Those are two very competing dynamics. <laughs> we'll see how we navigate them. To that end, we've put out a series of questions to the stakeholder community and are all ears on what you would want to see for a process to explore how to get to that end state, to create that pathway. Um, and so I hope we'll hear from you um, all of the warts and all of the solutions and uh, how you'd like to see a pro uh, process unfold. Uh, but I, I'm excited and really appreciate that our colleagues came to us and said, we want to try something different. Um, it, was, it was a really exciting opportunity, I think, to see if there's more benefit for customers that we could, we could put on the table. Yes, from my perspective, you know, I was, again, I was the brand new guy um, to BOSAR, and I think my first meeting, I really stepped into it and um, promptly got a phone call from Thad right after the meeting uh, out of Utah and had a great conversation. And he said, you know, you're, you're, you said exactly what everybody was thinking, and, um, and I have that habit sometimes of saying things that other people are thinking. Um, but he said, that's why for the past 13 years, we haven't 
moved forward on this. And so it, it was, I could sense the frustration uh, from all the, all the states, all the Western states uh, as a region on not moving the ball. And, and so when um, this opportunity was presented to move the ball, I thought it was a great idea um, because governance has been the holdup apparently for the past 13 plus years. And so if there's a way that we can get over this obstacle or get around this obstacle, um, you know, to continue the discussions of day ahead markets and how we can get there and um, what type of, of uh, governance uh, will satisfy everybody's needs and, and concerns. Um, then we should have that conversation, especially if it's uh, beneficial to our consumers, um, especially if it helps uh, keep the grid reliable, especially if we can take advantage of some of that cheaper hydro out of, of Oregon um, during our ballistic summers and also turn around and provide um, when we're in flip-flops and shorts in January, we can provide our power back to Oregon and California and to the other states. And so I think there's mutual uh, benefits to moving this direction. I know that I've had conversations with our, with our utilities in Arizona. Um, they are also interested in, in, in the day ahead market and getting there. Um, EIM has been um, a, a huge savings for our consumers. Um, you probably heard the, the utilities talk about that a little bit ago. Um, and so this is, you know, taking the real-time market and moving it to a day-ahead market. And if it's, if it's working in EIM, why can't it work uh, in day-ahead? And how can we get there as a region um, and, and, and really uh, confront this, uh, you know, the 500-pound the gorilla in the room of governance? And if we can solve that issue, then let's solve that issue and move on and uh, on, for the benefit of not only our utilities, but the benefit of our consumers as well. And I'll take that conversation a little bit further about uh, a full RTO and a larger footprint. Um, you know, at the prior panel, the they came up that, you know, the, the answer is an RTO, but what is the question? For me, the question is, what is best for consumers? And I think that's what we're talking about, a larger footprint, sharing resources, and uh, a, f a full RTO being able to uh, send those transmission pricing signals so we, that we can figure out how we can build a better grid that is better for consumers. Um, and so, you know, the governance issue aside, I, I think that, you know, we, we shouldn't lose sight of that the state-led market study came up earlier and I, you know, I picture that chart that said like, you know, bilateral markets and then, you know, sort of like checks on the number of benefits, um, imbalanced markets, extended day ahead markets, and then full RTO that ha had all of the checks, right? Right now we're, we're choosing uh, not to get all of the checks, not to get all of the benefits. Um, I understand that Sometimes we need to take incremental steps and maybe that's what we need to continue to do, but we don't want to lose sight of all of those benefits to consumers. And I guess in Nevada, we're analyzing it a little bit differently in that our legislature has said, tell us why there is not a benefit to the RTO. Uh, make a good case with the PUC if that is not the case, otherwise we will assume there is one by 2030. Um, and, and so we sit a little bit different on that, but obviously um, governance is a huge piece of that equation and an independent governance model has to be part of the conversation for a full Westwide RTO. Um, so I think, you know, huge credit to California, to Allison Siva for moving us forward um, and having that conversation um, and, and letting us be at that table as we vet that for Nevada. Um, as, as we continue to talk about that independent governance, um, but that, that's a key that we're looking at in, in looking at the benefits of the RTOs. What is that governance model and what's our seat at that table? So, yeah, just echoing just what everybody um, has said here. In Washington, we don't have an RTO requirement. There's no bill. Well, there's been a bill, but it really didn't, didn't uh, go anywhere. We don't approve directly, at least, the 
IOUs uh, uh, participation in well in the IM or now in which whichever day ahead market uh, they will they will choose. So, um, but you know I'm. I'm all for competition, basically. You know, it would be great to have the Western uh, market be competitive with, with SPP. And that's why when I, you know, engaged, when Alice and Civic came and gave this idea, I really thought, honestly, it was going to be, okay, here we, we're going to hear about Colorado. This bill, this time the bill is really going to make it, you know. Um, it wasn't that at all. It was bold, I think, you know, proposal, sincere as well, and also not an easy one for them, you know, given where their legislature has been. There's some... There's some risk in that, and so I took it really um, to heart. It was an easy call, for me anyway. We, the three commissioners in Washington, all signed that letter independently, and so I, easy call for me to sign it because at least it gave um, EDAM a future looking at a governance that is independent. And without it, you know, it, I don't think you know we would be here now. I understand as well the urgency, right, of moving forward, like we heard um, this morning, and the tension that Letha mentioned between you know getting it right. And moving forward urgently is really is really there, you know. So I think that we're hearing that loudly and clearly. And just you know, from my perspective, uh, the momentum exists now to, to to carry this forward, you know, relatively quickly. So let's talk a little bit about the timing. I know um, uh, Jim Shetler mentioned it should be six to nine or six to twelve months, not five years. I wanted to get your perspectives on the timing. You mentioned urgency and. And Commissioner Aguilera, you mentioned, you know, what are we leaving on the table right now, right? If if we're if we're not making these decisions, so in your mind, with this proposal and the set of questions you've asked stakeholders, um, what's the timing perspective of getting to something that folks can feel is directionally um, moving in the direct, you know, moving in the direction that, that that you're talking about with the concept of the letter? So timing issues there, or your thoughts on. Um, how to get that work done, right? The, the letter sets out some ambitious work between now and I think it was January 2024 to have a, a board stood up. So just more thoughts on, on kind of timing perspective. I guess I can, I can start that one. You know, Arizona is in a little bit of a different boat um, because we can't force our utilities to join an RTO. Um, they have to do it voluntarily. So my job I see as a regulator is trying to identify those barriers and those obstacles and then to work with our utilities to ensure that they're comfortable moving in this direction. And if not an RTO, then what? Um, and so I, you know, I know that other states, Colorado, uh, Nevada, have mandates to, you know, from their legislature to move into a full-scale RTO, um, you know, but I think Arizona is going to be uh, one of those states that we're going to have to wait and see um, how things develop. But at the end of the day, it has to be right for our utilities and right for our consumers for us to move into that into that situation. But with that said, we have amazing transmission between us and California and between us and Nevada and between us and New Mexico. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there's, from a regional perspective, we want to get there, but it's just a matter of how do we get there to make sure that our utilities uh, aren't you know, um, out there floating in the wind on their own, that they're, they're comfortable moving in this direction. Stacey, I think you already kind of said at this January 2024 date that was put out um, to make progress. Um, and I think we all recognize a lot of work has been done on this already. Um, and we want to build on that and not reinvent the wheel. And Leith also mentioned questions that we've posed um, to get input from stakeholders. So I think a lot of this depends on stakeholder input and, and what we hear. Yeah, just to sort of get to brass tacks, I, I think that's what I would really like to hear from stakeholders is, is sort of what is, having participated in the Governance Review Committee, uh, I understand that the fine grain details of your conflict resolution process, <laughs> you know, can take four months to work out all by themselves. Uh, uh, and so, right, that's not gonna get solved uh, by January. I think the question to stakeholders is recognizing the tension between engaging everyone, setting a table where everyone can feel heard and can feel like they own part of the process uh, versus decision-making uh, uh, timelines in individual entities that have said 
and our a pathway to independent governance is important to them, what is credible progress by January 2024? We propose a bit of a scope, a decision about a legal entity, a charter, a mission, a founding board. Uh, that's ambitious. Uh, I'd love to hear, is that sufficient? Is it insufficient? Is it, given how ambitious it is, is, is uh, something else feasible? Those are what I'd really love to hear feedback from stakeholders about in terms of their specific decision-making process. And I, and I take the point of the conversation at the prior panel, it's important to have a bold vision, but also be taking pragmatic, practical steps. And so I think I'm very cautious of engaging in another sort of endless dialogue <laughs> Um, that is so big, it's unsolvable. And so I guess I, I would, part of what I would seek from stakeholders is what are the chunks that are solvable that you would then say, yeah, that's credible. And I got to be a part of that process, so I find it actually very credible. Um, I, th I think that's like very specifically what I would love to hear from stakeholders in the next couple of weeks. We need to get started very quickly. Uh, and but we want everyone who wants to be at that table to be there. So, thanks. I'll just note, and again, it's uh, the the document is posted to the agenda here um, that there are um, September 11th is the date by which you're seeking responses, and there's two emails provided um, to send those responses to. So all that is in that letter. So you, if you're asking. Um, where there's some couple emails uh, to provide you there. So other thoughts. Thanks, Lisa. I, I was just going to throw out. You you also heard in the last panel that there's a lot more to the discussion. Um, you know when you start really delving into because you, you're going to have tariffs, you're going to have GHG rules, you're going to have you know there's a plethora of issues beyond just governance that we're all going to have to work through on you know really how does the power get dispatched and what is the governing agency looking at when they're trying to dispatch that power? Are they only looking at non-carbon based uh, generation or you know, how are those fees and taxes and everything else charged? And that's a lot to try to get through in probably the next four to six months. Um, so I think it's going to take a little bit longer to get there, but I think we've uh, charted a good path forward moving that way. Great. And I'll just add uh, on the EDAM front, we recognize, you know, we're, we filed with FERC last week, as Elliot mentioned, we also have some continuing working groups to tackle things like the GHG issue um, more generally. And so the, you know, the work has not stopped yet on those things, those technical details that Alice mentioned that still need to be um, developed um, on EDAM. And so there's, there's ongoing work uh, across those fronts as well, so. Other thoughts on timing, sense of urgency, or, or, or things that you'd like to see stakeholders respond to um, specifically uh, to that letter? Just, I guess I would just reiterate that the mess, you know, that we're aware of the balance and want to move this forward, you know, um, in a time that, that provides a confidence that this is, you know, something that, that you know, can happen. So between getting you know, everybody sort of on board and and, and moving forward, um, that's very that's in our in our consciousness now. So uh, want to move forward. So we have just a couple minutes left. I want to make sure that if there's anything else, any th other thoughts you have um, for this group. You know, we we are. Uh, as the ISO, we're excited to see EDM move forward, appreciate Bank's commitment today um, to uh, participate in EDAM, and, you know, others are assessing uh, the options there. Anything else uh, for this group that you want to share with regards to sort of how you see the markets evolving and, and relative um, sort of the urgency of these issues? Just to kind of wrap it up. Well, I'll, I'll just say the cost pressure on customers, as has already been discussed, is enormous. Um, we are both uh, trying to mitigate climate change in a big, giant hurry, 
um, which we knew was going to be expensive if we waited, and here we are. And we're trying to cash the check on adaptation at the same time. The cost of, of coping with a changing climate in terms of reliability, resilience is, is uh, pretty, pretty much uncapped. <laughs> and so, you know, the degree to which I think as, as uh, Steve said this morning, the degree to which there's an option that lets us utilize our existing resources more efficiently, that takes, there's, there's one piece of this puzzle that lets us take some cost pressure off. There are other pieces of the puzzle, like the RAP program that let us take some cost pressure off. Um, being able to work those pieces while uh, so much cost pressure is mounting on the other side um, is, is incredibly important. None of us, you know, a, a 2% uh, savings is substantial when you're talking about the, the way uh, bills are increasing for other reasons. And um, it's worth the investment from my perspective to get those benefits to customers in the face of the, the really the burden on, on our most vulnerable customers uh, as, as the cost of climate adaptation and mitigation increases. So I'd just encourage you along in that, in that urgency, uh, get it done and uh, please bring the bill savings home. I'll just add, I, I think it's, you know, related to the discussions we heard um, this morning and kind of building on Letha's comment. We're, we're thinking about and talking about a, um, a future of shared resources and um, efficient grid operations, um, but we're sharing resources now and we have, you know, trading um, uh, 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 at the seams of the CAISO um, and then also through the EIM. Um, and uh, and as Letha said, we're also at the same time facing these um, significant impacts of climate change that are hitting us in ways that are really hard to predict. Um, so our, our models are more difficult, our forecasting is more difficult. Um, but in California, we, we are seeing uh, the extreme heat that other states are experiencing, probably not as significant as uh, Arizona and Nevada, but we're, we're seeing heat that we've never seen before. We're seeing an uh, increase in air conditioning in coastal areas that we haven't had in the past. And so with uh, t um, temperature increases, each year the load is um, uh, exponentially higher because we have additional air, air conditioning in, in addition to the, the ones that that were online last year running, so we have new air conditioning load that's coming on. Um, and uh, and in the face of that, we're we're planning differently, we're forecasting differently, and we have significant procurement orders out. We the PUC currently has a, an eight, eighteen thousand eight hundred megawatt uh, procurement order combination of of uh, several orders out to all of our load summary entities. So they're they're contracting projects are getting built. We have a statewide effort to try to expedite uh, project development, and um, one thing that we've really been focusing on is battery storage. And we're now at it's about 6,000 megawatts of battery storage on the system and seeing Kaiso work to integrate that, um, to use it uh, just when we need it has been really extraordinary. Um, so I wanted to highlight that in terms of, you know, how we're thinking about the future and our future together, that we're also uh, learning from other states and doing our own work to make sure that we're ready for the load that's gonna come in the future. It's yeah, important. All right, any final thoughts? Really appreciate the, the perspectives you bring. It, it's great to have the diverse panel of years of service. Uh, some are new and some are very experienced and just the diversity across the states um, was really interesting to hear all those perspectives and really support um, and thank you for your engagement on these issues. Uh, very important and I appreciate all that. So with that, I think Joanne is gonna bring us to the break and lunch. Well, thank you, Stacy, and this great group of panelists. So let's give uh, this group a round of applause. Thank you. Great discussion. And we will continue the discussion after lunch. So we can go ahead and break now, 12.15 to 1.15. So we'll come back here at 1.15. Those of you virtually will meet you back here at 1.15 as well. Lunch is set up in the lobby area, and the dining room is open for for lunch. So enjoy, and we'll see you back soon. I think we're ready to get started again.
If you, everybody wants to take their seat. All right. If we can kind of get people coming in and grab your seat. I have to admit, I'm a little bit jealous about the room across the hall. Looks like they've got the disco conference going. So I feel like we need to change our music genre here and get the party started. <laughs> Either that or we're going to be losing people to that conference. All right. If I can get people to come on in. Hopefully everybody had a nice lunch. Yeah, can you go round them up, Anna? <laughs> Too much good conversation going on and lots of collaboration, which is good. All right, before I invite our next couple of speakers up, uh, I think we had a really dynamic full morning with the CEO panel and the regulator panel. Um, really great discussion and really great questions from all of you. So I think that really helped promote some really good conversation. So this afternoon, we are going to hear from the Brattle Group. They're gonna be sharing um, their study on the benefits of EDAM participation. And then we're going to switch gears and talk about EDAM and resource adequacy, um, how to achieve maximum benefits through the harmonization of resource adequacy programs and the extended day head market. And then we will end the day with a stakeholder panel, Evolving Markets in the West, and then we'll wrap up with some closing remarks. So without further ado, I would like to in introduce Andy Campbell. Andy is the Executive Director of the Energy Institute at Haas at the University of California, Berkeley. He has served on the governing body since July 1st of last year and was recently appointed Chair of the Western Energy and Balanced Market and Governing Body. So he is going to kick off our next segment. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Joanne. So a, a big driver for day ahead market participation is a view that a regional market can reduce consumer costs relative to the, to the current bilateral market landscape. To get a handle on the scale of these benefits along with the impact on the environment, stakeholders depend on models. A model takes what we know about the present and attempts to forecast what the future might look like. The power market's you know, too complex to model in its entirety, so modelers have to make decisions about what to model, what not to model. They also need to make decisions about what, what to assume, as we heard from Commissioner Atani in the last panel. You know, in this featured presentation, we'll hear about the Brattle EDAM study effort, which was designed by the study participants to inform their decision making. I find the study remarkable in, in several ways that I'll mention now. First, instead of modeling a hypothetical market, the study simulated the approved EDAM market design. So it actually kind of looks at the details of what was agreed upon by the stakeholders involving many people in this room. The study also considers that a transition from today's market to the EDAM market, uh, some of the benefits could be offset by some losses of revenues that, that some market participants receive today. That's accounted for in the model and that's netted against, against the benefits. So additionally, the study examines how the extended day ahead market will impact the EIM market. There are likely to be impacts there. That's, that's taken into account in the study. And you know, finally, I wanted to mention, you know, for those of us who've seen a number of studies over the past several years, some of which have been mentioned, uh, today's presentation does include a helpful comparison slide now in a discussion of how this study differs from some of the other studies. So overall, I, I look at the Brattle study as sort of an early report card um, on the EDAM market design. And our presenter today will, will let us know how he did. So we're gonna hear from John Sukalis. He's a principal at the Brattle Group. Uh, John has broad experience helping clients make decisions in wholesale power markets. 
He's an expert in electric market modeling, analyzing regional market participation, transmission benefit cost analysis, transmission rate design, and the detection of market manipulation. John has provided expert testimony at FERC and in other forums, and you can find more about his biography on the EDAM forum webpage. So now I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for that great introduction. And um, I think that basically covers it. I don't know if I have to say anything else. That, that hit on all the highlights. Um, let me just start by saying thank you for having me here. Uh, there's been countless people at this event that I've spent hours talking to on the phone and have finally met for, in person for the first time. And that's been fantastic and refreshing. So thank you for inviting me. And thank you for having me as part of, the, of your event here. Um, with that, let me go ahead and jump in. So uh, to get started, I think Andy's introduction is a great place to just pick up right there where he left off. You know, the, the scope of this study, I want to start by, by saying there are many studies out there about markets in the WEC, um, and they all serve a, a different purpose. The purpose here, like Andy said, is this was designed by our study participants to help inform their decision making. And that influences the decisions we made and the assumptions we made to, make, to model the WEC and to model the EDAM. We did not model kind of a big hypothetical footprint of everybody in the WEC. We consciously chose to model something smaller, uh, something that could be more reflective of, you know, the initial years of EDAM as more and more members join. Um, and so we'll look at that here. Um, but in addition to that, we also didn't model kind of, you know, a typical RTO or a, a generic design of a wholesale market. We spent last year kind of following the stakeholder process that a lot of you participated in to figure out what would be the best, you know, exactly what's being proposed and how we could best model it. And, you know, I'm not arrogant enough to stand up here and say we got it perfect. Uh, certainly, I, I wouldn't do that while, you know, the KISO staff's in the room. But um, I think we made a good faith attempt to actually model the EDAM design, not, you know, a, a generic wholesale market. And, and that matters because that will impact benefits um, and, and the benefit estimates. In addition to that, you know, you know, we we took a lot of time to model GHG. One of the most important issues in the EDAM, especially the footprint we model, includes California entities and also a, a piece of Washington State, uh, which will be inside of kind of the the GHG region if if uh, those entities in those states join. Uh, we took care to model that again as best we could, understanding the constraints that are laid out in the optimization. We simulated the reference pass case and then use the outcomes of that reference pass to establish limits on the constraints in our final model. So we have that represented. Um, we, we again simulate, we want to make sure we did not ignore the existence of, of EIM. That's another key factor in the kind of the decision-making process for the study participants. All the study participants are part of the EIM today, so they're receiving benefits, uh, part of that four billion everyone talks about. Um, and we didn't want to do a study that, you know, took or captured some of the benefits of EIM and attributed them to EDAM. So we made sure in our base case that we had a simulated version of EIM up and running, that real-time optimization was happening with and without EDAM, because that, that's the kind of reality we face in the initial years of EDAM. And so we wanted to make sure we captured that. Um, we, we modeled, again, to capture the benefits of both day ahead and real-time optimization. We modeled uncertainty in load and, and renewables between those two decision horizons. So our model has a day ahead decision cycle where day ahead unit commitment and dispatch are, are decided based on inputs for, you know, forecasted load and renewable production. And then we have a real-time decision cycle that optimizes across the EIM based on updated view of load and, and renewable production. Um, and then lastly, we, we did our best to try to represent bilateral markets as realistically as we could. This is always a challenge for anyone who's trying to model the WEC. Um, the status quo today, you all trade with each other a lot. There's power marketers, there's third party entities that come in and trade. Uh, to get a real, anything close to a credible estimate of benefits, you have to understand how efficient that bilateral market is today and also how inefficient it is, because that's where EDAM is gonna come in and, and produce benefits by basically taking some of that bilateral trading we see today 
putting it with inside of EDAM and doing it more efficiently, hope, hopefully doing it more efficiently. So those were kind of some of the challenges and some of the specific areas we focused on in, in developing and designing this study in order to create a realistic estimate of benefits. Uh, last thing I wanna highlight here is the study participants are listed there. Um, bank, including you know, uh, SMUD was, was involved in this. Uh, Idaho Power, LADWP, and Pacificor. That, those are our study participants. So they're the folks who funded this study. Uh, they're the reason I'm standing here today. Um, but throughout the process, we did talk a lot with KISO staff. We had calls with KISO staff, especially as we're trying to understand what's going on in the EDAM design. Uh, we had two or three calls with, with folks at KISO. We talked about you know, their transmission system to make sure we, we tried to get that as best we could into the model. Um, so while KISO wasn't a study participant, we did talk to their staff. Um, Want to just stress again, the benefit numbers you see here today are incremental to EIM, right? So because we simulate, a, we simulate a base case and an EDAM case, the base case includes an optimized EIM, an optimized real-time energy imbalance. So the numbers I'll show you here in this presentation about the benefits of EDAM, they are on top of the benefits folks are already receiving, receiving in EIM, right? That's baked into our, ba our base case. Okay, and as you can see, obviously, we, we modeled the, the EIM footprint as it exists today. So everyone who's in the EIM currently, we modeled as part of the EIM in our study. Um, this is a, a visual representation of the, the footprint that we modeled. Um, so what, what's on here, all of the kind of teal circles representing the different balancing areas in the WEC, those are EIM members. And so those folks were represented, or those balancing areas were represented in our model as part of the EIM. The dark blue circles are our study participants. And again, those are the folks that we, in our base case, represented as part of EIM, but doing bilateral trading in the day ahead. And then in our EDAM case, the dark blue circles are the folks that we put in EDAM. So you can see, if you take a minute to look, again, like I talked about, we made a, you know, a a decision with the study participants, you're working with them to actually simulate something that could, could be close to a, you know, what the market footprint looks like on day one in Q1 2026. It doesn't, the benefits that we estimate don't rely on you know, all of WEC joining. Even with this kind of small footprint, as you'll see, we, we produce a pretty healthy estimate of benefits. And then you know, in, by that way, it is conservative. If more folks join, you know, as we've seen in the EIM, benefits tend to increase as, as the footprint grows. Um, a couple nuances I'll point out here. We did model the bank balancing area and the SMUD sub BA split out. The idea there is we wanted to um, be able to calculate, you know, a more precise benefit estimate for SMUD since they were one of the, the participants. Uh, and then the kind of other folks in the bank BA, we, we modeled benefits for them, and then we worked with them to kind of break that out individually for them. Similarly, the Pacific Core West balancing area, we, we broke out and modeled a separate area for the, the Washington portion of the Pacific Core West BA. And the reason we did that is for GHG. So the Pacific Core West BA is gonna be split some of it will be in the GHG region in Washington state, some of it is in Oregon and, and Idaho. Um, which is not, uh, although there are GHG policies in those states, they're not, you know, they don't affect uh, resource dispatch in the same way that the California and Washington policies do. Okay, so the origin of this study um, is actually, as some of you will remember, and a lot of you were involved in, the origin of this study is our 2017 EDAM feasibility study. So that was six years ago now, but um, Brattle, uh, E3, and, and some other folks uh, worked on kind of this big EDAM feasibility study at that time that involved basically everyone who was involved with the EIM at that point. Um, and that served as the starting point for this study. So we kind of took that model off the shelf that we had and did an update and a refresh to it. So now in six years, obviously plans for resource mixes have changed. Everyone adding a lot more renewable energy than, than they were planning for a few years ago. So we updated that, we have put in new load forecasts, new fuel price forecasts. We worked with all of our study participants to get new data on their planned 
uh, transmission expansion, uh, resource mix, operating costs, you know, an updated view of the operating costs of their system. Um, in particular, the most important thing that we worked with uh, to, for on, you know, to get from our study participants was not, you know, a view of how much of their transmission rights exist today in the bilateral market to what neighboring entities, to what trading hubs, to really understand, again, like I talked about, to really get the bilateral market set up properly, we need to understand all the folks that were you know, involved in the study, how many rights do you have to what points in the West so that we can, and, and what's appropriate hurdle rates to put on those transmission rights, because it's not the same for each type of transmission right or each type of trade. So we tried to parse all of that out and model that to get an accurate representation of the bilateral market. And then um, how much of that transmission is going to end up in EDAM, right? And how is it going to be put into the EDAM market? So we worked with all the study participants to try to figure that out. Because uh, at the end of the day, right, how much transmission ends up in the market and under, you know, being able to be optimized by the market engine is going to drive benefits. So that's a really, really critical assumption. Um, and then, of course, like I said, we put it into a model called Power System Optimizer, PSO. Uh, this is a model we license. It's not a model Brattle created. We license it from a company called Analytics, but we think it's, uh, you know, the best kind of production cost model out there. It's a next generation model. Um, does a lot of great things as far as, you know, a lot of options for how you model hydro. There's options on, you know, how you model trading rights and contract path rights, which is very important in the WEC. So it's the model we use for all of these studies, and, and we use it for the 2017 study as well. And then we simulated two cases, base case and EDAM case. The base case, like I said, included the EIM footprint, the change case. No other differences from the base case except we implemented the EDAM design for those dark blue circles, okay? So pretty simple. Then we had two cases, we compared them. How does system operation change? How much do costs fall? Um, and we looked at several different benefit metrics. So I should mention, Part of the reason why, like as Andy mentioned, part of the reason why this study stands apart is we didn't just look at adjusted production cost savings, which is kind of the standard metric used in all these benefits studies. We intentionally looked at congestion revenues that will be collected and distributed under e EDAM. We looked at transfer revenues, but then we looked at the flip side of that. You know, currently as EIM participants, you get congestion revenues and transfer, you know, congestion revenues. How do those change? Uh, in the bilateral market, doing trading, you earn profits, you earn a profit margin by doing that. How much of that is potentially lost if you move to an EIM? Because right, some of that's going to move into the EIM and be part of that market optimization. And some of that bilateral trading will, will be lost. Similarly, some of the wheeling revenues you collect as part of that bilateral trading will be lost too. So we wanted to not just look at production cost benefits, which is kind of the standard thing, but also all of these other kind of out-of-market payments and costs we wanted to make sure we're, we're looking at that too. So you'll see that in a second, but we look at kind of a diverse list of benefit metrics. All right, so then let's just jump right into numbers, benefits. So at the headline here is we had about, for that those dark blue circles, so this is for everybody, but those dark blue circles, we had about $800 million of gross benefits and about $430 million of net benefits. And I'll explain on the next slide what, are, what I mean when I say gross and net, so we'll get to that. But just talking a little bit about what drove those benefits, and we'll get into all of these bullet points in a little bit more detail in the subsequent slides. Um, you know, savings come from trading more. That's not... I don't think should be shocking to anyone. The reason why the EIM produces benefits is it, it creates more trades. So, you know, the bilateral market is very active in the West, but folks joining EDAM and allowing the market engine to optimize that creates more volume of trades, and therefore you get a more efficient solution. And we actually calculate for that footprint, that dark blue circles, about 50 terawatt hours of additional trades occur when you implement the EDAM. Okay, so from that 50 terawatt hours, that's about a 27% increase between of trading happening for EDAM e participants. Uh, every one of our assumed EDAM participants benefits, including the CAISO, so everyone sees a benefit. Uh, you know, that's not always the case in market benefit studies. It is possible that you have winners and losers. Uh, and we've seen that in other work we've done, but that's not the case for EDAM for this footprint. Uh, at least in our simulation, everybody gets a benefit. Again, results are incremental to EIM, and we do see, we'll, we'll look at some charts on this, but we do actually see 
that EDAM reduces trading volumes a little bit in the EIM, which again is intuitive and not necessarily surprising, right? Because you're doing more efficient day ahead scheduling, there's less trading to be done in the real time imbalance side of things. And so we, we see that in our results, right? The volume of trading that happens in EIM reduces a bit, but it's made up for by a lot more trading on the day ahead side. And then the last kind of bold bullet here is, is renewables curtailment. Um, the CEO panel this morning, Stephen asked everyone, what was the one thing you want everyone to take away? Well, if there's one thing you take away from my presentation, two and a half terawatt hours of re reduced curtailments, almost all of that happening in California. So we simulate 2032. So it's uh, you know a few years in, in the future. There's a lot more renewables on the system by 2032 in California and other places too. The reason we see benefits is because the more efficient use of transmission and more efficient day ahead scheduling you get under EDAM means there's about two and a half terawatt hours of mostly solar energy that is no longer curtailed. And so that's free energy for folks who are not in the EDAM, uh, for, sorry, for folks who are not in California but in the EDAM. Uh, and for California, it's an opportunity to make more off system sales. So that's the main driver of the benefits right there. I mean, that in some ways is the whole headline of the story. And then the last thing on this slide I'll say, and we'll talk about this, I'll show you some numbers on emissions and how emissions changed in our simulation. But the, the headline there is that we, we find because of this reduction in curtailments and across the board reduction in emissions because of EIM, or excuse me, EDAM. So within the GHG region, so within California and Washington, we see a reduction outside of the GHG region. So in the other states, we see a reduction. If you look at the whole EIM footprint, we see a reduction. And then if you look WEC wide, we see a reduction. So the, our takeaway from that is that the GHG structure works fairly well. There's a lot of discussion and debate about the GHG structure and, and no one's claiming it's perfect. Uh, but our simulation shows that it works fairly well to avoid resource sh reshuffling, at least on a big enough scale. You know, what we don't see is we don't see emissions in you know, Utah and Idaho increasing while they fall in Washington and California. We don't see that. We see across the board reduction. And so that gives us some, some you know, confidence that the structure is working as intended. So let's look at more detailed numbers. This is getting into the gross versus net that I talked about. So you, the top part of this table in dark blue, uh, that's the gross benefits. And you can see it broken out by a, adjusted production cost savings. So that's fuel cost savings and, and operating cost savings, uh, cheaper purchases, higher sales revenue in the market, all that's captured in the adjusted production cost savings. You see EDAM congestion revenues and EDAM transfer revenues make up a big chunk of the benefits. So those are you know, revenues that will be collected by the market administrator and then given back to the different BA members, either for internal congestion or you know, BA to BA congestion. And then on the bottom, the second part of this table is where we kind of net out all the things that could be lost by joining EDAM. So first on the list is wheeling revenues, like I said, uh, because everyone is agreeing to give our transmission to the market to do day, day ahead scheduling and optimization, uh, and there's less bilateral trading, it means you collect less wheeling revenue. Um, there's the TRR settlement, which we have here as a line item, and it's zero because on a you know, market-wide basis that will zero out. So there is a, a, you know, a TRR settlement process in place to transfer revenue between participants based on how much wheeling revenue is lost relative to others. But on a market-wide basis, that nets out to zero. So we calculated that for the individual members, and I wanted to flag it here so that you all are aware, but from a market-wide perspective, that's you know, uh, a wash. Then we have a reduction in EIM congestion revenues. So everyone who's in EIM today, as you all know, received congestion revenues from the market. Because we see a reduction in the volume of trading that takes place in EIM, we see a reduction in, in congestion revenues too. And so we count for that. And then the last two line items here, which we have labeled as CAISO intertie trading and reduced bilateral trading value, that's the lost day ahead trading that you're doing now in the bilateral market. So today we see a lot of bilateral trading and, and we break it out by you know, trades on the CAISO interties versus all the other trades at the hubs and, and BA to BA trades. 
And we calculate a, a significant reduction in revenue there, right? So if you think about transactions you make today in the, in the bilateral market in the day ahead at, you know, mid C or Malin or, or wherever it might be, if your counterparty to that transaction is in, EI, in EDAM going forward, that's just going to happen in the market, right? That will be an optimi optimization that happens in the market. There's still opportunities to do day ahead trading. So that doesn't mean that this metric goes to zero, right? Because not everyone is joining the day ahead market. So you'll still have counterparties that you'll trade with at the hubs and at other places um, to earn some, you know, day ahead revenue. And actually the creation of EDAM might create new opportunities for that. But on a whole, we, we find that, you know, that type of day ahead bilateral trading goes down with the creation of EDAM, especially for the members of EDAM. And therefore there's some revenue loss as a result of that and profit loss. So we account for that in our simulations. I should flag that that doesn't necessarily mean it's all on the you all as the utilities, right? There are third parties in the WEC today that do some trading as well. So some of that reduction we see in those last two rows might actually be third party power marketers who are doing trading today and those opportunities for those third parties may vanish with the creation of EDAM or, or become reduced, let's say. And so there's going to be some loss for there too. So we have it up here when we're talking about system-wide benefits and potential losses, we put it in there. But for each individual entity, as they're making their decision, they have to contemplate how much of that revenue loss is actually theirs versus some third party that's trading in, in the bilateral market. Okay. So those are the numbers, that's the headline uh, from the study. But now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the why. I think, you know, the headline is great. Uh, and like Stefan said this morning, that's about 10% or a little less than 10% for Pacific Core specifically. And that's consistent across the whole footprint. Um, it's pretty much, you know, it's somewhere around the seven, eight percent for the whole EDAM footprint. And that's consistent with benefit studies we see in, you know, the Eastern RTOs and things like that. Um, I will highlight, you know, everybody here knows from the EIM experience that simulated benefits turned out to be way smaller than realized benefits. And I think that's true here too. And we'll get to that on the last slide, but, um, you know, just wanted to flag from a kind of like relative perspective, how big are we talking about? It's somewhere in that seven to 8% range. Okay. So why do we see benefits? So I want to point, if this pointer works, there we go. So to the kind of right-hand side of this chart, you see a column for base case, and then you see a column for EDAM case. And this is just focusing on, again, the folks we highlighted as, uh, or assumed were in the market, so those dark blue circles. And what we have here, the different colors on the bar show different types of trades that we see in our simulation. So you have dark blue at the bottom, which is block trading at the hubs. You have the teal, which is Kaiso intertie trades. You have the lighter, you know, blue, which is trades for on existing transmission contracts, the gray, which is, you know, every other kind of bilateral trade we model, which includes hourly BA to BA trades, et cetera. And then you have the green, which is EIM trades. So you can see in the base case, those are the trades we see in our model. Some of them are day ahead, and then the, the real time is EIM. Um, and then in the EDAM case, so the case where we implement the market, you see this new yellow block emerged. That's all the trades that happen in the EDAM market. And what, what I, why I like this chart is it shows the dynamics I was talking about. So you see that the dark blue is more or less the same, but the Kaiso inner tie trades get a lot less. So there's fewer trades, stay ahead trades on the Kaiso inner ties. There's fewer trades over existing transmission contracts as some of those trades are now going to be made in the EDAM, right? They're going to become EDAM market transactions. And it's a little hard to see on the chart, but even the green goes down a little bit. So even EIM gets a little bit smaller as we move to our EDAM case. But of course, that's all made up for by the emergence of this new trade type, you know, trades in the EDAM. And in total, when you add it all up, it's about a 27% increase in total trade volumes between the EDAM members, right? So we're just thinking about those dark blue circles. If you think about the whole WEC, it's, it's kind of a similar story, but of course, when you step back and look WEC wide, the impact is smaller from a percentage perspective. It's about a 12% increase. So the whole WEC you know, experiences more trading, but of course, more concentrated on folks who are gonna be in the EDAM market. Okay, and that ties back to the number I cited before about 50 terawatt hours of, of new trading. That's the 27% increase. So not surprising, this is the intuitive story we always hear about markets, right? 
Markets mean more trading, more efficient trades, creates efficiencies on the system. And we see that in our simulation. So what kind of trading is happening and where is it going is the next question. So I've tried to make a little map here to help illustrate some of that. Uh, bear with me if the arrows are a little bit too much, but we'll try to walk through it. So we've actually, we see kind of two broad patterns in the market that generates additional trading and additional benefits, you know, generates the benefits. We talked about uncurtailed solar. So a lot of it, you know, in the midday hours, especially during the summer months, but more or less across the entire year, in the midday hours, we see power coming out of California into Pacific Core East. And now, uh, you know, that looks like there, it's flying over Nevada, but there are transmission rights there, right? There's transmission rights to Intermountain. And so those rights go into EDAM. And so the market can send power from California into the Pacific Core East BA. We see that happening in the, in the midday hours. And then we see, you know, uh, kind of a loop where that same excess solar power is, is going through Idaho into the Pacific Core West BA. At the same time, we see the, the rights that California entities have going north into uh, Oregon being utilized by the market, again, to help create that um, reduction in curtailments and send that power in midday hours into the Pacific Core West BA. In the overnight hours, it's less of a distinct pattern, but we do see you know, a concentration of some efficient gas generation in Pacific Core East. So actually, Pacific Core East BA sees gas generation tick up in the EDAM. Okay, overall, their emissions go down, Pacific Core's emissions go down, because they're getting, in the midday hours, they're getting this excess solar. But overnight, we do actually see more gas happening in the Pacific Core East BA. And that efficient gas is being moved through Idaho into Pacific Core West and also into California. So again, that the flows are in both directions. And we heard that this morning, right? The traditional story we all grew up with in the West was California was an energy importer. It's not true anymore. It's already not true in 2023 in the midday hours. Uh, and it gets more true or more not true, I should say, in, by the time we get to 2032, right? The year we simulated. So you see this kind of circular flow of, of solar out of California in the middle of the day and then overnight efficient gas, you know, in the eastern part of the EDAM footprint flowing back west. So that's the trading pattern we see that creates that additional volume of trading we talked about on the last slide and creates the benefits. And again, the efficient use of gas overnight, it's because it's overnight hours, it's displacing less efficient gas in, in California or Pacific Core West. And so there is an emission benefit to that. Not only is there a cost benefit because it's cheaper, but there is an emissions benefit for that too, right? If you turn off a less efficient gas unit uh, or ramp it down and utilize something that's more efficient, you get an emissions reduction. So all of this actually, it's not just the uncurtailed solar, but the use of efficient gas, all of that drives emissions reductions. Okay. Generation change, just quickly, I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. We've got about 25 minutes left. So let me quickly talk about the change in generation. So this, these charts are EDAM case minus base case. And we have day ahead and real time. So you can see basically everything that's above the zero axis are resource types that increase production because of the implementation of the EDAM market. Everything below the axis are things that decrease production. And what's interesting is you see even in the day ahead, um, schedules on coal units, which is this gray uh, bar, actually increase uh, in the day ahead. But then by the time you get to real time and we're talking about dispatch, that disappears. So actually from a disp, when we actually get to real time, what actually gets generated, uh, coal units basically don't move. And largely that's because there's just not a lot of them left by 2032 in the, in the EDAM footprint we simulated. So again, this is only focusing on those dark blue circles. There's not a ton of coal units left and they basically run what they run. They don't change with the implementation of EDAM, but you do see this drop in gas, which is the green bar. And that's, you know, comes from an increase in solar production. So that's the uncurtailed solar I talked about and a little bit of wind here. That's what this pink is, wind and off, offshore wind. Um, so that's kind of the story. And that's, that's the two and a half terawatt hours. If you add up the, the yellow and the two pink bars, you get to almost two and a half terawatt hours. That's the uncurtailed renewables I mentioned at the beginning. And again, because gas is dropping, you can see why we get an emissions reduction in real time. 
the interesting thing about it though is um, the part above the zero axis is larger than the part below. So the drop in gas generation is not as big as the increase in non-emitting resources we see. So where is this excess power going? What this means is that the EDAM footprint is, you know, because of the creation of EDAM actually is pushing more power out of those dark blue circles to other parts of the WEC. And that's exactly why we see an emissions reduction even if we look at the rest of the EIM. And if we look at the rest of the WEC, you see a small emissions reduction in those areas too because they're getting some of the benefit of the EDAM. Even if they're not participating, because we can uncurtail all the solar, some of it's going to end up getting pushed into other parts of the WEC. Um, and that's, you see that here with the differences, you know, above and below the line. Um, I got this question several times when we've been presenting this to commissioners around the, the West for, with Pacific Corps. Um, everybody asks, they see this two and a half terawatt hour reduction or, you know, in curtailments. And they say, well, is that it? Is there more? I mean, part of the question of can we get more benefits out of this as more people join is going to tie to whether or not there's more renewables to uncurtail. Uh, and the answer is, yeah, there's a lot. Not surprisingly, uh, if there's two and a half terawatt hours that we find in our model, in our EDAM case, so in the case where we have the EDAM market, there's an additional 20 terawatt hours of curtailed solar just in California. So that tells me there's potential for more benefits as more entities join, particularly entities that have transmission rights in and out of California. If we get those into the market, we're going to see well, you know, my guess is we would see an even more of a reduction in curtailments. We would see even more zero cost energy displacing thermal in the EDAM footprint, and we would see our benefits go up. So there's a lot more potential here. Um, there's kind of this huge untapped amount of energy that's just being lost because it's bottled up in California. And, and EDAM helps with the footprint we simulated, but I think you would see even more if you got more entities to join. So emissions, um, this chart at the bottom here, you know, gives you the data on what I've been talking about throughout all of this. So we have it broken out. The first three columns are inside of the EDAM footprint. So again, those dark blue circles. Uh, but we have it broken out by inside the GHG region. So this is, you know, the, the California EDAM entities and that piece of Pacific Core West that's in Washington State. You see their emissions fall. Then the non-GHG EDAM footprint, so this is basically the rest of Pacific Core West, Idaho Power, and um, Pacific Core East. You see a small reduction even in their emissions. So this is even though we, we see gas tick up in that part of the footprint to displace less efficient gas, it's offset by the fact that during midday hours we can turn down our thermal resources and, and buy solar in the market. So you see emissions reductions across both parts of the EDAM footprint, whether you're in a GHG state or not, we see a reduction. And then over here, we see the rest of the WEC that I was talking about. So the total EIM footprint, so everyone in the EIM, so that's the dark blue circles and the teal circles on that map, see a reduction in emissions, and total WEC sees a small reduction in emissions. So again, just even for folks who aren't participating in the EDAM, they see a little bit of emissions reduction because some of that uncurtailed renewable ends up in their footprint. Okay. Uh, this is the slide Andy was talking about. So I, I think the real point we wanted to point out here is not, you know, really to draw much comparison be between the different studies. Like I said, they all serve different purposes and some of them study different things like the state-led study that Commissioner Tawney talked about. That study is an RTO market, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's not really an apples to apples. But what we wanted to point out here is the different benefit metrics that are out there. I think it is really important if, for people when you're reading one study and then you put it down and you pick up another study, make sure you're thinking apples to apples, right? Don't, don't get confused by the different benefit metrics. And some of them are appropriate in some studies, and some of them are appropriate in others. I'm not trying to make the claim that we did this right and everybody else did it wrong. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is our study. We looked at all these different metrics because, again, we, we simulated and studied the specified EDAM design. So we looked at, you know, congestion revenues in EDAM and transfer revenues. We looked at the loss of wheeling revenues. We, we looked at all these other things 
because we wanted to get something that was going to be informative for the decision-making process. That was the objective of our study. And, we want, and to do that, you have to think about pluses and minuses from joining a market and not just efficiency gains, but everything else you get and potentially lose by, by joining the market. And I'll say, even this list, you know, all the different colored benefits we have here in this bar for the Brattle study, both below that are negative and both and above that are positive, even that's not an exhaustive list. Um, I was just talking with this at lunch with folks. To join the EDAM, there are administrative costs, right? We, we heard this morning, it's not about flipping a switch. You're gonna have to hire staff. You're gonna have to install software. There's some implementation cost, you know, that's a one-time thing, and then there's ongoing costs to be part of the market. We don't capture any of those kind of administrative costs here. So the, the study participants, when we gave them their kind of individual benefits, then they took those and went back and said, okay, well, if we add how much we're estimating to actually implement this thing, do we still see a benefit? Um, so we, we did a bunch of metrics here, but uh, it's not exhaustive. Uh, okay. And then last slide, you know, we always talk about this, and, and this comes up again every time we present this. Someone mentions, you know, well, e EIM benefits ended up being X times bigger, you know, four times or whatever than simulated benefits. And I think that's probably the case here too, and there are reasons for that. It's because a simulation is never going to capture the kind of you know, freak events that we hear about. We heard Stefan this morning mention that, you know, in, e in EIM there was a five minute interval when they were exporting, they lost a coal plant and it flipped like that and they imported. That's not something we capture in the simulations, quite frankly. You know, we, we on purpose, you know, estimate, you know, use normalized load, normalized conditions on the system to create a conservative estimate of benefits. Similarly, we don't model transmission outages. We model planned outages on generation resources, but we don't model surprise outages. And anyone who's been living in EIM knows that when you have one of those surprise outages, that's when the market is the most valuable. So intentionally, the, the, the study is set up with you know, normalized load and fuel prices. We don't have radical deviations in gas prices. It's, it's you know, a, a monthly price as opposed to daily variation that you see that can be really large. Um, and all of those things lead us to get kind of a conservative benefit estimate. Um, I'd also say, you know, just simulating the base case, which means this, the day ahead market and the bilateral market as it exists today is very challenging. For anyone who does production cost modeling, you'll know that these models aren't built to simulate, you know, bilateral transactions. So we actually have to build in inefficiencies to kind of create a bilateral market and build in hurdle rates and limit transmission flows and all these types of things. And, you know, we can be very, you know, punitive in that and create a really restrictive market. But the idea is to try to come up with something reasonable and we do our best, but we still think it's, it's more efficient than reality. So we still think our base case is a more efficient representation of, of you know, the status quo than we actually have in reality. Because again, all of the kind of inefficiencies in transmission scheduling, people who aren't using rights, all that kind of stuff, we can capture it to some degree, but we can't capture it perfectly. So we still think we're getting a more efficient base case to compare to our EDAM case, and therefore the benefits are smaller. Um, lastly, we don't, whoops, excuse me, go back. Lastly, we don't calculate any capacity benefits. So, and let me be clear, EDAM is not going to create capacity benefits like RAP will, but it, EDAM does reduce your need to hold imbalance reserves, right? Part of the benefit of EDAM, which we incorporate here in our EDAM case, is pooling of the load diversity, which lowers everyone's imbalance reserve requirement. And that over time, it's not immediate. So again, it's not necessarily a benefit you'll see by 2032, but over time, you'll be able to build a little bit less if you need to hold fewer operating reserves. And that we don't touch that benefit at all. We don't look at the capacity or, or what I like to think of as investment benefits. Our next panel, we'll talk about RAP. That, that creates even more investment benefits. We don't look at all that. We're just focused on the operational benefits. So there are some benefit metrics that you would start to see in EDAM over time that we haven't calculated. And then the last point, of course, we talked about is we simulated a fairly limited EDAM footprint, right? We, you know, we simulated basically, you know, four members, three of which have said they're already, you know, in, or at least part of bank is in, but we didn't put the whole WEC, you know? More folks show up, you get more transmission, you get more, 
you know, dispatchable generation that can ramp down in the midday hours and uncurtail solar, like I said before, you get more benefits. So I think that's, you know, the big part here is, is we tried to intentionally, again, the idea was to inform decisions that have to be made in the next several months. It's not really an effective tool to simulate 2040 with everyone in the WEC in, in the market to make a decision, you know, in 2024. So that was kind of the approach here. Okay, that's, that's all I have for presentation wise. We've got about 15 minutes left, so that's good timing. Uh, there is a lot more in the slide deck, so you'll see, um, Joanne told me that they're gonna post it online. There's more slides in the back here, which contains a lot more information, details. If you like those kind of gory details, take a look. I'm always happy to talk. I'm not a hard person to find, and I'd be happy to chat with any of you about the study, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'll leave it there and, and we can open up for questions. Great, thank you, John. Great presentation, good information. All right, so in the room, we've got some questions. We'll go ahead and start with you, Scott. Um, thank you, uh, Scott Miller, Western Power Trading Forum, and appreciate it. It's a great, uh, great study, and I understand how the conservative approach that you utilize in this um, and the limited footprint. Um, nevertheless, even in this conservative approach, the benefits are uh, fairly large. Um, I take it, first of all, you didn't uh, go ahead and sort of compare the the, uh, the benefits of that versus a uh, fully utilized um, RTO, because that wasn't what you were asked. But, and I'm now going to ask you to uh, to posit an opinion. <laughs> wouldn't it, can't given do it. Can't the, do it. <laughs> all right, well, no, next sorry, question. Go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I actually was just doing it at lunch, so I'm happy to do it again now. Um, okay, so recognizing that caveat, would the, the with these benefits, wouldn't you imagine that this would either A, um, move people to decide, like when MISO was being formed, yeah, you know what, let's just go to a full RTO um, and, and, and sort of do away with this sort of the, the, B, the you know, the ode approach or B, the footprint would more rapidly expand because these are fairly significant benefits. Yeah, I'll start with the second one. I, I think that's more likely to happen. And, and the reason I say that is that was our experience with EIM, as all of you know. As soon as the market got set up, people saw benefits, we quickly found more people joining. And I, so I think, you know, EDAM would, would demonstrate the same type of benefits and, and the same type of potential for expansion. The RTO question, we were just talking about this at lunch, and I'll say um, this, the folks who did the state-led study, uh, Kaiso had them do a kind of an EDAM version of that. Because uh, the state-led study, like I said, studied a full RTO, and then Kaiso came in and asked them to do a similar study, but now just with the EDAM market design. And they found that it was about 80% of the benefits were captured by EDAM. So I'm going to not pause an opinion, but I'll use what they found and say that sounds about right to me. Um, you get additional benefits from going to an RTO. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Consolidated balancing authority creates, you know, operational benefits, but there's lots of considerations there. And I understand every utility has regulatory and legislative mandates and, you know, that might outweigh some of those incremental, that extra 20% of benefits. That's the decision every utility and every par potential participant has to make based on, you know, what's best for their customers. Um, but I think that that study that, that the folks who did the state-led study did, the follow-up for Kaiso, I, I think that sounds about right. I think you get about 80% of the operational benefits from EDAM because the SCED is the same, right? And the, the security constraint unit commitment and dispatch, it's not gonna change if you go to an RTO. That's still, that what we have in EDAM is basically gonna be the same thing you have in an RTO. You just get a little bit more of a consolidated operations. Um, but actually, you know, I'm sure the folks at Kaiso can actually opine better than I can on that, so. Mark. Uh, thank you, Steve Greenleaf, Brookfield Renewable. Uh, very interesting study. Look forward to kind of diving in deeper into the slides. Quick question on, and I think you acknowledge on the transmission transmission utilization. You didn't necessarily account for, for example, under the EDAM construct, third-party rights holders utilizing 
i.e. self-scheduling those transmission rights, not making them available to the market. That's one question, but, and then specifically on the benefit side, on the transfer and congestion revenues, mm -hmm. are, are you assuming in the study that all those revenues accrue to the EDAM entity as opposed to flowing down potentially, I think, under the EDAM construct, the third party rights holders who, who do turn over that transfer? Yeah. So that's a great clarification. I didn't really get into that, but if there are third party rights holders, we carve that out. So we do carve that out, but that doesn't mean that third parties don't buy transmission service outside of that from the utilities that are in EDAM. That's what I was talking about. But if there's a long-term transmission contract on, I don't know, Pacific Core system, just to pick an example, and you know, there's a long-term contract that a third party has, we take that out and we, that's what we worked with all of our study participants to figure out. We didn't just look at the TTCs and say, oh, it's a thousand megawatts. We said of that thousand megawatts, how much is actually gonna end up in the market? And if 200 of it is a third party and we don't know if they're gonna join the market, we carved it out and we made it 800. So we did account for that. Um, and so because we did it that way, this answer to your second question, all of the congestion and transfer revenues go back to the members because we carved out third parties. But like I said, there's still short-term purchases, third parties in bilateral trading today still make short-term purchases of transmission service to execute trades. And that's the part we can't really disentangle because we don't, short-term transactions, we don't have data on what those are going to look like in 2032. So that's the part that's still kind of jumbled in there. All Great right. question. Great. Jeff? We're on. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Nelson, Southern California Edison. Uh, John, thank you. Great study. I was wondering, could you flip the slide back to, uh, it's a map that shows where the power is outflowing from California and sort of circulating around Pacific Core. You know the one I have in my mind. Yeah. This yeah, way. this one. You went, went back one. Yeah. So it, it looks like uh, California's sort of excess solar is uh, going pretty much into the Pacific Core region. And What's stunning or shocking to me, I would like you to comment, it seems to imply that if, for example, Nevada or Arizona did not join EDAM, that they would lose access to this or, or reduced access or much have more more expensive access to California solar. It seems like they're left out if they don't join. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think I'll go back to what I say on a couple slides here. I, I... I think it's pretty clear there's there's potential here for folks who have transmission rights that interconnect with California to access that solar, um, and then and like Commissioner Thompson was saying, you know, share that their power in overnight hours or send it to the Pacific Northwest, whatever the case might be. It's, it's it all goes back to that diversity of resources. So, you know, transmission interconnection is key. So, you know, if we would have to look at exactly how many rights those folks have into California, but I think that's that's the right narrative, right? Is there's a still a, a lot of bottled up energy by the time you get into the 2030s with the pace of, of you know, the clean energy transition in, in California, you got a lot of bottled up resources. So if you've got rights into California, the, there's potential there for sure. Could you go back to the picture one more time? Sure. So did you guys do any quantification of, of how much would harm uh, those, those entities? So yeah, so it's not really a question. We didn't, we didn't calculate benefits for anybody who's not in dark blue on not this map, blue. right? That was outside of the scope of the study. I don't know that it, I wouldn't jump necessarily to say it, it hurts them because like, like we talked about, uncurtailing solar in California kind of helps everyone, even if you're not in the market, because you might be able to, to mm -hmm. buy some of that or push off some of your thermal. So I don't necessarily think, again, I, you know, we didn't calculate it, but I don't know that it, it necessarily implies there's a cost for entities of staying out, but they're certainly missing out on the benefit, let's say that, yeah, so. A negative cost. Okay. Right, Thank and you. again, I, we didn't calculate that, so I don't, I don't know. Um, and I wouldn't even attempt to calculate it unless we could work with those specific entities to understand their systems. I mean, I think that's the whole point of this study is, like I said, we, we worked with our study participants to understand exactly how their system functions and the transmission rights they have, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even go ahead and calculate it. And if I did, I don't think it would be credible unless I could actually work with those entities and understand it. So I hope right. that answer satisfied everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks for the question. Okay, one more over here. And then we'll check in with the online virtual attendees. Hello, this is John Harvey. I'm a commissioner with the Utah Commission. So in Pacific Core East area. 
Um, just it's just a technical question that I probably should know, <laughs> but I don't. Um, the congestion revenues, um, you're listing those as positive benefits, uh, but they're paid by someone, presumably someone in the market. Why why don't those zero out like those TRR revenues? Yeah, good question. So that's that's congestion inside of the BA. So it is true that right if the the price at a generator node. Let's take Pacific Core East BA as an example. If the price of the generator node is higher than the price load would pay, then you would get some, then Pacific Core would collect that for their output at that generator node. But generally it's the other way around, right? Load tends to, nodes, te, where their load is located on the system tends to have higher congestion. And so those tend to be positive. Uh, and the way the market is set up is that basically, so if you're a load, if you're, you pay at, at your load bus, if that's higher than what generators get paid in the same BA, on aggregate, all the loads and all the buses and all the generators, that's excess revenue that the market collects because the load pays and the generators get paid. If there's a positive delta there, that's that's where the congestion revenues come from. And they tend to be positive and in, in our study they are. But you're right, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be. They can be negative, um, but they tend to be positive and, and we saw that in our simulation. Does that answer your question? Well, sort of, but but that load is still paying it. So is right. is is the study just looking at benefits at the uh, the utility level, or is it look, including what's happening to ratepayers? No, no. So those congestion revenues, it's a good question. So those congestion revenues would flow back in that example to Pacific Core, and just like e EIM congestion revenues do, and my understanding is every utility has a, you know, a regulatory construct already set up for EDAM re revenues such that those flow back to customers. Like the CEO panel talked about this morning, that's another market revenue that ends up going back to customers. So it gets offset on, you know, so whatever load pays is built into our production cost metric. So if we look at the different metrics here, any change in load cost would be captured here, as well as any change in generator payments. But any excess, that delta, doesn't get captured by adjusted production costs. That's, that's the kind of hang up here is that adjusted production cost metric captures what load pays, it captures what generators get pays, and it sees how that changes between the two cases, but it doesn't capture any delta between those two. And that's where the congestion revenues come in. And so those would go back to the, the utilities, uh, and then all these utilities would pass those back to customers, just the way that they do with EIM congestion revenues today. Yeah. All right, I think that's all we have time for. Thanks for the great questions, and thank you, John, for a great presentation. Let's give John a big round of applause. All right, 2.4 terawatt hours. That was my takeaway. Thank you, John. Okay, so uh, in this next segment, we're gonna talk about the extended day ahead market and resource adequacy programs. And so I am pleased to introduce Governor Jan Shorey, who's going to introduce this next segment. So Jan Shorey was appointed to the ISO Board of Governors in February, 2021. She has a very impressive record of executive leadership in the electric utility industry, particularly in the areas of public policy, operations, and reliability expertise. She was the general manager and CEO of SMUD for more than 14 years. So given that fabulous background, I can't think of anyone better to introduce this next topic. So thank you, John, or Jan, sorry. So I don't know if anybody at lunch made the same mistake that I did. I love mozzarella salads, but I didn't have my glasses on, and I thought I was eating a couple of giant pieces of artichoke, and instead they were jalapenos. Did anybody else do that? I am on fire, so I will get through this presentation, but man. I, uh, I also want to take just a minute and give a quick shout out to my compatriot, Joe Etto. Joe, stick your hand up in the air. Joe is also here from the Cal ISO board. Thank you for coming, Joe. So this panel, I think they set the stage for it this morning very well on the CEO discussion. As supply and demand patterns change, it's clear 
that strong resource adequacy and ultimately sufficiency are critical foundations for both reliability and market confidence. It's also critical that resource adequacy programs are compatible and ultimately interoperable with market functions and vice versa. One of the key goals of EDAM going forward is to support all resource adequacy programs seamlessly. On this next panel, EDAM and resource adequacy, we will start the panel conversation with leaders of the two largest resource adequacy programs we have. Sarah Edmonds, who is the president and CEO of the Western Power Pool, and Pete Scala, the director of electricity supply planning and costs at the California Public Utilities Commission. Sarah is a lawyer by training and honed her transmission skills at both Pacific Core and Portland before assuming her new CEO position in 2022. Hopefully she will be educating us on all things RAP. Pete has been at the PUC since 2001 and I was told has been quote, involved forever in working on these issues and therefore is worthy of us listening to. He knows whereof he speaks. After they provide an overview and background of their respective programs, Mike Wilding, who's the Vice President of Energy Supply Management at Pacificor, will provide a participating entity's insight on the topic of interoperability between EDAM and resource adequacy. And I'm very pleased to introduce Mark Rothleder, who is the se uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the California ISO, who will moderate the panel. So thank you all, and if you'd come up on the stage. A seventh ending stretch here a little bit because we have no break between the last panel. Everybody just get up and just wiggle a little bit. Come on. All right. I knew you needed it. Um, so we're going to spend an hour talking about resource adequacy, um, integration into the market, EDAM, and kind of the question about interoperability. Um, to me, I've I've been with the ISO 26 years, so I've lived through a lot. Um, I think one of the things I learned was the importance of resource adequacy. Um, and it really is an important feed in to a reliable, secure, and efficient marketplace. Um, as we think about the objectives of resource adequacy, it, it in of itself does not bring new capacity onto the system. Uh, you need other things like uh, solid integrated resource planning to make sure the right resources are um, brought in and developed, integrated with the right transmission, and then resource adequacy kind of secures it so that those resources are now usable and committed to meeting a level of uh, reliability. It's then the marketplace's job to secure and ensure that those resources are efficiently optimized for the reliability benefit and the economic benefit of all who are participating in that market. The way we've designed resource adequacy over the years has been kind of incremental. Um, I think I, I have to hand it to the RAP program to look more broadly and regionally into unlocking those benefits of the uh, of the diversity of load. Um, but nonetheless, it's important that those the reliability and economic benefits of resource adequacy are balanced with discretion and giving discretion to utilities or regulators about how that mix of resources is met to meet that reliability. So we'll start today uh, with Sarah we'll get a update and a summary of where the rest and resource adequacy program is. Um, and then we'll go to Pete and he can provide us an update on the CPUC 
or the California program in terms of resource adequacy and some of the developments there. And then we'll get into a little bit of question and answer back and forth. And then in the second part, we'll talk about the interoperability discussion as it relates to EDAM, and that's where Mike will come into the discussion. So, Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Great to be here with all of you today. Uh, lots been going on in the Western Resource Adequacy RAP space. So really glad to be here to provide that update. Just as a quick reminder, RAP is the industry's answer from about five years ago to what we saw as a looming capacity deficit facing the West and a recognition that we are stronger when we collaborate and operate together. And so this group of SEED utilities five years ago started to put together an effort to create a new program, first of its kind, a standalone resource adequacy program leveraging potentially significant regional diversity. At this point, I would describe our footprint as pretty much west-wide, obviously not California's RA program, and parts of the deep desert southwest and the Rockies are not yet in our program, but things are changing quickly on all fronts. So we do bring to bear quite a big regional muscle when it comes to diversity of loads, resources, and transmission for deliverability. This is not a terrible new set of invented wheels. Uh, it's pretty standard in the sense that it is a forward-looking resource planning compliance program that also has an operational component. That's probably where it stands out in terms of its uniqueness. But essentially, seven months ahead of winter, as we've defined it, seven months ahead of summer, as we've defined it, the peak seasons for our part of the Western footprint, we have a standard forward showing process, load service entities across the West who are voluntarily participating in this program subject themselves to this forward showing compliance requirement. Hopefully they meet it. If they don't, there are some extremely significant penalties that are essentially designed to make sure that you comply and do not lean on or rely on the program to serve your load. Coupled with that, a recognition five years ago that we did not know what the market future for the West was gonna look like. We could make some guesses, we could hope for RTO, we could hope for a range of outcomes, but I think the consensus was resource adequacy cannot wait. We must build this program using the frameworks that we have today that we know work. And I would say that standing here five years later, it made sense because a likely future for the West, whether you love it or you have issues with it, is at least for some parts of the West, a multiple markets future. So not one unifying market spread across the entire footprint, at least for a number of years. And as far as that's the case, RAP is basically designed to get this capacity pool together. It's essentially a pool. This is the bread and butter of what the Western Power Pool has done for many, many decades. But in this case, it's a resource adequacy capacity pool. We form it. It's an insurance policy for the worst of days. Participants, it's, there's a benefit to membership. If you are in the club, you have priority access to this increasingly more scarce pool of capacity reserves. And so when you need it, it's there for you, but how we get it to you is not through a market optimization. Again, realizing that we had to work with what we had in front of us in a non-contiguous market future, we rely on firm or conditional firm transmission to play the foundation of our planning assumptions to potentially deliver that lower planning reserve margin that gets us to those capacity savings, those diversity savings that were mentioned earlier today. We assume that we can get our loads to our resources. That's how we plan as one big footprint, or in our case, we do have two sub-regions because of a transmission constraint between Pacific Northwest and Desert Southwest, but nonetheless still leveraging that significant amount of diversity because of the, those foundational assumptions we make. Real quick, where we're at with RAP, as of February this year, we have a FERC-approved tariff. So we're ready to go but we do have quite a bit of an on-ramp for participants because the recognition was to get these folks into this program and subject them potentially very significant compliance penalties, we had to provide some years to shape into this program. And so under the tariff, entities can choose between 2025 and 2028 
to enter this program. Certainly, Sarah Edmonds' opinion is that's far too late for the issues facing us. And so my job is to urge as quick as I can participation in these regions. But some entities have more to go than others. And so this is a difficult thing, and it is something we're doing voluntarily. So this is the compromise that we made, and this is what FERC approved. So. We are hopeful that summer of 2026, at least for the desert Southwest, could be our first binding season where everything is on. Um, we hope the same for the Pacific Northwest, but there are a few more moving parts there, and I'm happy to answer questions if you're curious. Um, we're obviously working very closely with California ISO and Southwest Power Pool on emerging market proposals, filed tariffs, what we have to do to make sure that the wrap value proposition is maintained. And that really is in two parts. The basic assumption that the collective loads can be served by our resources in the footprint, and also that we'll be able to tap into that capacity pool to deliver that insurance policy when we need it. That's my update. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, Pete, you wanna give us uh, your perspective on the current state and summary of the California program? Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so Mark asked me to provide a high-level overview of the California PUC's uh, RA program, recent changes, and any that are on the horizon. Uh, he asked me to keep it under 10 minutes, too, so I will jump right in. Um, I also, though, opted into some of those hot peppers at lunch. I don't know if this is going to get me through this, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so for a sense of scale, uh, the RA program requirement for this month is approximately 49,000 megawatts. Uh, this is the PUC program for the jurisdictional retail providers. Uh, that's about 38 uh, and counting. Uh, that's double since the program, over double since the program's inception. Um, and those numbers don't include the about 30 federal, state, and municipal entities operating in CAISO's balancing area that are not subject to PUC jurisdiction. So everything I'm speaking about today only, only applies to the PUC jurisdictionals. Uh, the, um, the program requires all, all of those entities to have under contract resources that meet their share of peak load based on the California Energy Commission's one and two demand forecast plus a planning reserve margin that is intended to achieve a one in 10 loss of load expectation. So up until uh, 2020, our modeling had consistently shown that the CAISO uh, resource mix uh, achieved that one in 10 or lower LOLE using a 15% reserve margin. However, our resource mix has changed, weather patterns have changed, and uh, as our more, more recent uh, modeling suggests that this is no longer the case. Uh, so before I get into explaining what we're going to do about this new assessment within the RA program, though, uh, it's important to note that it's primarily a one-year forward requirement that, um, and, and, and as such, it does not, you know, while some providers certainly sign multi-year contracts uh, to meet their RA obligations, the program is not viewed as the vehicle that gets new steel in the ground. The Commission's integrated resource planning proceeding is that forward-looking process that determines the amount of new resources needed to achieve a 1 in 10 LOLE in time for them to be brought online. So identify, ideally really five or more years out in the future. And then the Commission orders retail providers to procure their share of those new resources. Over the past several years, the IRP proceeding has ordered PUC jurisdictional retail providers to procure nearly 19,000 megawatts of new net qualifying capacity through 2028. So back to RA, uh, the Commission has taken a stepwise approach to increasing the RA program's PRM in recognition of the fact that it will take some time to bring these new resources online. Uh, the Commission increased to, uh, the PRM to 16% for this year and uh, just uh, voted out a decision recently uh, increasing the PRM to 17% for 2024 and 2025 and we'll be evaluating additional revisions to the PRM for 2026 and beyond in future RA proceedings. To fill that gap in the interim, the Commission also ordered the three large investor-owned utilities to procure an additional 1,700 to 3,200 megawatts of resources, which would uh, result in a total PRM of 21 to 23.5% if the IOUs hit that range uh, and all the load-serving entities uh, meet their RA requirements. Okay, enough about PRM. Um, moving on to uh, resource requirements. 
uh, except for a narrow set of credited resources, uh, RA resources are required to have a contractual must offer obligation into the CAISO energy markets. Uh, and if they're not selected in the integrated forward market run, then they also must uh, make a zero dollar bid into the, the RUC, the res residual unit commitment proce uh, process. So, and uh, let's see, qualifying contracts must be for physical resources that meet CAISO's deliverability requirements within CAISO, dynamically scheduled or pseudo-tied imports, or non-resource specific imports that either self-schedule or bid into CAISO's markets at zero or below and that are paired with import allocation rights within CAISO. Previously, unspecified firm imports uh, in the form of capacity tags that committed to bid energy into the CAISO market could also count for RA. However, several years ago, the, P, um, the PUC clarified that, um, that RA import policy, these, po these policies in response to concerns that the Department of Market Monitoring raised regarding whether under stress grid conditions there would be resources to back up those capacity products for which entities were pretty consistently bidding energy into the market at, at or near the bid cap. After an extended stakeholder process, the Commission adopted the current requirement and uh, several years of subsequent analysis from DR DMM reflect that the clarified import rules have been successful in addressing this speculative supply issue. The Commission uh, runs a resource adequacy proceeding every year to look at rely any reliability concerns that arise with RA resources, and this change is an example of how these types of issues are addressed as they arise. A much newer program development <clears throat> is a pending change that is being made in recognition of the increasing penetration of four-hour storage resources, demand response, other use, and other use-limited and intermittent resources. Uh, so the Commission recently adopted a new, more comprehensive resource counting method, which we refer to as slice of day. Uh, and, and that requirement will, uh, well, yeah, the slice of day will require all resource, uh, retail providers to meet each hour of their 24-hour load forecast plus a planning reserve margin and show sufficient su supply to uh, charge storage for the, um, the highest coincident peak load forecast of, the, of each month. Slice of day will be imp implemented, you know, also with a, a ramp in period. Uh, slice of day will be implemented in parallel with existing program requirements in 2024 as a test year to identify any needed adjustments uh, with the full uh, implementation beginning in 2025. <clears throat> so turning to compliance and enforcement, uh, retail providers must show RA eligible contracts that meet 90% of their share of peak load during the five summer months in October 31st of the previous year, then they must show contracts reflecting 100% of those requirements 45 days ahead of each month. Uh, PUC staff implements a compliance and penalty regime that includes an escalating point system for providers who repeatedly fail to meet their procurement obligations. The penalties double and then triple for multiple infractions and both the penalties themselves and the point, that point escalation system are doubled for summer months uh, relative to, to winter months to reflect the increased value of reliability resources in those months. So both that escalation process uh, and the increase in the baseline penalty price itself were both adopted by the commission two years ago as we witnessed an increasing level of program noncompliance, uh, which was suggesting that some retail providers were electing to pay penalties rather than meeting their compliance requirements. In a similar vein, uh, quite recently, in response to an increase, uh, you know, con continued increase in compliance violations, the Commission just adopted a policy that restricts the expansion of those retail providers if they have a recent history of noncompliance. So there are some of the more recent examples of the program evolving to address reliability concerns as they come to light. Uh, and that is a high level overview of the PUC's RA program, including uh, th those developments. Uh, it's a robust program made up of a lot of pieces, in including some other elements like Flex RA to address the solar ramp and local RA that I, I didn't have time to describe here. Uh, but one more thing I did want to mention before I close, uh, in light of the close relationship between RA and IRP, is that the IRP proceeding is considering a new approach to ensuring that all retail providers are planning for and meeting their reliability and GHG reduction goals. So historically, the IRP program uh, has ordered new procurement via successive orders that peanut butter the additional megawatts across all entities. 
However, under a, a staff proposed reliable clean power procurement program or, or RCP cubed, uh, each retail provider would need to show a required percent of resources under contract in that mid to long term horizon, so out beyond the RA uh, horizon that would meet their reliability and, G and GHG targets with that percentage declining in the out years. So as envisioned, this looks a lot like a long-term RA program with GHG reductions embedded within it, which would give retail providers a much better sense of what they need to procure and when, uh, and, and approach their procurement in a more strategic fashion as compared to the current approach of sequential procurement orders of uncertain magnitude that are issued by the commission. This new program could uh, be restricted to new resources, or it could also include existing resource contracts, uh, and it may certainly impact the way in which imports are contracted, which has historically been in the year ahead and month ahead timeframes. Uh, the current timing of that new IRP program has been scoped to um, include at this point a revised staff proposal in response to feedback in the first quarter of next year with a proposed decision slated for the third quarter. And uh, with that, I'll close. Thank you. Mark, back to you. Thank, thanks, Pete. Um, there's a lot of similarities uh, in the programs, obviously, at the high level. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the details and, and, and just do a little bit of compare and, and not contrast, but just kind of see where it's going. So, Sarah, I think it's pretty clear that the Integrated Resource Program at the CPUC feeds into and supports kind of the resource adequacy program. It helps get still on the ground. It's actually the place where the uh, one in 10 loss of load evaluation is applied. How does RAP deal with or uh, integrate with the utilities plans and gets new steel in the ground uh, in a complementary way? It's a great question. And I've been thinking a lot about it because um, this kind of gets to the whole apples and oranges of this entire discussion and it's pretty complex it's hard to see a gala from a macintosh but let me let me try to dig into the irp issue just a little bit uh it it's it's true california has much more of a tighter handoff between the analysis for resource adequacy and then creating a build plan at least for a big part of the system that it signals outward in our case uh because this footprint is so massive and so diverse in terms of states, jurisdictional entities, non-jurisdictional entities, a power marketing administration, BPA. We've had to take a very careful and nuanced approach, but we're trying to get to the same thing, which is a strong and consistent signal of need where the build should happen, or at least the amount that we need. But we don't dictate resource location, resource flavor, we are there to provide the signal of what the region needs. The first time ever that this large Western footprint has had one unified target to get to, uh, but it's up to all of the different planning processes to take it from there. And I guess I would say that sounds discouraging because there are so many and honestly, RAP is really a call to action of that sort of diffuse nature of how we're addressing RA in the West. But I already know of and can see evidence of IRP discussion happening in multiple jurisdictions across the West that are starting to have explicit discussions about whether or not the RAP is an input that should influence that entity's planning decisions. Now, of course, a, a big issue, and this is, this is the case with really any forward-looking RA that's a year or less, that's not enough time for a build decision. RAP certainly has the ability and, and it has a commitment to provide two years out, five years out, but even then, some would argue five years is also not enough. But you can see some entities in the West seeing, especially those that have maybe um, longer to go in shoring up a compliance gap, that those discussions are starting to happen in their IRP proceedings, that they're starting to have a discussion with stakeholders and their commission about what they need to, to do to address the shortfall. It's going to happen more and more as we get closer and closer to binding operations. Thanks, Sarah. So, Pete, I'm going to flip the question around for you, um, because actually it's the reverse question, that is, if IRP is where the reliability is being assessed, how do you ensure that reliability is, is perpetuating as you contract uh, 
in the annual resource adequacy and how do you test that and ensure that you're still meeting and meeting a reliability level as you go into contracting and how is that being addressed? So, yeah, as, um, as I mentioned, we recognize that, uh, so ideally the PRM within the RA program will be reflective of that same one in 10 loss of load expectation. And again, modeling had historically suggested it was, uh, it's now clear that it isn't given the dramatic resource mix we're seeing and we're playing catch up. But uh, what I, what I, you know, not speaking for the commission, but what I anticipate uh, in the end state is, uh, and not too distant end state, is that the PRM will be explicitly r representative of the one in 10 LOLE, um, you know, in the, in, in a future RA proceeding, as I, as I just meant, as I mentioned. Just to put a finer point on it, in the interest of identifying where those oranges are at, and I wasn't really clear about this, RAPS PRMs for the different subregions in the months of winter and summer are a product of the analysis. So we don't administratively set it, it is a function of the analytics. Yes, and same, same, that's the ideal. Yeah. So my next question may be a little provocative, but I mean, RAP is integrating many balancing areas together in terms of a resource adequacy plan to unlock the, the benefits of um, load diversity. California is a large load. Do you, see, do you see a pathway or any way of harmonizing the two programs so that the load diversity benefits could be unlocked across programs? Any any thoughts about that? I know you've talked together a little bit about that. Probably haven't progressed to that level of discussion, but any any thoughts about that? Because I get a lot of questions about that. Uh, so let me start. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that's really been evident in our conversation so far, and there will be more to come, is just the need for just better understanding of, you know, a just like the two programs and the details, because there are a lot of details in both, uh, where those differences are, where they may matter. Uh, and um, and also uh, the just you know the, if there's any way to get our, our arms around what resources are being tied to each program, or particularly because of the differences in when you know how the transmission for how much transmission firm transmission has to be shown for uh, in the wrap case and all the you know the the unspecified imports uh, that can make up part of the RA program, which. At this point, are in the neighborhood of 2,500 megawatts, so you know about 5%. So about 95% of our, our you know current RA resources, we could pretty much get a good handle on and, and provide the other 5%. We could we could probably start getting some sense of, but we need to understand what you know what how that information can be shared, how transparent it can be. I you know I'm, I'm also similarly unclear on how transparent. The, the wrap information is going to be or who's going to who it's available to. So there's just a lot of information that I think we have an opportunity to look at and see what we can do with it. You know, it may be that if there's enough, it could be that that a, a wrap participant provides enough information that the PUC, this is just me spitballing, um, could get more comfortable with unspecified import, you know, those capacity tags coming from that particular RAP entity because there's a, you know, less concern that that's speculative supply, for instance. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there, there are other things that we need to kind of worry about that are less about opportunities, but more about avoiding unintended consequences like this. Um, uh, the fact that, um, I, and I mentioned this at, at Krepsi, that, you know, the, our, our program counting rules could lead to unintended consequences uh, in which the RA program uh, which picks up most of the outage risk for thermal resources in its PRM, uh, whereas the, the RAP is, is using embedded outage D rates and qualifying capacity and thermal resources themselves. So over time, that could result in those thermal resources with poor performance offering lower prices in the CAISO than they would in RAP, and that could leave, lead to reliability issues in California, uh, or as we move to slice of day and no longer use ELCC uh, counting conventions for solar and wind, it seems like you know there there could there could be winners and losers between the two programs if our programs are too you know too different in some of those details. Yeah, I would agree, Pete. Both of those areas are are opportunity areas, and you and the folks you work with, we've been having conversations and building relationship. I see Jamie back there. Really appreciate that that dialogue because 
that's just not a dialogue that existed before this program came along. So I think there's a lot to learn there. I think the thing that really strikes me that's just, just different than what Pete said, just because you already used up the best answers, Oops. was, um, you know, in a way, and this isn't unique to the West necessarily, the more I learn about RA, the more I understand that every RA program in the world is struggling to understand what are the appropriate metrics and measurements for this extremely challenging operational environment. And, and I hope you heard today that, that in some senses, uh, California RA on its journey to slice of day and Western Resource Adequacy Program on its baby steps to standing up the program for the first time, those are both new territories. So they are both untested and they're both kind of unfolding in the same critical set of years here in the next two to four years. So it's absolutely mission critical that we keep the dialogues open that we be ready for lessons learned and continuous improvement opportunities because we really have just started in terms of looking at RA in a whole new way. So this is a kind of just a sh short sense of scale um, question. Uh, the California uh, RA and, and IRP has, has successfully brought on in the last three years about 10,000 megawatts of nameplate capacity of which about half of it is available and usable in that net, net peak critical time. Um, and I think there's estimates that we're probably gonna have to be, be at a pace of probably five to 7,000 megawatts every year for the next few years, subsequent years, to keep up with the pace of change, especially as you get into electrification. From, an, from a RAP program, as you've done your initial analysis and your initial loss of low probabilities, do you have a scale of how much resource additions are necessary over the next few years to get to the starting point uh, and, and, and maintain that level of reliability? You know, Mark, we're still building out the functionality and our, our honestly, our focus is turning on the program. So I get a lot of questions about sort of day two steps. You know, what, what are the next steps? What is the amount of need? What are the next set of changes or improvements we're gonna make to the program? And there's a long list, it's very long already. And so what I emphasize is we have the potential to deliver a lot of reliability benefit because of the breadth and span of the footprint that we're offering. That's gotta be the focus just getting the program off the ground as it was originally designed. And as I mentioned before, there are some entities that that's just a different resource capacity shape than they've historically operated to. So there is a deficit situation for some and others not, right? It's a new starting point for all the people. And so it's gonna look and feel different. That's not to suggest that there are winners and losers. It's just a new paradigm. And it does take time to get to that place where the playing field is more level. And from there, I think it will be less shocking sort of sea change operations, but for now, there is some time and effort we need to spend keeping our eye on the prize and really getting into the binding program, which again, could be as late as 2028. I hope not, that's that's really not the goal. Sure, well, great. Uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna, uh, please stay here for, for questions, but I wanna switch to the kind of the second topic, and that is the, the question that we've been working with uh, RAP on in terms of interoperability. And EDAM, um, the objective of the EDAM design is to be kind of uh, agnostic about what RA program or IRP program is uh, folks are coming into the day ahead market with. And we've kind of created this universal adapter through the resource efficiency evaluation to evaluate sufficiency, not adequacy, but sufficiency uh, of both capacity and ramping capability on a daily basis. And, and then everybody gets to enjoy the, the benefits of the economic benefits of, of the trade and the optimization. Uh, and if we're successful, we, we kind of avoid those corner reliability cases, but we have to be prepared, prepared for them nonetheless. And I think um, in, in that interoperability question, uh, we had a lot of discussion about uh, how do you ensure the value proposition 
of RAP and the confidence in RAP as well as confidence in the EDAM are maintained and they complement each other. Um, and I think the one area that we got into a sticking point and we had to work through and, and we continued the discussions, which I appreciate, was this notion about how uh, existing rights, transmission rights, play into the, the uh, RAP and, and confidence in the RAP program as you go from the day ahead. Uh, ideally, we want things scheduled day ahead, but if those rights were not scheduled day ahead, how do then those rights still remain available pursuant to the rights and the terms and conditions of the rights holders so that it, it does allow for the confidence that someone in RAP, uh, they, if they were relying on those, they can safely rely on those rights to meet their requirements. Um, so I, I described the, 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 the remaining challenge, and I think in the last few weeks in the discussions, we, we made uh, some further clarifications and refinements to indicate that it, 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 we really do want to support and honor those rights, and we want to do it in a way that's respectful of the transmission service provider's uh, terms and conditions. And what we put into ultimately the filing was a, a mechanism that's consistent with our objective uh, all along, and that was, okay, if we produce a result uh, and there's, uh, if we used equal priority and it wasn't consistent with the rights, we always said the transmission uh, service provider could update us and clarify that. What we did in, instead is says, tell us those instructions up front and we will honor those rights, including if those are supposed to have higher priority going into the market. And I think that went a long way. And, I, and actually, it, the other mechanism was about um, was if there is a need to carve out transmission in the day ahead so that that transmission is always available. That obviously has some inefficiencies, and I think what we came up with actually takes pressure off that and, and opens up the ability to make the m maximum transmission available. So. I don't want to say too much more. I just want to get kind of uh, your take, and then I want to go to Mike, who is both in RAP, will be in RAP, committed to RAP, and is uh, committed to EDAM. <laughs> um, do we do we have a, a, a common view about where we got to? Did we did we address it? Obviously, we have to monitor, make sure that it, it delivers what we want it to. But did we did we scratch that itch? Good job <laughs> explaining a very <laughs> narrow and complex issue quickly, Mark. Um, we really appreciate the partnership with California ISO and stakeholders on coming to the solution that we arrived at. We worked really hard on it for many, many months. And we weren't always there, but we did get to a place that we feel very optimistic about. And in sum, I mentioned this in my opening remarks, our ability to potentially lower planning reserve margins and deliver capacity savings is premised on the idea that the way the forward showing workbooks are presented, here are my loads, here are my resources, here's the transmission I'm gonna use, all of those go into the study and the output is the planning reserve margin based on the collective. And that only holds true if you can serve those loads that way. If you can't do it that way, then the whole thing is kind of, it's just garbage out. And so again, fundamental premise was we're requiring all of these investments up front, including firm transmission to get that resource to that load. And then thereby creating this sort of insurance capacity pool, it was like a secondary benefit. But uh, we had the issue because potentially there was a curtailment priority that we didn't think lined up with open access transmission tariff firm scheduling priority. And so we'd been raising our hand consistently, speaking with KISO staff who worked very well with us, Pacific or other stakeholders. Uh, but we just took us a little while to finally tune the solution. The end of the day, we have the door being open for recognition of a higher scheduling priority in the optimization, recognizing the quality of that transmission that is that fundamental premise underneath RAP. There's also the other option that was always there to just tell the market operator, just take it out. But I agree with what you said, Mark. We're trying to optimize the value proposition of both programs. 
the ability to make sure that RAP can safely deliver planning reserve margins and mostly importantly, reliability, but also that the market has transmission capacity so that it can deliver benefits to its customers. A carve out, especially if you were worried about edge cases and serving load, might prompt you to just take it out, just take the whole thing out. Don't give anything to the market. This solution is a little bit more balanced and a little bit more nuanced in the, in the mechanics of it. Now, um, before I give it to Mike, I've got like two things that we're keeping our eye on. Uh, the details of how the solution gets implemented, the devil's always in those details. And so we'll be really keen to learn more about what those details are. And then I think the other thing that has been mentioned today is that um, this is an incremental market. This is not one balancing authority area RTO. So CAISO has to respect the, mar the balancing authorities of its EDAM footprint, meaning there's going to be the market operator tariff currently filed at FERC, but then there's going to be a corresponding set of tariffs. Maybe that's two, three, four, five, six, whatever your dreams and aspirations are for day one EDAM. All of them. <laughs> All of them. And that presents a, a new complexity that we didn't experience in EIM. It will be essential, and I think they can do it. It'll be essential that the EDAM community gets together and approaches what their tariff looks like, particularly the issue near and dear to our hearts, how the scheduling priority communication relationship will work to do it in a consistent manner, uh, good for RAP, but obviously good for the marketplace because the more differences there are between tariffs, the harder it is just to do business out there. So, so Mike, uh, and I know you're uh, on the supply side, but I was wondering if you could just also, from a higher level, because you're, you're, you're uh, in the RAP discussions as well, uh, kind of give us your view about where we got to and um, from a kind of a transmission service provider hat, do you, do, you, do you see the ability to kind of make those instructions more uniform? What balance sources and sinks are eligible to use those rights pursuant to the right, uh, the, the oat rights themselves? Yeah, sure. I, I think first I, I would just say, I think we did, we ended up in a, a really good spot. I think we, we struck that right balance for, you know, having that efficiency in the market and being able to capture that, but also um, respect those firm rights oaths that customers have um, invested in. And it's important to us that there continues to be that incentive for inv transmission investment throughout the West. So I think we did strike that right balance. And, and I do just wanna really touch base, like really appreciate the collaboration between the CAISO and the Western Power Pool. Um, you know, a lot, what a lot of folks don't realize is the number of hours and, and meetings that went into arriving at this spot and not only with you two, but also with other RAP participants and the participants committee. And um, so appreciate that. And Sarah, you did an excellent job um, advocating for the RAP participants. So, so thank you. And so to your question, Mark, as we work through these tariff changes and um, Pacific Corp kicks off its stakeholder process here shortly, you know, after um, the CAISO tariffs able to work through the FERC process. And we are looking forward to getting in those details to, to digging in and, and working with um, rights holders and with Sarah and the power pool um, and with others that potentially might join EDAM as well to make sure we have some consistency across tariffs. Um, and, and I think that will be important for all of us. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, I really appreciate the collaboration, obviously Mike and Pete, uh, collaboration all along the way in terms of EDAM, RAP, RA, how do you make those resources available to the market in an effective way and, and that, that supports reliability? Um, we have about 15 minutes left. I, I think maybe it's good to go to the audience to, for some questions. Knew we could count right. on Scott. I have some questions. Scott's always hands up first. Okay. <laughs> I, I like to be reliable. Um, anyway, so um, I appreciate the explanation. I love the fact that I'm seeing, you know, CPUC and 
and Sarah on the same dais. Um, and this is great. This is something that wasn't happening a few months ago. Uh, but I guess I'm looking for a little bit of a head nod from, from Pete, recognizing that you're not a commissioner and uh, da, 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 all that sort of stuff. That one of the goal that it would be really great if um, you, it would, it would benefit both reliability and efficiency if you could get to the point where you are comfortable with unspecified resources because of, that would increase the fungibility of, of RA that would benefit both California and the surrounding area. Is, can I get a head nod about that? So I, I didn't quite, which work, you're, are you talking about the RA tags? Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not gonna give any head nod. I, like I said, I'm just, you know, in, so you were spitballing. I don't, yeah. yeah, I'm spitballing. I don't, I don't know, the, I think somebody mentioned the devil's in the details. Um, uh. I think we'll need to under, unpack that a little bit. If you know, there could have been, some of my staff could be, would have been potentially kicking me under the table when I said that had they been able to. So, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, ever. again, I just think, all right, if this is a concern, if the, mm -hmm. you know, if the stated concern is that there is the, the, you know, some of these resources have been speculative supply and may not be backed up, then it, you know, I would surmise that if with more transparency and an understanding of uh, a, a BAA being, you know, rich and, you know, clearly having enough to cover and even provide reserves and have additional on top of that, that, you know, I could see some that that being entertained and explored in the and, 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 and opened up, right? And I, there's been a lot of push ever since that change in policy to figure out ways to open that up. And I'm just trying to be open minded and think about, oh, well, huh, I wonder if that could work. Right. Thank you very much. Scott, I, I, I don't mean to talk for Pete, but I, I, I do think their solution actually addressed uh, and allowed for unspecified resources and, 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 and get confidence in it that they would be delivered. So it was a solution to kind of a, a, another issue. But I do want to maybe uh, ask Sarah, because I think source specificity is an important aspect of, of, of RAP as well. And maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Right, so fundamentally, philosophically, <laughs> RAP started somewhere else, and I think Scott knows it, which is, uh, yes, there were concerns at the time about speculative supply issues, and I'm glad to know that since the rule change, the, the data is showing that that isn't the issue. Um, I'm very happy to hear that, but I would say that most likely, the RAP community still feels that no different than they did on day one of RAP, which is we're very interested in a RAP forward showing that's based on verifiable physical firm resources with source to sink transmission. And I think that's particularly important for the breadth and depth of the footprint we're working with, especially all of the different uh, BAs they have to get through and now multiple markets potentially as well. But I just to be, I think what Scott's suggesting is kind of the other something out on the other direction right. right so this is you know ra tags not a firm energy commitment mm -hmm. and and i you know i guess i um you know i guess so at this point 95 percent of the resources currently in participating in, in ra have that sort of you know source into kaiso um at least um the firmness and and uh yeah as far as going you know i guess if we were to go this direction, I don't think it would help solve the problem. You know, the, the, it wouldn't bring us any closer. It would probably take us further, further apart. So I, I think we're talking about maybe two different, um, two different concerns and two different ways of, of handling those concerns. <laughs> That's by design, Scott. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all right. So we do have. All right, um, we do have one person or a couple of people online, so let's take a virtual call. I think uh, Anita Decker, why don't you go ahead? I really like seeing both of you guys on the panel. So Sarah and Pete, I've not met you, but I certainly have met Sarah and Mike. Um, I, I guess as I listen to this, there, when on the one hand we talk about how do we all collaborate and, and all to, and work together. And, and you look at the regulatory, the regulator's letter, and you look at the interest in, you know, get, gaining all the assets we can out of a larger footprint. It seems like there needs to be more, what can we do together instead of the, well, here's my program, here's your program, everybody have a nice day. So I really do hope that there, that there continues to be dialogue looking at 
where you can find more commonality, realizing the, the programs are in two very different spots, even as they continue to flesh themselves out, that there is at least a, a look over the fence and can we, are these things that we'll be able to pull together at some point or are we designing things that, that absolutely will make that more difficult or un, unattainable? So just a comment. Anita, I appreciate your comment so much. And from my perspective, although there's nothing formalized, I would certainly recognize that leadership at CPUC and CEC is really what paved the way to start the dialogue between our staffs, which have been regular and have been mostly focused to, to something Pete said, um, just language acquisition, learning fluency in the other programs. These are complex programs. Uh, there's a ton of history around CPUC. It's rapidly evolving. RAP is nascent, but also complex in its own sort of tailor-made way. So lots to learn before we get to those opportunities, but I feel the commitment and the follow-through, which I appreciate. And I guess I'd just say like, they may be, they're different in, you know, difference isn't a bad thing if they're just different structures intentionally and they, they don't cause problems like some of the ones that, you know, or potential unintended consequences. I think we have to look at the unintended consequences and certainly like I also offered, like maybe there's even, you know, some, some opportunity there for sure, but, you know, not to over, overuse the, the, um, the pepper, hot pepper reference, but uh, I mean, I, I the rap is is you know is like me. I opted into my hot pepper today, and that's fine. It's great. It's opt in, opt out. Uh, Joan, you you know you kind of were were in it whether you liked it or not, and there you you know, and and that's true of our um, all the um, load serving entities in the in in the Kaiso. If they want to keep serving load, they they're participating, um, and the you know. The forward showings are different. That's, I don't think that's a problem. You know, I think we have to, like, do we just align for the sake of alignment or do we align in areas where there are issues? And I think there are opportunities to do that. And then certainly the, the flip side of that to work together to make sure we don't, we, we align in ways that we don't create unintended consequences. So, so I, I got to speak up here too, because as, as a market operator that has uh, running markets that cross over programs, we too have an interest and a perspective in um, breaking down those barriers and making that as smooth as possible and, and harmonization is the term that we use. So we would also be uh, looking for those opportunities, looking for the opportunities to engage in those discussions and, and, and find ways to unlock and harmonize programs. Obviously, there's we can only go so far. Um, we can't change RAP. We can't. We we can't dictate that. We can't change a dictate on the CPUC uh, program. But we can highlight some of the observations and maybe highlight those opportunities and maybe provide a a source of some just like resource efficiency provided a a um, a, a, a a way to bring things together uh, and look at things in one way. Maybe there's other opportunities that we can do that in a broader sense. So we we look forward to that. Yeah, well, I guess in a way, yeah, we didn't, we're talking about the two programs harmonized, but the, the, the other point here, which is the two programs separately harmonizing with EDAM, like, and, and so Correct. that maybe is the, you know, we're going to have to look at what the, what is an, what are our import rules in the, in the, in an EDAM world and where their transfers inside of EDAM participants. And, you know, they're going to be, I imagine the, the overlap between RAP and EDAM participants. I've seen those great Venn diagrams you guys have put together. Like, yeah, for those that are doing both, like, where is the, the through figuring out what works best with, with our programs and EDAM, some of that harmonization may happen on the natural too. Yeah. Can, can I just yeah. say, I, yeah, I completely agree with everything that's been said. And I, I like your comments, Mark, about the harmonization or, you know, I would say any convergence of the programs and kind of that direction towards reliability just enhances the benefits for all of the West, whether it's California, um, RAP participants, um, whatever it is. So I, I'm uh, optimistic and encouraged that discussions are happening. Good. All right, let's go to Jeff Nelson. Oh. Jeff's going to abstain. Ask an answer. Okay. Uh, thanks, Steve Billy, Brookfield Renewable. Uh, Pete, thank you for earlier acknowledging the potential incentives with different counting methodologies between RAP and the, and the California RA program. And while RAP, and I think the majority of the country, 
is heading to ELCC for intermittent resources. After a decade, California is now moving away from it. Number one, please, I guess, confirm, and this goes to the question about potential alignment. I think under slice a day, just in that hourly construct, it's, I, I, I'm not sure ELC, using EL, ELCC is feasible. So if you could just talk about that for a second. And then are you at all concerned about IRP portfolios obviously have a fair amount of uh, wind coming in from out of state? Do you think it potentially could change the incentive for those resources to contract with RAP participants versus California entities? Just, um, anyway, thanks. There's a lot there to unpack, and I'm not necessarily qualified to do a lot of it, but I'll muse a little bit. So, yeah, I think the commission, you know, I don't know about impossible or whether you use infeasible, but the commission did decide on an exceedance method to approach the, you know, intermittent resources, to, you know, count the intermittent resources in the slice of day that we're rolling out. Um, and uh, though, you know, the the... Again, the, what what gets new resources built is IRP. IRP looks at the marginal value of resources, um, and uh, as opposed to you know, so so there's you know, right out of the gates there's that, that difference, and um, so contracts that are being signed will be you know required to you know they'll be measured through I think the the EL, somebody else you know I, I think because RA you know rather IRP is still operating under the ELCC, that the IRP value will be what it is, so the contract is there, and then the LSC will have to work out the fact that that resource has a different amount of RA value, as it does now, because just out of the gates, we're dealing with marginal uh, NQC for new resources and average NQC in the RA program. So some of that's just part, of, part and parcel to having these two programs. So. All right, I, Mark. Is that helpful? Is that, are we out of time for questions? We have a couple more questions. If you want to take one more and then we'll one wrap. One more and then I'll, I'll do a wrap. So we have one more person virtually, Isabella. Go ahead. Go ahead, caller. Oh, sorry, is that me? Yes, it that's is. You. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I, I didn't get a cue, like a uh, heads up that I was. Okay, so uh, yeah, Dan Catchpole from uh, Clearing Up. Thanks for this panel. Um, one, I was just curious actually uh, if, this is a question for Sarah. Um, you mentioned the Desert Southwest you're hoping will go live in 2026. Is that still a possibility for the Northwest or it sounds like that's kind of not an option right now. Um, you're looking at 2028 for the Northwest. I'm hoping for 2026 for everyone, just to be very clear, Dan, from clearing up. Um, I want to explain the nuance is that uh, the tariff allows these entities two years ahead of that season to make that decision. That's how I know that 2025 is off the table because that deadline has come and gone. But the 2026 deadline is still alive and well. And I'm very hopeful. Uh, indicative polling, which is confidential, indicates a pretty decent likelihood of a consensus amount of participants in the desert southwest portion of our footprint. In the northwest, it's it's very complex. There's a, a range of entities. It's definitely an added complexity that at the same time that we're thinking about rolling out a resource adequacy program, Bonneville Power Administration is in the middle of renegotiating its own provider of choice contracts. So there's uncertainty in a range of areas. That's not the only one, but I think the theme, Dan, that I would emphasize is uncertainty makes the additional decision of a RAP binding commitment all the more challenging, and that is what we're dealing with in the Northwest. But the staffs of all of these different load-serving entities are remain committed. They understand the importance of going live with RAP as soon as we can. And the commitment extends to having our staffs work together to figure out all of the flexibility and the opportunities we have to seize those earlier go live opportunities. Thanks, Sarah. Thank Mark, do you want to wrap things up? Well, my, my wrap up is really just to say thank you. Um, 
developing RA programs is not easy. It's complicated. It has significant ramifications. It's significant cost. And to do it right, there's no one recipe to do it. So I, I appreciate the hard work you all are putting into doing this, and I appreciate the collaboration and making sure that it works uh, effectively with the market as a whole as we optimize those resources that you 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 contract and bring on for uh, resource adequacy. So thank you, and let's give it a big hand. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, all the panelists. Great conversation. All right, we're going to take a real stretch break now, and we also have sugar in the back. So help yourself to sugar, even Red Bulls. Um, you, so get you ready for the next panel. Come back at 3.30. All right, I think we're ready to get started again. Hopefully everybody's uh, a little bit sugared up this time rather than hot peppered. We're going to be starting our last panel. If you want to just grab that one last Red Bull. Yeah, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been hanging with us all day here in Vegas. Like I said, we've got 240 people here in person, and all day we've had a whopping 300 people join us virtually. So I want to thank all those virtual attendees for hanging with us as well. All right. So this last panel, Evolving Markets in the West, is going to bring a stakeholder perspective and bring a unique set of voices together across several different industry sectors where panelists will share their views on how EDAM can benefit customers across the entire region. So in terms of our panelists, I'm going to call them up one by one. We have Brian George. He is from Google. He is the U.S. Federal Lead, Global Energy Market Policy and Development Lead. We have Kelsey Gomani, she's an advocate for the Sustainable FERC project. We have Greg Patterson, director of Arizona Competitive Power Alliance. We have Scott Renzel, director of portfolio management from PG&E. He's in the back somewhere getting a Red Bull. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, Josh Robertson, director of energy market strategy from Salt River Project. And we have Mary Winky, Executive Director of the Public Generating Pool. So great set of panelists for this next discussion. And last but not least, the moderator of this panel is Rob Konziolka. So similar to Jan, Rob has a tremendous amount of leadership experience in, with 40 years in the industry. Currently, he serves as a governing body member of the Western Energy Imbalance Market. And he's been in that role since February of 2020. He currently serves as vice chair. And so, Rob, thank you very much for willingly moderating this panel. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you Joanne. Uh, before getting started, I just want to have a shout out um, to the Western Energy Imbalance Market governing body members that are attending today. You heard earlier from Andy Campbell, who is the chair. And then we have two members who are joining us virtually. They spent their travel time yesterday getting to Portland, enjoying the Portland airport, and then driving home. Their um, flight accommodations didn't work. So um, instead of being here in person, they are, are listening in and uh, so welcome. Um, we're gonna do things a little differently. Um, we're not gonna have opening remarks. We uh, have a lot of territory we would like to cover and we are gonna jump right in and try and keep this somewhat fast moving, make it uh, a little more energizing for those Red Bulls and um, see how we go here. So I'm gonna start off with the first question going to Greg. 
And, and Greg, you know, you've got a background in energy market developments that go back to, to prior to 2000. Um, you've seen some good things, you've seen some things that um, maybe not so good. But um, what do you see the benefits of and value of expanded markets and in particular EDAM? <laughs> over the, years. The, the best example of the day, I, I think, is the one that really uh, captures it. And that is uh, the microphone example that they did, right? Which is there's three of us up here. We have two microphones and we're willing to share. And I think all of us inherently understand that sharing is good, sharing has benefits. You know, there's a big book, we learned that in kindergarten, how to share, et cetera. The advantage of sharing is that it allows you to use uh, resources that you're not using and apply them to whatever it is that you're doing. So for example, obviously, if we have uh, three people and two microphones, we're willing to share it. We don't need as many microphones. Well, if we can apply that to the rest of our life, we know that if we also have uh, three people and two power plants, we don't have to have one person per power plant anymore. Uh, we used to have that, right? It used to be a vertically integrated structure where one company serving one city built the power plants for its own needs, connected to that city, and then provided that power. Well, obviously we know that they didn't need it at night, they had to build for their peak, they, they had different weather, and eventually they learned that they could share, and so they would have agreements with cities that were further away, et cetera. Uh, they would have agreements with, uh, with other areas, other utilities who could provide power for them at a the time they didn't need it. And they did that in bilateral arrangements. And that worked well. And then we finally realized that, well, wait a second, we can have more than that. We can have a market. We could have sharing that is economic and it benefits from that. And so that's the benefit of exactly what we've got going on here. We've, we've got the ability to share. We can have an economic incentive to share and because of that, we need less resources. And so I think that's what the whole day has been about. And I think it's been a really good understanding of that fundamental, which is that we are trying to come up with ways so that we can have current capacity used more efficiently by making sure we have incentives so that people can share it without having additional risk of it falling apart and without hoarding it like they would in a normal situation where this is my this is my microphone it's not scuba diving where if i don't have my microphone or i don't have my reg my uh, my apparatus i die and so that's the market that we're trying to create is something that shares those benefits thank you greg i'm just checking to see if anybody else wants to comment on that if not i'm going to move on so um scott um you represent large PTO in California. You've been participating in the California day head market for a long time. It's successful. Um, it's been, been beneficial. So what opportunities does EDAM provide over just retaining the current um, California day head market and WEIM real time market for you? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I think, um, you know, what we've heard a lot uh, today is around friction. Um, friction that exists inside of RA programs or friction that exists between the oat world and a market world. And I think what EDAM, what has been evidenced in EIM is that a market can reduce friction. It can provide the economic and reliability benefits that many of us in the room are looking for. I believe EDAM can carry that process forward, the ability to plan in advance of a 75 minutes before the hour, but rather a day and a half before to effectively economically and optimized use of resources across a wider footprint has value um, that, is, that has been shown umpteen times in umpteen places. EDAM is looking to do that and it's prioritized access of transmission in that market so that you have the pathways to do it. And, uh -oh. and uh, and uh, the generating resources that exist that obviously we've talked at length about 
how those are changing um, uh, over time, not only in California, but out throughout the rest of the West. Thank you. Um, Mary, PGP has been, been involved with evaluating EDAM for quite a while. A number of policy papers um, have been you know, published. Um, and 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 you know you've been been evaluating this. So, what do you see as the greatest challenge to widespread adoption of EDAM? Thanks, Rob. Um, you are correct. Actually, my predecessor, uh, Therese Hampton, um, was a big believer in principles. And before I took over at PGP, she worked with PGP members to develop a set of principles that would really root and guide PGP's perspective on not just evaluation of markets, evaluation of resource adequacy frameworks, really kind of trying to, um, you know, create a framework in which we could really support eventual advocacy in different stakeholder processes, um, et cetera. And we actually just, that, that's an evolving document. We just updated our principles this year. Um, and, you know, they're, they're all of the elements that are contained in our principles are really elements of EDM. We have principles around governance, um, resource adequacy, resource efficiency, price formation, um, transmission use, and then also greenhouse gas accounting, which is something that's been mentioned uh, also a couple times today. I think one of the one of the big challenges, and, and we've this is not going to come to any surprise to anyone um, for the wide, widespread adoption of EDAM, is the governance challenges. I think governance is, is a little bit of an Achilles heel uh, for EDAM. And, and also something that, you know, that, I, you know, not to set aside all of the great work that has been done on governance in EDAM. Um, I also participated, I think Letha mentioned this already today, I also participated in the governance review committee. And, and I still think that that was a great model for um, a stakeholder pro for a for a stakeholder led stakeholder process, that group really worked well together. Um, Scott's I don't, not predecessor but former colleague Eric Eisenman participated in that, and we often did not agree. Um, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, you know, still still had a uh, very collegial atmosphere and really worked through those issues. So, I, you know, I I, I don't want to set aside that process and the and the the, what was achieved in that process. But I think as long as you have um, an, a, a governance structure that is not truly independent, I think that really can create a situation where part market participants don't trust the process or feel they can't trust the process because there is at a minimum an appearance of a conflict where different, differently situated market participants are not being treated equally. So I'm not saying that has occurred or is, or is occurring, but I think it, even just the appearance of it, I'm a former lawyer. I am, I guess I am still a lawyer, <laughs> uh, but I'm a former lawyer. So, you know, it, in some ways when there is a conflict of interest, it, it, you don't have to sort of prove a bias or prove that something bad has happened, but even the appearance of that conflict can, can create issues or create loss of trust. So I, I do think that's the biggest challenge um, I'm really encouraged by the conversation today from the regulators who are um, advancing a new solution and, and trying to move the ball on this. I think that there's recognition um, that that is probably the biggest challenge, and I'm heartened by that effort, um, and we'll be interested to see where it goes and, and likely actively engaged in, in the conversation as well. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, you've got background in, in energy markets. Um, the RDRC has also lobbied in the West for, for quite a long time now regarding energy markets. And um, so what are your concerns if EDAM does not have widespread adoption across the Western interconnection? Yeah, I think one of the biggest concerns, um, it's not that there would be negative impacts to those potentially few that would be participating if there isn't widespread adoption, um, simply that there would be benefits left on the table uh, if the EDM, um, then if the EDM covered a broader resource pool. Since the EDM could help enable the Western region to reliably and cost effectively transition to a clean energy future, um, that's in part mainly the increase trade that would occur over the source pool. Um, but looking 
kind of beyond the perspective of affordability, reliability, decarbonization benefits that the EDAMs offer the region. Um, there's two kind of important considerations that I'm gonna piggyback off of Mary a little bit. Um, and those are inclusive public participation and meaningful governance, both of which I think have been very strong points throughout the development of the EDAM. Uh, the joint authority framework that has been successfully employed in the energy imbalance market that evolves the governance structure to provide assurance to market participants outside of California, as well as other stakeholders, that their perspective will be appropriately weighed in the decision-making process. Um, of course, looking ahead, the discussion that we have with the regulators is Westwide Governance Pathway Initiative, I think really demonstrates eagerness of folks in the region uh, that are willing to collaborate and support the EDM as a critical step on the path toward a Westwide RTO. But it's important to note that seeking independent governance for a Westwide RTO shouldn't prevent the benefits of participating in the EDM and its joint authority now. Thank you, Kelsey. That's that's insightful. I knew that uh, on this particular subject that you're pretty passionate about it. Um, Josh, um, you know, you represent the interest of a large public power in the desert southwest in participating in the Western energy imbalance market for a few years now. And, and um, like most, having, you know, very positive um, value and savings. And um, and, and, and so it's also brought significant benefits to, to all the um, entities that have been participating. And I heard the term that everyone's been a winner. Um, so do you think this is gonna be the case with EDAM? And should we expect to see that all the EM, EDAM participants will be winners? Or do you think that it has a possibility of being winners and losers? Just for those that are unaware, Salt River Project, since Jacob already claimed that APS is the biggest utility in Arizona, <laughs> we're the second biggest utility in Arizona, but just, just barely. Um, yeah, you know, we've entered EIM in 2020, right in the, the heart of the pandemic, and uh, we've seen a lot of benefits uh, from EIM that go right to our customers. So it is a, a good market to be a part of. Quite honestly, that's one of the big uh, catalysts for us to uh, look to day ahead markets as well to get more efficiencies. I think Scott laid those out, out very well. Um, in terms of, you know, everybody winning, <coughs> I, I do think under an EDAM framework uh, or under any day ahead market framework, you're just going to continue to get more efficiencies. So you will have people win. Uh, I think what, what's important to think about, though, is there'll be bigger winners and smaller winners, right? So when we talk about modeling the WEC as an entire footprint, a single, uh, single EDAM footprint, <coughs> it is more cost effective in totality. Um, but that doesn't mean that SRP customers may benefit as much under that framework as, as a different one. So for us, it's important to look at, you know, what are the benefits that are gonna be derived for our customers? Uh, and that's something we need to take a look at as well. Um, just on, on the governance points real quick too, we, as like PGP, we also have our, our set of principles that guide our engagement throughout all, all these activities and markets. And um, in addition to the governance in terms of independence, we also have, uh, a, a pathway to an RTO. And so we, we do value the ability, day ahead market may be enough, right? Uh, we may see, get into that, say, hey, this is enough. Um, but it's a very real possibility that we get into that market and say, look, there's, again, back to benefits being left on the table. Um, there are some benefits uh, to joining an RTO as well. And so when we look to governance, we also look to it near term issues, but we also look to it longer term in terms of, is there a pathway to an RTO that, that, that's viable as well? Okay. I, I, you know, we've heard that as a pretty good uh, theme all day today, that, that you're not, I just want to make certain it was clear that you don't have to see it today. You just need to see that if it's needed, there is a pathway of getting there. We'll be taking it into consideration as to what that pathway looks like. Right. Right. We've seen the path be rocky thus far. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that description yet. That's that's good. Um, Ryan, I'd like to go to you next. And, and you know, I think most people have heard of Google before. Anyone's got a phone. Um, pretty much all of us. So, um, and, and I think most people recognize that Google has some pretty big projects. 
and um, but, and you personally have uh, a lot of experience on, on other markets um, in the rest of the country. Um, so I want to go and ask, you know, does EDAM meet the needs of all market participants? You represent a very distinct difference um, from, from the most uh, normal participants in, in, um, in, in the West and in EDAM. Yeah, no, I, I feel like that's a bit of a, a $64 million question, right? Um, I, I, we all want to think that EDAM is going to achieve everyone's needs. Um, we don't know, right? But I think... Kaiso deserves an extreme amount of credit for the way that they constructed the process for creating and, and, and vetting EDAM, right? That was a very inclusive process of a broad set of stakeholders. And if you look at Kaiso's filing and read it, I mean, there's a very clear and, and thoughtful attempt to really balance, you know, existing arrangements and, and balancing authority autonomy while also promoting reliance on markets. And, and so I think that just is indicative of a process that, that was truly um, embodied a lot of different voices. And, and that's not always the case, right? Um, we have a lot of load in the Southeast part of the US. And I think folks might be familiar with the Southeast energy exchange market. Yeah. That was a very different process. Um, and so the reason I frame it that way is because everyone has really had the opportunity to make their voice heard, including large customers like us uh, who, who traditionally may not have had that opportunity. And so I think that's going to go a long way okay. in helping EDAM meet those benefits that of, of everyone's needs. And and I think it's, it's important also to, to sort of look at the sort of the, the foundation for why EDAM is here, right? You just look at EIM, $4.2 billion in gross benefits to date, right? Kaiso in their filing is predicting a hundred million to a billion dollars of annual benefits from EDAM. If we see those benefits, it's only gonna be a matter of time before we have the conversation about broader and more extensive market expansion, which ultimately, if we really want to get and extract customer benefits, that's the road we're going to have to go down. And so I think this is really setting the stage for uh, a, a productive path forward. So not to put words in your mouth, because you may be filing comments, and I don't know what they might be, but, but generally you have a, a, a positive reaction to what has transpired to date and, then, um, and, and what you see looking forward. Yeah, I think that's fair. And the, it just... The other thing I think is worth highlighting is the other part of this filing, which are the day ahead market enhancements, right? That's going to provide a ton of value in enabling the ISO to reliably integrate more variable resources. That's something that all of the ISOs are going to need to do. And so I really see Kaiso's filing as being a leader on that, which we, which yeah. we support. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into more of that, um, that particular issue. Um, so moving on, um, Scott, I'm going to go back to you. And, um, you know, we were hearing previously a lot of discussion here on resources. Um, so might EDAM influence the type of, from your perspective, might EDAM influence the type of resources that are developed? And, and again, from your perspective, if yes, what type of resources and any impact on location where resources are developed? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that translates back to that governance conversation is we need, and it was encouraging to see a very active regulator community paying attention to not only what is happening in the markets, but also they are in charge of the, the, resource, the resource planning process. So their awareness of the market and what the market may do to that resource mix, uh, I think is, is critical that they, they stay engaged with each other. That said, I think in the short term, um, EDAM really needs to get its feet under the ground before I think you're going to see changes in the resource mix. But, you know, folks that have been in EIM for a while will probably tell you it has, it has manifested itself into their IRP process, whether it's cost savings or other elements. And it starts to bleed into the way in which you think about how to achieve your individual objectives, your state's objectives. All of the states have a, a lot of similarity. 
you know, in terms of greenhouse gas objectives, maybe not at the same levels, same, same time speeds, but directionally going towards how do we create that efficient fossil free environment so that uh, as well as economic benefits along the way. And mind you, there hasn't been a ton of talk about it today, but we're all going to experience load growth in that as well. So the resources, you know, as California had talked about 19,000 megawatts, many other states also have mandates to add resources. I think it's too early for many to say, I'm going to do this because of EDAM, but they are starting to put it on the plate. And I think it becomes a growing piece of the picture that gets infused into resource planning in the future. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, back to you, and say stay on this resource theme. And um, what impacts do you think markets in the West will have on decarbonization throughout the West? Yeah, so I think um, EDAM in particular, not just the day ahead market, but the EDAM um, can help promote the integration of more renewable energy resources into the Western region. Um, with a broad footprint, the EDAM would allow participants access to a much broader resource pool and solar and wind are some of the fastest growing resources. I think the fastest growing resources um, in the West right now. Um, so being able to schedule those in the day ahead and then deliver to customers more efficiently does, I think, two main things that can help um, get us towards decarbonization is, one, it helps to reduce renewable energy curtailments, um, which happens especially in some of our more solar power rich areas. Thank you to John from the Brattle Group for outlining that so wonderfully during your presentation. Um, two, it can help identify better where power is moving and then can help aid in identifying where renewables need to come online um, and potentially help guide decisions on where the most efficient and the most cost effective resources can be built um, to work towards decarbonization while enhancing reliability. Thank you. That, um, I, it's something that, that as, as the transmission planners look in here, um, that's one of that, those, those big unknowns and, and, and you know, it's going to require a lot of, of scenario planning. And, um, and so understanding how that might get integrated into that process is going to be, I think, one of those other big challenges. Um, Greg, moving back to you and sticking on this resource theme, um, you know, you represent the Competitive Alliance. What impact do you think markets are going to have on the development of new resources? When you have markets, people get to choose and they have incentives. And when you have market-based incentives, I think it, it benefits uh, customers, it benefits stakeholders, it, it benefits uh, everybody who participates. And so the, the market is going to allow ultimately consumers and regulators to have an ability to choose the resources that they want. And they can do that at uh, lower cost, they can shift risk from their stakeholder, their their particular stakeholders, their customers to a broader community of stakeholders. Uh, markets provide solutions to a lot of problems and they're problems that we haven't necessarily identified yet. And so uh, when when Uber came about, we we didn't really think about what the benefits of Uber might necessarily be, but the, the smartphone facilitated that. And so that's communication and global positioning, et cetera. And then suddenly we can share rides and then how does that affect the car market? Well, it affects the car market because there's there's more demand for efficient vehicles because the person who wants to make do Uber and make a little bit of a profit really has an incentive to have an efficient vehicle. Well, same things here. We have goals, right? We, we have goals that we can articulate. We want it to be clean. We want it to be reliable. We want it to be low cost, et cetera. Well, if, if you empower regulators to set standards, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, reliability, and then you create a market, and then you empower people to buy and sell under that constraint, those conditions, then you will get what it is that you have incentivized. So if you want the market to be uh, clean, if you want it to be carbon free, if you want it to be reliable, people who set that goal and figure out a way to price it into that market will have other people compete to to meet those needs and the independent power community is there to do that and and I think they've done a great job I mean you see 
technology, you see competition, you see innovation. Uh, during my time running the, the Arizona Competitive Power Alliance, it started out with, uh, you couldn't compete with a fully depreciated coal plant. That's what we used to say. Well, there's no way to really, you really compete with that. Carbon isn't priced into it, et cetera. And then you had combined cycle turbines and, and they would compete with it. And then the market changed because of innovation. Everybody thought you couldn't compete with coal. Well, then you can't compete with combined cycle natural gas. Well, then uh, solar photovoltaic is the new thing, right? And and it's too expensive, but we've got solar thermal, right? We, we've got mirrors that, you know, and, and that was the big thing for a while. And then photovoltaic one, and then you move on. That innovation isn't something anybody could predict. You couldn't say, oh, this is going to be the progression. But when you empower a market, you get innovation to meet those needs. And so we don't know really what EDAM is going to ultimately do. We just know that it is going to open up a market incentivize additional tra trading, uh, allow people to share capacity for transmission. Will people build transmission in response to that? If they, if they can make money, they will. Will people build cleaner power plants? If that's incentivized and they make money, they will. And so the ability to, to put incentives together with the, the goals of policymakers is ultimately going to be what this really does. That's, that's the long run solution. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. And that's going to lead really nicely, Brian, back to you. And you talked a little bit about uh, dealing in the Southeast. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Google and, and entities like you have been developing some large projects. And so my question to you is, how will markets impact the development of hybrid load and renewable resource projects that, that you're contemplating? Yeah, and, and I'm really glad I'm able to to follow up on on Greg. I mean, I think as as a lot of folks know uh, in the room, uh, we do have a fairly aggressive uh, clean energy goal, uh, which is to power all of our data center and, and office operations globally uh, with 100% carbon free energy around the clock by 2030. That's coming up quick, uh, but uh, you know, I think when we think about it from a market's perspective, right? Our our commercial teams get a lot of value out of being able to look at the economics of projects that are located in, in RTO regions, even ones that just have day ahead markets. Right. Um, and, and we have seen that in practice when we look at investments in RTO regions versus non-RTO regions. And so I think establishing a framework that can send transparent price signals that are available to all entities is gonna make us make more prudent investment decisions as we're building out the grid. And, and those types of resources are gonna be carbon-free resources. And so I think we wanna make sure additionally, right, that the market recognizes those resources, values those resources, and allows those resources to offer the services that they're physically able to offer into the market for the benefit of the grid, right? That, that provides reliability value, economic value, um, and, and to the extent you value it, clean energy. Um, the final point on that, I think, is just that, you know, market power mitigation is obviously huge in a market. And so we're, we're really uh, focused on the measures that are in place to ensure that suppliers that do have market power, you know, are mitigated. Um, at the end of the day, that's key. But the transparency that we see the benefit that we see from RTO regions is is huge and, and really key to our investment in carbon-free resources. Brian, a quick follow-up question, and that is, do you see the relationship on how you develop projects changing? In other words, right now you have a lot of unique arrangements with, mm -hmm. with I'll say, hosting utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see markets changing that, or do you see it enhancing that, or just being very different, or, or you're not certain? I think our hope would be that it would en enhance it. Right. Um, at the end of the day, we're looking for more options. We're looking for more cost effective options. We're looking for reliable options. And to the extent that we have an environment that enables broad participation from both buyers and sellers, right, that's, in our view, going to lead to better outcomes. Thank you. Um, we know we can't have more resources without more transmission, although somebody may want to debate that. Um, Mary, I want to turn to you and, and you know, with adoption of, of, of energy markets and expanded energy markets, um, 
will this help spur transmission development or um, do you think it's just an, another thing that's out there? Do, do you, where, where do you kind of weigh that? Um, thanks, Rob. Um, thanks for that that question. I think this has really been a transmission has been an interesting topic throughout the day today, in particular in the first CEO panel, kind of talking about some of the challenges associated with transmission development. And and I think the answer is, in my mind, is kind of twofold. You know, one, I do think that an organized market is going to give us more information. It's going to give us more transparency. Um, we're hopefully going to see more about where the congestion is, um, where transmission is needed, um, and and that more information can help guide you know further decisions about um, transmission planning, transmission siting, and and um, promote development and more transmission. The question you asked me is, will will a market will EDM spur transmission development? I think that's a little bit of a harder. Um, leap to get to because when you really think about um, the barriers to transmission uh, development, I do think that there are a lot of factors that um, influence transmission development that are really separate from the market. Permitting, Lisa Grow this morning was talking about um, siting and permitting challenges. Um, the market's not going to solve who pays for the transmission, right? I mean that that's a that is a big barrier. So I think it's I think it promotes transmission development. I think it promotes transparency and more information um, about the tr the use of the transmission system. Um, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say it's, it spurs new transmission. Um, but one other thing too that I don't know that we've talked much about today that I think is an interesting element of this is that. Um, we hope, right, that a market also promotes the more efficient utilization of our existing assets. You know, are we really, are we really using the transmission system, which is really a big machine, right, a big interconnected machine? I think I heard that in a conversation on Public Power Undergrounds, so I will give a plug to um, Paul Dockery on that one, a little um, uh, reference there. But I think I liked that, right, thinking about the transmission system as a big machine that we're plugging load and plugging generation into, are we really using that machine as efficiently as we can? Um, well, probably not, given kind of some of the balkanized um, uh, nature of operations in the West. So I think in some ways that that is also related to this bigger picture uh, conversation about access transmission and transmission development. Please. I, I would just, just add, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that and in, in one of my hopes with with EDAM is that it is going to more effectively utilize the existing transmission system. And and I think my, my take on the the spurring transmission development might be somewhat more optimistic in the sense that I think to the extent we more effectively utilize the existing system, it's going to help identify where it makes more sense to build new transmission assets, which hopefully will help address some of the, the permitting and siting challenges, which I totally agree with, but I'm, I'm hopeful it can inform those decisions yeah. going I, forward. I, I don't want to sound too negative. I just think that the, the market has a role to play. It isn't going to yep. take us all the way there. So, so both Mary and Brian, um, you know, dating back to 2005 with the Energy Policy Act and then, um, you know, national interest uh, transmission corridors and congestion. And, and, you know, no one's really solved a, a really fantastic way of defining congestion. Um, and if you recall, every report that's come out, it's been different. Uh, do you think energy markets, that's, let's, let's just focus on the West, will help in doing a better job of defining um, congestion? I'm not going to be able to probably have too much of an informed question, uh, answer to that. But what I will say is that I do, I hear different things from smart people, right? I hear smart people say, we know where their con congestion is. We don't need another study or a market to tell us that. We know we've, we've made the plans, we've drawn the circles. And, you know, like I say, what Lisa said today, you know, we just, we just need to go build it and figure out how to go build it. Um, but I also think that. I've heard also smart people talk about how markets create transparency and can show us where some of these congestion points are and, and work toward helping us alleviate those that congestion. Yeah, I, I mean, just hopping in there, Rob. Please, Josh. Yeah. 
I mean, I think that that last point that Mary made is very important because I do think that's where the markets will provide benefits for the potential to build new transmission. The siting issues are still there. The funding issues are still there. Um, but I think it'll be much more transparent on its face that there is a congestion issue and the ability to measure the cost of that congestion will be easier to do rather than a, a study. It will be, it'll be apparent uh, rather than arguing about assumptions of a giant study that we can argue all the time about. And Greg, do you want to join in? Well, you'll remember from that, that 2005 report that they, they actually couldn't define corridor, right? It was, it was corridors for transmission study. Everybody had corridors, and then they were, they were huge. They were like half of states, and the, the reason everybody went crazy was they're like, wait a second, that goes through major cities. Are you putting transmission lines there? So, so yeah, that, that type of, of top-down planning, uh, they, back, they backed off of that very quickly. But uh, Mary's right, and, and, and Lisa was right. You are not going to fix the permitting thing by incentives. Everybody has incentives to take less than 17 years to have their project done. And, and everybody who bids $100 million on something that un, ends up costing a billion dollars and thinks it's going to take two years and ends up taking 15 or 20 years, they have incentives to fix it. It shows that the market's broken there, and it shows that the permitting structure is, is broken there. I think we all, we all see that. Folks used to say, oh, if we could be China for a day, well, I hate to be... China for a day because that's in this case that means they wanted to run over a lot of people. But in in that case, you, you have to protect people's rights absolutely. But there is a balance that says you have to have something built eventually. And and you're right, it's not going to be the markets that figure that out. It's going to be coordinated policy efforts to to really get that done in the long run. That's that I think is really the biggest challenge in the industry at the moment. It's 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 not technical innovation. It's it's going to be balancing the rights of people to get things built and to make sure things aren't built in their backyard. It's, it's very, very difficult. Thank you. Yeah, terrific discussion. Um, before I move on, and Josh, I hope you don't take this as the UFO question of the day. Um, but as we're talking about transmission and transmission siting, you've got you know a fair amount of experience in this area. And as I commented with Greg on the good, bad, and ugly of the process, um, you have some some background in that area as well. And, and if we can, for the moment, let's forget the, the federal process. We, I think we'll just agree that that's not where it should be. Um, but at the state levels, do you think energy markets may have some, some um, influence, some help in, in uh, the siting and permitting of transmission projects? Yeah, I, I think they can help. Uh, and I, I do have uh, both fortunately and unfortunately a lot of experience in this area in Arizona. Uh, but it, in Arizona, we do have a really good process, I think. Um, you know, we have a line siting committee that's uh, uh, set by statute um, that hears the case, if you will, and then it goes to the Arizona Corporation Commission for further approval as well. As well. So there, there are a couple different roles there, and it really, we do get a lot of broad uh, uh, engagement into all the state agencies, into the public as well, and outreach there. So, so that goes really well, um, where I think markets could potentially help there, Rob, is uh, on just showing the need. Um, there's a, a re general requirement to show a, a need for something, right? We can't just build a transmission line because we, yeah. we feel like it, um, <laughs> nor, nor would we. But um, to show the need and to show the actual value to our customers and to the region, I think that's where it would help. Uh, again, uh, you still need to go through all the siting. You still need to go through all the permitting process. You still need to go through all that stakeholder engagement process. That doesn't diminish that. Um, and so it, it, it will help, but again, it's not going to be a significant driver. Thank you. Um, you, you, as individuals have, have mentioned, you know, the issues of, of energy markets and, uh, earlier today, you know, uh, multiple times we heard about, um, multiple energy markets in the West or the potential for them. And so Kelsey, I want to go to you next and, um, and you were touching on this before a little bit, but I just want to kind of delve into a little bit more. And that is, what is your perspective on a single day ahead market versus multiple markets in the West? I think based on what I've said earlier, my initial answer probably won't surprise you, Rob. Um, I think the outcome that will deliver um, optimal benefits for the West is a single day ahead market. Um, a larger single day ahead market will amplify uh, the benefits for the region. Um, by significantly expanding the capacity for resource sharing across a broader range of 
geographic resource and load diversity, um, which I think is something that we've touched on even in just the last conversation we've been having about transmission. Um, and from that, it can lead to, you know, annual cost savings for participants, reduced renewable generation curtailments, like I mentioned, um, reduced costs for integrating renewable resources and enhanced grid reliability. Um, these are outcomes that benefit consumers. These are outcomes that help to meet state policies, particularly the many states in the West that have clean energy policies. And I think a dual market structure um, in the West would serve to limit that resource sharing potential and then limit those benefits to date. The energy imbalance market has really demonstrated its success as an established trading footprint for nearly a decade and has provided billions of dollars in benefits uh, to its participants. So to split the energy imbalance market into however many sections with multiple markets operating um, would greatly reduce the affordability and reliability benefits that a single day ahead market in tandem with the energy imbalance market would have the breadth and depth to provide to the region. Thank you. Um, Josh, I'm going to follow up with you next. And, and, you know, it appears that SRP is committed to energy markets. You, you now have a, a permanent department and, um, and you're evaluating participation in EDAM and um, Markets Plus, and you've got this process going on. Um, could you just kind of at a high level, tell us about the primary factors for decision-making to participate um, in, in, in energy market, it's in a day ahead market, whether it's, it's EDAM or in Markets Plus? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, Rob, we, we do have principles that kind of guide our engagement uh, throughout uh, all, all of what we're doing in the day ahead markets space. So uh, we're very engaged in the CAISO stakeholder process. We appreciate that process very much uh, and the outreach uh, that that, that uh, allowed us to, to engage in there, um, as well as we are funding members of, of phase one uh, in SPP, as, as are a lot of others in this room. Um, and so, um, you know, what guides us first and foremost is is benefits, net benefits, uh, really to our customers. Right, we're um, we're a uh, public power entity. Uh, we have no no shareholders, uh, so uh, customer benefits uh, really help guide that. Uh, we would like to uh, maintain reliability, and I, I say maintain just because you know we have a. We have both a, a good problem and a bad problem at SRP. We have the highest reliability in the country, so we really don't have anywhere to go but down, um, which is a, a good problem to have. But you know, as we move to this energy transition, I mean, maintaining that at all, that level is going to be difficult. So um, reliability, uh, and I mentioned governance as well, um, just in terms of having it be independent and transparent, and in particular as well, a role for um, public power. Uh, Jim Shetler mentioned the roles for public power. It's, it's very vitally important to have that uh, as we start thinking about governance structures moving forward. Um, and so in, in many ways, I think, you know, that was on a, a discussion, I think, with a, a head of a bunch of the, uh, the regulator panel. I feel like we align in public power a lot with the regulators, right? Um, we, we kind of have a, a similar viewpoint in some ways there of, of minimizing those costs and maintaining reliability. Um, so those are uh, kind of the, the big Ticket items, I think, Rob, that, that we're really looked at, looking at. I mentioned the previous one with a pathway to an RTO. Again, that day ahead market might be enough, um, but we do value uh, looking uh, forward and, and seeing a pathway to to some sort of RTO development eventually. Thank you, uh, Mary. You know, you've got a slightly different situation. Um, you, you've got you know large amount of hydro. You, you've got multiple entities that are, are members of PNP, P G. Um, and, and so what I wanted to ask is, um, what are your considerations for your constituency in evaluating participating in energy markets? So what do you, what do you have to deal with? So, so I think, I think the, you know, as I mentioned before, we have principles that have been developed over time that, that we continue to, to modify and adjust as we learn, right? I mean, I think that's another piece absolutely for PGP and its members is is kind of a learning process here with organized markets, right? I mean, this is this is a brave new world. It's really complex. It's hard to understand, um, you know, what exact, what elements in the market design will drive different benefits for different market participants. And, and so I think really kind of diving into that and trying to understand it more 
um, is, 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 has been partly PGP's focus in addition to kind of rooting itself in those principles. So I think, I think PGP is really working on creating for its constituency a framework in order to evaluate market, um, market principles or uh, market designs. But to, you, you referenced kind of the hydro system and, and how we think about that, you know, and, and that's really about, you know, how is, how is the, you know, John Harrison mentioned it, the flexibility of Hydra, how is that being valued? How, is, how are those products in the market um, reflecting the value of Hydra? That's something that we think and talk about a lot. Um, and I think that's really important to consider. You know, the, the <clears throat> Kaiso filed EDAM and DAME. DAME has a new product, the imbalance reserve product. Um, we think that's a step forward in terms of, um, you know, enabling greater participation from, from hydro resources. So um, it's, it's, it's not any one thing, it's really a combination of things. And then looking at those principles, looking at the market design and really kind of considering how to balance um, the trade-offs. You know, because I think another thing that I think is true is that no one market participant, right, is going to get everything that they want. And so not everyone is gonna have all their needs met. And so it's really about considering what are the benefits? What are the trade-offs? You know, how do you kind of look at something in total um, and consider how it's going to um, impact you and apply? And, and to Josh's point also, how it's gonna kind of progress into the future. So uh, a lot of factors to consider, I think, and, and really in terms of our constituency is trying to enable them to have the tools that they need to really weigh those factors. Thank you. Um, Greg, sticking on this general topic, um, when you consider this from a, a um, competitive uh, generator perspective, um, what are your perceived impacts of, of having two markets? It seems like two markets would, would be uh, an opportunity to compete. For example, if you've got um, Uber and Lyft, you can have you can have Uber and Lyft, and they can both exist in the market, and they both allow the benefits of having a market to exist. So the the ability, uh, the original ability to say, okay, we've got transmission that is by contract. It's the whole system's been planned, but it is by contract. And we have legal rights for this. And, and if, if you want to use it, we have to negotiate that. That's the legality of the system. The market changed the system into the physics of the system. And the physics of the system always went, it, but we had this legal constraint that, oh, this is how the system is supposed to look. And having a market allowed us to say, okay, how does it really work? And in the next few minutes, what's actually going to happen with these flows? We don't have to have a contract for a year and I might not have it at this certain time. Lawyers didn't have to work it out. The people who worked it out were the actual economists, the people who play poker in the evenings and then work somewhere in the daytime and really have that figured out. That was the benefit of the system. The the day ahead market is going to enhance those benefits as well, right? It's going to expand the pool of who's going to be in it. It's going to have longer term. It's going to have dispatch for the next day. It, it, it increases what is in the market and what has market incentives. And so then the question is, how much, if any, will that be decreased if we have two people or two companies doing that? And there's, there's no reason to think that having a second one does that, except for this. And that is that I have, a, I have an iPhone. And when I first bought a phone, like 20 years ago, I never said, I think I will create a lifelong relationship with Apple. <laughs> Right. I, I never thought that. Now I have a lifelong relationship with Apple and my kids will have a lifelong relationship with Apple. And it's because of the phone that I bought in like 2010. And I had no idea that that's what I was creating. And so people I think are afraid that they are creating a lifelong relationship with something, but they don't know what it is yet. And that, that's what scares people. So I would say in the beginning, sure, have two. <laughs> but it might be that this is the Verizon versus Apple versus 
cricket discussion that I had in 2000 five or six, and it might be a lifetime deal. So I think that's what people are worried about. I, I think we can avoid that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the concern. That was interesting. That was fantastic. <laughs> In fact, that was awesome. <laughs> um, we're getting close to wrapping up. Um, Brian, I want to turn to you. And, um, you know, when you take a look at, at what Google's goals are, do you have any concerns on, on the development of, of energy markets? Is there anything out there that, that causes you to, to pause or, or causes you to think this is not the right road for, for you know, your needs? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, look, at the end of the day, this, you know, we have to have regulator support for what's put forward, right? This right now is before FERC. Um, and so, you know, kind of putting on my FERC hat again for a moment, there's a lot of technical questions here, right? One of the biggest ones for me is, is how do we how do we handle uh, dispatch across a wide region where there are GHG policies in sub region pockets, right? That's a that's just a hard question, and so I think um, we're going to have to 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 get that answered. But I do think I think showing up at the commission. And, and showing the broad set of stakeholder support for this, I think is is going to be really key and 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 in really getting over those challenges. And and I guess just two points on on the governance piece. I would just add that you know we really want to make sure large customers, all customers, are, are represented in that governance discussion. Um, I think that's that's vital. And and as we start to look forward, right about. We've heard a lot of talk today about the resources that we need to bring on, the transmission that we need to bring on. I think we have it in our interest, in the interest of all the entities and folks that we represent to do that in the most cost-effective manner, right? And that means broad regional collaboration, input, and, and planning, and I'm hopeful that's the road that, that we're on. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have, have run out of time, and I want to first of all thank the, the panelists. Um, we try to keep this lively, keep it moving, um, make it interesting, and I tell you what, I've got some things that to really think about here and, and a new way of thinking about them. Um, my takeaway from the comments and, and just trying to get it down to a thumbnail is uh, there's a lot of needs, uh, very different perspectives on them, uh, big challenges, but I, I think the big takeaway is the discussion here was not about should we or shouldn't we. It was all about how should we do this and how do we make it right. And I think that's a really positive perspective. And I think that bodes well for facilitating the discussions that need to occur to make this happen. So how about a round of applause for the panelists? Thank you. And now, oh, Rob, there, oh, thank, you. thank you all so much. Fabulous panel, great to see all of you. And uh, thanks again for the really helpful discussion. Okay, we are on the final, final segment. And I am the only thing separating all of you from hopefully a cold refreshment, if not uh, one on the airplane. So it's, you know, I wanted to, I want to be, just because we are losing folks, I wanted to start out with a, with a few thank yous. Um, there's just a lot of people that contributed to making today's event a success and a lot of work behind the scenes and a lot of them uh, outside of the CAISO. I wanted to start out by thanking, I think what was known as the planning committee uh, for this effort. So Tony Braun, uh, Mike Wilding, Jim Shetler, Pam Sporberg, uh, Jeff Nelson, uh, Aaron Eiselman, Tiffany Erickson, Amy Royer, um, Megan Delaney, uh, Carolyn Barbash, and Lindsay Shuckaway of, of NV Energy. Really appreciate all your guys' work. Uh, just so helpful to help us figure out how to make sure we had the right voices here today. And also for the ISO team, uh, Stacy Crowley, Mark Rothleder, uh, Milos Basonic, Ann Gonzalez, uh, Vanette Fontaine, Stacy Gibbs, Isabella Nicosia, and Angela Glover. Uh, and of course, the, the inimitable Joanne Serena, who always just does such a wonderful job pulling us together. So I wanted to get those thank yous out and deep appreciation uh, for everybody. Um, and just thank you to all of you. And, and I know it's been a, a dense day, a lot of, a lot of uh, 
good information uh, and just appreciate the time uh, and investment you've made to be here for those of you here in person and for those of you who's, who've been able to hang out with us online today really appreciate that <clears throat> I don't have too much else to share but I wanted I wanted to share something that I kind of had a little fun with um, there's a fellow uh, back at the Kaiso a guy named Jabo Wong some of you guys may have met Jabo over the years he's been actually involved in the EIM since its very early stages he's a hardcore quant he does a lot of analysis and he's been there since the very beginning of the evolution of the EIM and he's just just super passionate about EIM and it's its value proposition and the way it's evolved over time. And I think if we think about today, one of the key themes that has come up over and over is this evolutionary path that we've been on together uh, for a number of years. And so I'm gonna pull up uh, a little, a, a few slides. I'm gonna start out, I'm gonna sure hope this works. I'm feeling good. So this, some of you may have seen the, 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 the ETSR map that we use that shows the transfer paths, the transfer capabilities for the EIM. Well, if you go way back to 2014, uh, when the Western energy imbalance market first started, right? If you remember, it was just the California ISO and Pacific Core West PAC and PAC East, right? And that was the extent, that was the first, those are the first legs of transmission uh, that we leveraged together in the EIM. Well, shortly thereafter, we had another really valuable entry with, with, with NV Energy coming in. Uh, you can see back there in, in, in 2015, I'm gonna have to secure it by my mark. And then we add a little bit more transfer capability, a little more, a little more value to the, to the proposition. And then we could see we brought a few more entities in following, brought in, in Puget and in Arizona Public Service, right? At, brought in that desert Southwest and our first Pacific Northwest entrant. Uh, who brought, now we started really beginning that optimization across a different set of, of inner ties into 2016. In 2017, uh, Portland General came on board and brought another piece of connectivity between uh, Portland and, and Pac West and another really valuable Pacific Northwest entrant. And then we got into 2018, uh, BC Hydro, the PowerX folks jumped in and then Idaho Power came in and stitched together another piece of the Western connectivity uh, and brought a whole nother diverse set of resources and transmission uh, to the market. We then got into 2019 uh, with Bank uh, jumping in and Jim, thanks again today for the announcement. We're super uh, appreciative of that and another key uh, piece of, of transmission capability and valuable resource portfolio within the state of California. And then we got into 2020 uh, with, with Seattle City Light and SRP, public power jumping in from the Northwest uh, and also in the desert Southwest. Uh, huge, huge uh, step forward, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. I think when Seattle joined the market, that was such an important moment uh, for the EIM and really demonstrating uh, the foresightedness up there of, of jumping in the market. And of course, SRP has just been a super valuable partner through this whole evolution. We then got into 2021, uh, and Turlock and, and PNM jumping in. And then of course, LADWP, uh, which is just anchors a huge amount of transmission and a remarkable resource base uh, jumped in. And then of course, Northwestern, uh, who's really been, we've really enjoyed working with Northwestern out there on that part of the transmission system. And I know EIM has become a, an important part of their value proposition. And then of course in 2022, and uh, certainly close to my heart, seeing uh, Bonneville jump in to the Western energy imbalance market, that was just huge. Uh, what a great step uh, And Tucson Electric and Tacoma as well and Avista. You know, 2022, big year uh, for, for the Western energy imbalance market. You can just see the additional amount of transmission connectivity uh, that these brought in to, and, and resource diversity excuse me, into the market, just remarkable. And then of course, here, even in, in, in 2023, our first gen only balancing authority in the Western energy imbalance market with Avant Grid, incredible. And I, I remember back to the early days, you know, back when they were experimenting with their, with their uh, gen imbalance market inside the Bonneville control area, very interesting. Finally, a full member of the Western energy imbalance market. Uh, and then of course, Western down the desert Southwest. And El Paso, you know, the Western energy imbalance market stretching out into Texas, kind of remarkable. 
And so when you think about this footprint and you think about how far we've gone, we've come, this, this is what we've built together as a Western energy community, you know, and, and this map, this transmission connectivity and this resource diversity is really the physics that underlies both the economic and the reliability benefits that we've seen through the Western energy imbalance market. And it is, of course, the reason why our central proposition now is to build <clears throat> on this platform and to take that next really important evolutionary step uh, into the day ahead market. And I think that we've, we've really learned that that evolutionary path allowing people to go at a pace that's sustainable for them to learn the people the process and technology steps it takes to fully integrate and then to reap those benefits and to be able to convey them uh, to their customers you know and i think if you if we heard today in addition to the theory the theme of evolution it was just that cross the west shared focus on reliability and affordability and and equity right these are things that we really have in common and i think you saw that reflected <clears throat> in all the conversations today so when we think about evolution you know we also know you know the, the the western energy imbalance market the design itself has has evolved over the year the market you know has evolved and i think when we look forward into the day ahead market i think we're very you know aware that the you know the operating environment uh, the resource mix, the policy environment is also going to continue to evolve. And we're going to have to continue to involve that. We also know that, that there is an expectation of us that our stakeholder engagement processes will continue to evolve. And, you know, I think um, we, we are just absolutely bought in to the importance of making sure that all of the diverse voices in the West have a seat at the table uh, in our stakeholder processes and can really make sure that their input uh, is reflected. And I think today uh, was, was, and hopefully you guys felt an example of, of just wanting to make sure that we, we honor the diversity of perspectives. We honor the, the need for folks to really be able to speak their mind, that importance of frank dialogue, and then taking these messages to heart and carrying water for each other to make further progress. And so in terms of both stakeholder engagement and, and market evolution, we really have, you know, and I think EIM, I'm sorry, for EDAM, I think hopefully you heard that a lot of folks that really invested in EDAM development felt, I think, very heard, felt like it was a really good pro process. And we have incorporated that sort of work group approach uh, into the stakeholder process. And if we actually have, in terms of market evolution, we have three areas right now that we've initiated work group stakeholder processes. We have a group that's working on GHG. We know that, you know, the existing model that we have has a lot of, it's it's been around for a while. It's taken a lot of time to sort of fine tune it, but we recognize, we even heard today, desire to continue evolving the GHG framework, uh, especially since you know, state policy changes and trying to really minimize except, uh, uh, leakage and some of the secondary dispatch issues. So we're going to continue working on that, really looking forward to folks' engagement on that. Price formation remains an important issue, we know, and so we've got a work group on price formation, taking a look at everything from scarcity pricing and market power mitigation and fast start pricing, which we know is an important theme for, for some. And then one of the issues that sort of boiled up, we talked about it particularly with our colleagues down in the desert southwest, is this issue of, of gas enhancements. We know that for years, the power market and the gas markets have been a little bit out of you know, out of step with each other. And we're looking for some ways to better align um, gas pricing with uh, power pricing and try to avoid basis in those areas and just make sure that we're sort of fine tuning the locational elements of gas pricing so that it can be effectively reflected uh, in the market. So we're gonna continue to work on those. And I really encourage you, I really hope you guys have a chance to, if those are important issues, to participate in those work groups. Uh, lend your voice, make sure you're heard, they're open, and we're just super motivated to make sure that people feel that they can walk away from a CAISO stakeholder process and say, look, that is really fabulous, and we feel heard, and we feel acknowledged. So we're gonna really continue working on that. We honestly really recognize how important that is uh, to our broader constituency. And then finally, of course, you know, on governance. I mean, I think we've heard a lot of different perspectives. And I think we heard today that challenge of how do you simultaneously try to, to continue making real and tangible progress into that day ahead market, 
and continue to take advantage of those benefits and try to leverage uh, the, the most positive elements of the joint authority model while recognizing for some that that pathway to independent governance is, is a critical success variable. And, and, and I'm just super appreciative of the work of our regulatory community uh, to start taking this issue on with seriousness and obviously recognizing the importance of getting the right people at the table uh, open and transparent. Again, that stakeholder engagement on that front is also going to be equally important. So really appreciate that. And we're just um, excited that the recognition of that, that issue is out there. And then finally, on, on, on implementation in terms of next steps, I think we heard a couple of things today. You know, we filed with the commission. Uh, we did ask them for a fairly expedited ruling. We're now in the process, you know, now with, with both Pacific Core uh, and with Bank, and of course, hoping to have some more EDAM uh, participants here in, in the not too distant future, working with our market participants or partners to really work through the details of, of implementation so we can uh, work on a, on a good solid schedule and, and make sure that we can start capturing those benefits as soon as possible. And also just even, even, along, we, even along the pathway of implementation, trying to start capturing value as soon as possible, you know, through the exchange of data, through analytics, looking at super peaks, looking at diversity, looking at ways that we can already bring some of that diversity value and resource optimization into the equation as quickly as possible so folks can start getting benefits for their, for their customers. And then, of course, um, you know, I guess I would also say continuing to, to think about the broader infrastructure picture. We know that this is, you know, this, this map was built off a legacy of transmission investments that were made over, you know, 100 years or so, right? You know, our predecessors had the wherewithal and the capability to get a lot of transmission built. We're super benefited to have that kind of connectivity in the West. But we also know that, and I think Lisa said it today, you know, we, we've been also planning uh, a lot of additional transmission, you know, let's go build some more transmission. And there's some great looking legs of transmission out there uh, that we're super motivated to get, you know, in, energized and into operation and further enhance uh, this interconnectivity. So a lot coming uh, down the pipe. We're really excited. I just wanted to, to end again just by just a huge thanks to all of you. Uh, for being here, uh, to all of our partners, just a great conversation today. I just really felt uh, just honored to be part of such a great community of people uh, with a lot of shared interests and I think a desire to continue making real progress together. So safe travels to all of you. Thanks again for being here and we're looking forward to next steps. All right. Thanks again.